Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents For King and Company by Ellis K. Meacham Narrated by Stephen Crossley Part 1. Combined Operations The continuous thunder of the guns from the frigates grinding against the port and starboard sides reached a crescendo too painful for the human ear to tolerate. Merriweather wiped away the blood that trickled into his eyes and peered forward through clouds of smoke, seeing only shattered spars, masses of tangled cordage and windrows of smouldering canvas, punctuated by bloody ragged heaps that had been British seamen only a few minutes before. The frigate no longer heaved with the recoil of her own broadsides, she was a dying ship, already low in the water. But the colours of the Bombay Marines still sparkled at the peak. There was a flicker of movement on deck. The figure ran to the flag halyards, loosened the turns about the pins, and began to haul down the ensign. No! shouted Merriweather. No, no, no! The flag was fluttering to the deck. Don't strike! We'll go down with colours flying! The stocky figure turned, calmly folding the bunting, and looked back at him. The features were indistinguishable in the gloom, only staring china-blue eyes and an incredibly broad cleft chin were visible. A dead silence fell. The cannonading on either hand had ceased. Hoist our colours! Merriweather shouted, then realised that no sound had come from his lips. He made a mighty effort to move forward to the halyards, and came full awake, shaking uncontrollably. Grey light was in the room with a chill drizzle of rain to welcome the new year outside. Caroline slept peacefully beside him. Merriweather had had another nightmare. He lay still, forcing his muscles to relax. It was time to rise and report to the dockyard again after these past two weeks of leave. But he felt a lassitude that numbed his limbs and overwhelmed his resolution for the moment. This last dream had been more horrifyingly real than the one he had had last week. In the first, he had been confronted by a huge black spider that unaccountably wore the ivory face of a beautiful woman who spoke seductively to him then slashed razor-sharp claws at his throat. He had felt the sudden pain, the gout of life's blood rising to strangle him, and had awakened in a paroxysm of coughing that aroused Caroline. He marshalled his energies, forcing himself to rise and face the morning in these shabby lodgings here in Calcutta, seeing the unfamiliar bulk of his dear pregnant Caroline under the sheet, and wondered again if he had contracted some distemper along the Persian road last fall. He and Caroline had remained at home the evening before, regretting invitations to any of the watch parties since Caroline was again feeling queasy in her pregnancy. The dockyard had not declared the holiday. With the flagship pit careened and rapid waiting her turn, all hands would turn to today in regular routine. He was again in command of Rapid, but she was out of commission, slated for extensive refitting before she would be ready for sea. Sir John Waldron, Commandant of the Naval Service of the Honourable East India Company, had refused to take the flagship back to Bombay. The ship's bottom was so foul with weed from the crews in the eastern seas that her speed was diminished by half. Instead, he had taken passage in Gazelle last month and Captain Bridges, Pitt's commanding officer, had come back to Calcutta a sick man. He was still in the hospital at Fort William and soon to be invalided out of the service. Not for the first time, Merriweather wondered who might get that plum, a thirty-six-gun frigate. He set out to walk through the drizzle to the dockyard, leaving Caroline asleep. He stopped at the warehouse by the rope walk, where Rapid's crew was housed ashore, and took the morning report from Lieutenant McCamey. The other officers would return from leave today, 
but the hands have been kept busy in the rope walk laying up cordage of hemp to replace the worn-out standing rigging, while the sailmaker and his mates overhauled sails and sewed new canvas in the loft. As he left the warehouse, he saw Gazelle coming up to the anchorage. She must have made a fast turn around of Bombay. Commodore wants to see you, sir, the chief clerk told him. Merriweather hung up his wet hat and boat cloak and went into Land's office. Ah, Merriweather, Gazelle dropped off the mail bags at Budge Budge last night, and there seems to be an official communication for you. He handed over the oilskin wrapped packet. And our friends have been lucky. McLennan and McCrae both selected to be captains, and Larkin to be a first lieutenant. Tollett promoted a commodore. Merriweather slit the wrapper, his fingers trembling a bit as he remembered his fiasco on Mauritius last year, wondering if retribution had come at last. Well, I'm damned. Relieved as captain of Rapid. Merriweather felt a sense of shock. He had commanded the sloop for two years almost to the day. He pulled a second sheet from the cover. Well, I'm damned, he said again. Ordered as master and commandant into pit. Land showed surprise. My congratulations, he said at last. I thought it certain that one of Campbell's pets at Bombay would get the command. Of course, with her captain sick almost the whole of the cruise down to Java, her crew has got a bit out of hand. Waldron was able to hold them in check as long as he had his flag in her, but Whaley, her first, is a little too handy with the cat for my taste. The last I heard, twenty-six seamen and two petty officers had run. Run? Where to? Sixteen turned up enlisted in the Royal Navy. We sent a petition to Pellew, but he refuses to release them. Says any British citizen has a right to serve in the Navy regardless of his enlistment in the Marine. Land shook his head and continued. He did promise to take the matter up with the Admiralty, and that will be the last anyone hears of it. I can see his point of view, Merriweather nodded. Now, when do I read myself in? We will refloat Pitt on the spring tide tonight and commence loading our equipment and guns tomorrow. Time enough, then, said Land, and since we expect to careen rapid tomorrow, I think it best that you retain command until that operation is completed. Larkin may then relieve you. Merriweather thanked Land and took his leave. There was much to be done. Rapid was a dead ship, riding high out of the water. Her upper masts had been struck and her rigging removed in preparation for the careening on the bar across the Hoogley tomorrow. As the gig hooked onto the gangway, Merriweather heard the sound of the pumps and saw a solid stream of water gushing from the scuppers. We're pumping a half hour out of four, sir, explained Tompkins. She has a bad leak about midships. Wells up through the dead wood and keels soon like a spring. The carpenter thinks it's damage to the keel, but I know she has not touched bottom since I've been in her. Merriweather went aft to the cabin and looked about the bare room. Sang had delivered his personal belongings to his lodgings two weeks ago, and other furnishings including the brass bed, desk, blunderbusses, truncheons and chairs were locked in a storeroom ashore. On an impulse, he opened the strong box. It was empty, as was the strong room beneath the deck. The barren cabin depressed him, and he went forward to find the bosun and complete his inspection. I think everything is in order, Tompkins. The dockyard hands will handle her for the heaving down tomorrow. The gig came back to the dockyard, and Merriweather went to find Rapid's papers, the articles of enlistment of the crew and lists of the myriad items he would have to account for when he turned over command. The initial enlistments of the crew for two years had expired last week, 
two-thirds of the ordinary seamen and all but two of the petty officers had extended for another year, he was pleased to learn. He wished he might take the officers and men from Rapid to Pitt, but it was impossible. Merriweather turned to the reports of the Board of Survey. Checking off against the allowance lists, those articles worn out, expended, or lost in service. It was dull, tedious work, but he wanted no surcharges filed against his pay for shortages. He encountered a report of two blunderbusses expended last February the 17th, and realised that they must be the two he had issued to Eldridge and Webster when they boarded the Duchy of Lancaster. He remembered that Eldridge had reported he had brought them back when he appeared before the promotion board last summer, and four, all with the brass nameplate Rapid, set in their stocks, were stacked in the corner. Well, for once in his life, he had a surplus. He was over ordnance allowance by two blunderbusses. Merriweather came to the bottom of the stack, made the last deletion, initialed the page, and sat back the onerous task completed. He could turn over the ship to Larkin and accept his receipt with a clear conscience now. He looked at his timepiece, not yet eleven o'clock, and reviewed the events of the morning. His elation had subsided, and doubt intruded as he considered the greater responsibilities of commanding a thirty-six-gun flagship frigate. Merriweather had no inkling of what duty she might be destined to perform. He knew Whaley, her first lieutenant, only by sight. But Land had spoken somewhat critically of Whaley this morning. Merriweather shrugged the matter off. The man would conform to his policies and orders given or be sacked, he told himself. The surge of confidence reminded Merriweather that he had two years' seniority in the captain's list of the Marine and was far from being the junior captain now. That episode in the first few weeks of his marriage six months or so ago came suddenly to mind. He had told Caroline that after ten years of commissioned service in the Marine, he would be entitled to three years' leave with pay. She had accounted it a promise and he realised with a sense of shock that the service would be completed next September. Eighteen years of service to the company and its marine, commencing as a scullery boy at twelve, he was now thirty, entering middle age and soon to be a father. That three years' leave was not so remote or unthinkable now, even at the outrageous cost of passage to London for Caroline and himself. He clapped on his hat, locked the door to the grimy little room, and walked across to the arsenal. McClellan was at his desk. Two almost empty bottles of Scotch whisky and an accumulation of dirty glasses were set before him. Evidently, there already had been toasts proposed and drunk on account of his promotion to captain. Ah, captain, McClellan said, coming around the desk, hand extended. Happy birthday, and a prosperous new year. And my congratulations for a well-deserved promotion. Will you have a wee drop, sir? Just a finger. It was too early in the day for much heavy liquor, but he drank to McClellan's health. What duty do you forecast? he inquired, setting down the glass. It will no longer be Calcutta, Captain. Commodore Waldron said last month that he wanted me to succeed West. He retires this year as Fleet Ordnance Officer for the Marine, and my billet will be Bombay Castle. When they parted two hours later from the officers' club, McClellan said, Of course, I'll see you here tonight. He stopped short with a rueful expression, then muttered, The devil take me, I've spilled the porridge and fled. Merriweather was puzzled a moment at McClellan's behaviour, then recalled the three visits in the past two days by Sang, his steward. Each time he had been closeted with Caroline. Light dawned. There must be some sort of birthday entertainment in the wind. The thought touched him. His birthday 
had not been remembered since, as a child, he had been given a slice of cake and sugared tea by his mother in a corner of the kitchen in Bell Flower House. He must simulate the surprise, he decided, as he came back to the dockyard. It was a gay affair, planned by Caroline and executed by Sang with a host of assistants. There were Sir Thomas and Lady Geoffrey, Commodore Land escorting a sprightly recent widow, McClellan, all the officers from Rapid and Comet, and a group of young lady acquaintances of Caroline. It commenced sedately enough with the toast to Merriweather and the presentation of a silver whistle in celebration of his birthday, but quickly developed into a lively wetting down party for the new commissions of McClellan, McRae and Larkin. Merriweather felt relaxed and happy as he made the rounds of the guests, and thought of the love that had inspired this party. It was close to midnight, and dessert was on the table when Sang tiptoed up to whisper in the ear of Commodore Land. He frowned, muttered an apology, and went out. Merriweather wondered briefly at the intrusion, possibly some dispatch to be receipted for in person and harked back to the droll tale being told by Lieutenant Dillon. The gale of laughter at the conclusion of the story subsided as Land re-entered to stand beside Merriweather at the head of the table. Gentlemen, he said tightly, delightful as this occasion has been duty calls. Pitt's gone adrift on a bore in the hoogly. There was a babble of comment and concern from the officers as chairs scraped back. Caroline appeared distressed at the abrupt ending of the party, but managed to dissemble. He saw McClellan delay a moment in earnest conversation with plain little Miss Mary Wilkins, the daughter of their landlady, and then joined the others in a mad dash for the dockyard. He was not legally in command of Pitt, he told himself, but if the flagship of the Bombay Marine were lost now, another such command might never come his way. The horses galloped through the deserted streets, and Land, Merriweather and McClellan swayed with the motion of the Tonga. What could have gone wrong? The superintendent of the dockyard, the sailing master and his senior bosom were in charge of the evolution, with skilled seamen in two anchor hoys and a picked crew under Lieutenant Whaley in pit. Merriweather had watched the quick efficient operation in times past, the two hoys alternately holding the refloated hulk with their anchors, while the other moved across the stream to drop its berth where it would be furnished with its own cables and anchors. Still, a tidal bore was a frightening and dangerous phenomenon, rare but by no means unknown at this time of the year, particularly with the full moon and spring tide. The bed of the Hoogley was simply too shallow and restricted to accommodate the huge volume of water forced upstream against the seaward flow of the river. Thus, the incoming tide tended to roll up and over the downstream current until it became an irresistible tidal wave, five or six feet high, racing upstream, snapping moorings, capsizing or swamping small craft and causing ships to drag their anchors unless spring lines have been rigged and precautions taken. Bores have been known to run over thirty miles above Calcutta, and Pitt was light, no burden of armament, supplies, or even ballast in her. She might ride the bore like a chip in a mill race until she smashed into another vessel or drove ashore. Horses pulled up with a clatter of hooves on the same pavement at the dockyard gate. Where is she? demanded Land of the anxious second lieutenant on duty. I canna say, sir. He is car, he brought the word. A grizzled boatswain's mate rolled forward, knuckling his forehead. Sir, we had just got the lines aboard from the hoys. Speak up, man. Where's Pitt? Went out of sight upstream, is all I know. Hellfire, said Land, turning to the duty officer. What's the high water interval tonight? The officer looked at the slate hung in the guardhouse window. One hour, fifty-five minutes, sir, commencing at eleven-ten, he read off. 
Land pulled out his watch. Less than an hour of slack water, Merriweather. We have to hand her before the ebb sets in, or she'll go down faster than she went up. He turned to Macrae. Get Comet ready. Aye, sir, but the wind is almost dead foul. I know, but I want you prepared to intercept her if she comes downstream. Grapple. Anything to get a line on her. Macrae and his officers departed for the landing at a trot. A Merriweather. Turn out your crew and man the dockyard launches. Larkin turned to go as Merriweather called after him. Bring two muskets, cartridges, and a half dozen iron ramrods. Larkin waved his hand in acknowledgement as he disappeared into the darkness. We'll require grapnels, heaving lines, and towing cable in the launches, Merriweather told the duty officer. Better bring a half dozen balls of small stuff, too. The launches were underway a few minutes later, pulling across towards the careening bar. Land and Merriweather were seated in the stern sheets, Hamlin at the tiller. The damp wind blowing the light drizzle at twelve to fifteen knots chilled them to the bone. The temperature must be under fifty degrees, and Merriweather soon wished he had an oar himself to pull. There was a momentary break in the scudding clouds, allowing the full moon to illuminate the river. Pitt was not in sight, but there were other vessels anchored close to the west bank of the river. Merriweather doubted the ship had been carried more than two or three miles, even by the onrushing bore. It was entirely possible the frigate had capsized and sunk, so light she was. They passed the bar where she had been careened, seeing lanterns moving about on shore, and then made out a light upstream. Steer for the hoy! Land told Hamlin. Hail her. A voice answered the hail. She be gone upstream. We was nearly capsized in the bore, and the other hoy dead. There was a pause, and then, Six men drowned, they say. The moon reappeared, and Merriweather could see the small vessel, disproportionately broad for her length, double-ended. The single mast stepped right amidships. A large capstan mounted forward from her bow, a cable running through its block to disappear in the water. Do you still have your cable? Yes, sir. Pitt hadn't got the bitter end secured when the bore struck. Very well. Stand by. The launch pulled way upstream, the second boat following and making good speed in the slack water. It seemed an eternity before lights were sighted. They could be on shore or on an anchored vessel, but they appeared to be almost in midstream. The moon broke through again, and it was possible to make out the masterless hulk riding high out of the water. A hail brought an instant reply. We lost our lines, came the shout. Can you get one on board? Is your ship, Merriweather, said Land. Godspeed. The heaving line pulled the light towing cable aboard, and a shout announced that it was secured. Another line went forward to the second launch, and the two boats took a strain. Merriweather looked back towards the west bank and saw it begin to slide away. The interval of slack water had passed, and the ebb was beginning to run. The two launches had an insensate beast by the tail, a creature at the mercy of the wind and current. He had no solid object to which he could moor, and only the feeble strokes of the oars as they ploughed ineffectively through the water to try to hold the ship. He might be able to influence the vessel's drift to some extent, but it was impossible to check her with the steady pressure of the wind against her inordinate freeboard and the inexorable flow towards the sea of the huge volume of water forced upstream by the bore now emptying from the narrow channels and creeks. The sky had cleared, the drizzle stopped, but the wind cut like a knife through wet clothing. The moon now lighted the surface of the water in contrast to the dark lines of vegetation on either bank. Pitt was a little nearer the west bank now, an occasional light on shore sliding by at an alarming pace. There was no profit in wearing the hands out in a futile effort to check the drift, Merriweather decided. Downstream, 
there was the anchor hoy and comet standing poised to attempt the interception. It was preferable to make the contact with the hoy rather than risk a collision that might send both ships to the bottom. Larkin, he shouted, double bank the oars and pull for the west bank. There was a bustle in both boats as the hands took their new positions. Give way! If the pulling boats could influence Pitt to the westward, there was a chance of bringing her down close enough aboard the hoy to pass a messenger attached to her cable. Even then, there was doubt as to whether it would hold against the enormous strain of the rampaging hulk. The light line tightened, rising rigidly to the fair leads, as the hands put their backs into the double-banked oars. The combination of tide and wind must be moving her at a good seven knots, and both boats headed north westwardly at an angle to her bow, pulling with little visible effect. Merriweather knelt in the stern sheets as Pitt came around a slight bend, and he could see the cluster of lights that marked the hoy possibly a mile downstream. If he could give the ship another hundred yards or so westing, she might pass close aboard for the hoy to pass a heaving line and get the cable secured in time. It was a back-breaking seven or eight minutes, the launches rowing desperately while they were dragged stern first through the water. Merriweather could hear the stentorious breathing of the oarsmen rasping above the sound of the wind, now beginning to raise whitecaps on the river. It was hard to gauge the effects of the pulling boats, and the wind was helping too, but the hoy's anchor lights were barely visible along the port side of Pitt. She should pass close enough now. Merriweather pulled the new silver whistle from his breast pocket and blew on it. The shrill note cut through the sound of the wind and attracted instant attention. Way enough! he shouted. The oars were lifted out of the water. Now I want you to sing out, Aboard the hoy! Pass a line! Pass a line! He set the cadence himself and in a moment the two boatloads of seamen had settled into a powerful chant that must be audible far downwind. He heard a thinner echo from Pitt joining in, and saw lanterns being swung from her poop. There was a chance. The monkey's fist of the heaving line arched up over the stern in the lantern light, and frantic hands snaked in the messenger and the heavy anchor cable that followed. There was a rush to the forward bits, and then a soft but carrying voice shouted, Secured! from the forecastle. Cast off, Merriweather told the stern hook. Give way! Come to starboard! The launches pulled clear towards midstream, as the cable from the hoy took the strain of checking and holding a twelve-hundred-ton ship running stern to at seven knots. For a moment, she was dragged at an angle to the current, one end out of the water, the other forced under. He thought the hoy would be capsized. He could hear the cable groaning on the bits as it tightened and water snapped from the rigid hemp. The cable certainly would have parted, but the hoy's anchor began to drag through the muddy bottom of the hoogly a few yards at a time, relieving the pressure, then holding, then dragging again. Pitt finally came to a halt. God bless me, said Land. It is more than I can credit. There were lights moving downstream, and Merriweather realized that Comet was under way, prepared to risk sudden destruction to get a line on the frigate. Lark in, he called. Go down and tell McCrae she's secured for the present. He turned to Land and said, And with your permission, sir, I think we shall board her, and I shall read myself in. It's damn foolish, Merriweather, but I have no objection. There was no doubt as Land saw it. Merriweather should wait for the ship to be warped across the river and safely moored in her berth. If she were lost or damaged now, Merriweather would be responsible. But Merriweather felt a cross-grained determination to assume the risk. It was impossible for him to leave the obligation longer to her disabled captain or even with Lieutenant Whaley. It was broad daylight when the two launches came back to the dockyard. 
Merriweather was legally in command of Pitt, and Larkin had relieved him as master and commandant in Rapid. The frigate seemed secure enough for the present, though it would be a day or so before she could take on board her own anchors and cables and refit the windlass in preparation for warping her across the Hoogley. With two anchor hoys alternately moving and holding her, the manoeuvre would have been quick and easy. With only one available, Pitt must use her own anchor to hold herself in place as the hoy shifted position. He saw the muskets, a packet of cartridges and a bundle of ramrods glistening with moisture in the bottom of the boat. He had not required them to shoot a line aboard Pitt, he was thankful to remember, as he told the coxswain to return them to the gunner. In the dockyard office, Merriweather looked down at the soggy, wrinkled ruin of his dress uniform and up at land. I'll go home and change her, he said. He realized that he was suffering again the familiar nagging compulsion of a commander to stay in sight of his ship, and wished for a moment that the responsibility was not his. As you wish, said Land, but there's no need to hurry. I intend to breakfast and take a nap before I return. Caroline had, of course, been concerned. Merriweather had to give her a full account of the mishap while he sponged off and shaved, and then ate the breakfast the maid brought in. Oh, said Caroline over a second cup of tea, Mary Wilkins came in for a bit last night after Dr. Buttram saw us home from the club. She was quite curious as to Captain McClellan. It seems he's asked to be allowed to call on her. Merriweather recalled the slight delay last night, as McClellan had a word with Miss Wilkins before he joined the exodus for the dockyard. "'Tell her to nourish no false hopes,' he said lightly. "'The man is posted for Bombay.' He kissed Caroline and went out into the bright, hot morning. Merriweather sat back in the chair in the office he had borrowed for use during Pitt's fitting-out period. Yesterday had seen the frigate safely warped across the Hoogley, and she was now more to her own anchor's bow and stem. Her silhouette had altered. Even the few tons of stone ballast now being stowed and secured under the critical eyes of Mr. Hobday, the dockyard sailing master, Boson Caldwell and Carpenter Owens, had reduced her freeboard and restored a semblance of the graceful line she sailed on. The water casks, guns and stores, together with her spars and rigging, would complete the metamorphosis and make her a live ship again. He looked back at Whaley sitting quietly across the desk, round hat held in square, stubby hands, the fingers rough and stained with tar pale blue eyes fixed on some object in the far left corner of the room. And you do not know the reasons that moved four lieutenants and four midshipmen to request transfer to another ship or station? Whaley's eyes shifted briefly to Merriweather, then resumed their inspection of the corner. Whaley was a stocky roundish man, not fat, but heavily muscled. No, sir. Except that I consider them to be Namby Pambies, not a backbone, a bit of enterprise in the lot. The thing had come as a surprise in Merriweather's third day of command of Pitt. Jarvis, the second lieutenant, and Lawing, the senior midshipman, had evidently been elected as emissaries to wait on him this morning. They had solemnly delivered formal requests addressed to the commandant of the Marine by way of Merriweather and Land for transfer and reassignment to other duties. Under regulations, Merriweather was bound to forward the requests, no matter what recommendation he might endorse on them. This development, coupled with the desertions now numbering almost thirty ratings, was disquieting. He could be left a captain without sufficient force to sail or fight his ship. Merriweather fought down the impulse to cross-examine Whaley and demand particulars. He kept his face impassive, studying the man opposite him. Whaley's hair was light brown, worn short, but with a tendency for the forelock to fall over his eyes. The mouth protruded a bit, lips set in a horizontal line, 
and the cleft chin gave the impression of being almost as broad as the cheekbones. Not so much a cruel or ruthless face as an insensitive one, he decided. The eyes flicked back and met Merriweather squarely. Of course you may talk to the gentlemen if you wish, sir. I've only stated my private opinion of them. Once again, Whaley transferred his gaze to the corner. From the dossiers laid out on the desk, it appeared that these officers were no recent recruits in Pitt. Even the most junior midshipman had joined her at Bombay over ten months ago. There was no evidence of disciplinary action, not even a letter of admonition and reprimand in the records of any of the officers to explain the requests for transfer. Whaley's own dossier had revealed his age to be thirty-three, original appointment as second lieutenant, seventeen ninety-five, and to rank as first lieutenant from eighteen o two. He was senior in commissioned service in the marine to Merriweather himself. Merriweather made a further inquiry: Has any officer required disciplinary action during this cruise? Whaley uncrossed his legs, and his gaze shifted to the opposite corner of the room. Why, yes, from time to time. Entirely informal, you know. I don't hold with cluttering up an officer's record with such matters. Such as? Small matters, sir. Confinement to quarters, deprivation of shore leave, extra duty looking out at the masthead, writing an essay on ship handling. Nothing worthy of note, sir. He looked squarely at Merriweather. You know... Captain Bridges was sick this whole commission, and with the flag in her I was the commander as well as first. It wasn't easy to make Pitt as smart a ship as Commodore wanted her, but I did it. Whaley looked past Merriweather out the window towards the anchorage. The firm lips parted a little and quivering, then said almost inaudibly, After all that, I'm passed over. The matter suddenly came clear. Merriweather could read the bitter conviction in Whaley that slack performance by his subordinates had ruined his prospects for promotion to captain. The officers, fully aware of his disappointments in not being selected, were seeking to escape further retribution, deserved or not. There was no need to prolong the interview. Very well, Mr. Whaley, you've been most enlightening. Whaley left the room in his short, brisk gait. Merriweather pondered the situation briefly, then concluded that he would not endorse the requests just now. Let the matter simmer a few hours, time enough in the morning. He certainly could not release these officers now. He despised himself a moment for the procrastination, then put the matter out of his mind, and turned his attention to the tentative watch, quarter and station bill for Pitt. She required some four hundred men to fill her complement, and by death, disease, and desertion during her last commission she was close to a hundred men short. Waldron must know this, and there might already be a draft of ratings on its way from Bombay. But he wrote an urgent request for the men, and left it with the master attendant's chief clerk as he left for lunch at the Calcutta Club. Boatswain Tompkins's face was mottled red and white with anger. He was almost incoherent as he pointed out the narrow section midships along the keel. Larkin stood looking unbelievingly at the timbers exposed by the removal of marine growth from Rapid's bottom. Somehow a twenty-foot strip of copper plates was missing, and the Torido worm had almost consumed the exposed wood. Here, Merriweather realized, was the source of the leak Tompkins had mentioned to him last week. "'Damn that thieving, lazy folk!' sputtered the bosun. "'I know just when it happened, too. I took three days' leave when my son and his bride came to London.' "'When was this?' "'Why, just before the company bought the ship,' replied Tompkins. "'She was nearly finished in the graving dock when I took the leave, and—' Folk promised to put that last copper on the next morning. He paused and thought a moment. She was out of the dock when I came back, and the thought never crossed my mind again. Of course, the contract was with the former owners. 
But the company's solicitors might look into the matter, Commodore, said Merriweather. He turned to the carpenter. But what do you think, Mr. Svensson? Why, sir, you can see the keel is riddled. The planking can be replaced, but in a sea way it would be a constant worry. There are some kind of dry dock here in Calcutta, began Larkin, hopefully. Nonsense, growled Land. It would almost be rebuilding her to replace that keel section. And I would have to get orders from Bombay for putting the ship in a private dock. Sir, I can pour boiling pitch into the keel and then replace the planking. If we put some braces in the hold with good weather and a bit of luck, you might get her round to Bombay, interposed Svensson. Impossible, decided Land abruptly. She'll have to leave her battery and most of her supplies here, and I won't risk the men to sail her, Larkin. Bad luck on you, your first command, and unseaworthy. But I'll ask Waldron for authority to have the repairs made here, subject to an estimate of the cost. Two days later, Merriweather congratulated himself upon his procrastination in action on the requests for transfer by the officers in Pitt, since he was now able to endorse them, approved with a clear conscience. Land had ordered Rapid's officers and crew into Pitt to fill her watch quarter and station bill to overflowing. Only Boson Tompkins was left to supervise the shipkeepers from the dockyard stationed in Rapid as she awaited her fate. I know it's hard lines, he told Larkin a few days later over lunch at the Calcutta Club. You are a captain one day and the second lieutenant in Pitt the next. But consider with the appointment in your record, you'll get another command soon enough. He thought of Whaley and continued, This fellow is my senior in commissioned service in the Marine, so try to get along with him. Larkin laughed shortly. I admit it is a disappointment, but I'll survive. And I am looking forward to working with thirty-two pounder guns and carronades. Be a bit different from those nine pounders we've had. They left the club and came back to the dockyard to see the water casks being hoisted in, while the boatswain's mates and top men spun the intricate web of stays and standing rigging. The topmasts were now set up and in place. Merriweather thought of the problems he had encountered in fitting together two crews with the conflicts of seniority and authority of petty officers. Most of the conflicts he had solved by the simple expedient of putting the men in separate watches. Pitt's men under the cold blue eye of Larkin, and the port watch under McCamey with steady young Dobbs as his assistant. Still, there had been half a dozen cases among the artisans that would require further resolution, possibly even a change of rate or so. The life of a commander was never serene, Merriweather concluded, as he turned to go into the dockyard office. Another two weeks, and Pitt might be ready for sea, time to give consideration to the quantity and variety of cabin supplies he would require for the forthcoming commission, wherever it might take him. Caroline was bubbling with gossip at dinner. Mary Wilkins had confided that McClellan had called upon her four times since the new year, and would be her escort tonight to a small private dinner planned by the Houghtons. She thinks he is becoming serious, she concluded. By the by, how old is Mr. McClellan? Almost forty, I think. How old is she? Thirty-five, I should guess. Mary is a dear little person, and I do hope something develops. Of course he is under orders to Bombay, but not until June. It's hard to picture Mac on his knees asking for her hand, laughed Merriweather, and the conversation turned to other matters. After dinner, he fought down the impulse to go back to the dockyard and turned his attention to the latest edition of the signal book. With seven months' absence from the quarter-deck, his recollection was hazy, but in a quarter of an hour the print had blurred, his mind was again focused upon his new commission, and Whaley 
in particular. The first lieutenant was certainly energetic. He had demonstrated faultless seamanship in the ballasting of the ship and setting up her standing rigging thus far. Still, there would have been a flogging this morning but for Merriweather's intervention yesterday afternoon. The man was one of Rapids, a gangling half-wit named Braden, whose sole accomplishment was the ability to make perfect splices. Tompkins had reserved him for this one duty, as his weight was of no consequence in tailing on a brace. The petty officers had come to understand the man's limitations. A stay awaiting an eye splice in its bitter end, secured to the bulwarks with a bit of twine, had come adrift and was flying in the breeze. Braden was close beside it, his long slender fingers pulling hempen strands through the loops held open in another line by a fid as he completed his splice. The stay could cause no harm. It was merely an Irish pennant to annoy an officer with passion for seamen's ships such as Whaley. Here, you, Whaley said in his soft voice. Braden had paid no attention, intent now on pulling out all the strands even. You! said Whaley again. Secure that line. Braden, mouth open, had looked up and about, blankly right past Whaley, and then continued his single-minded attention to the splice. Merriweather had seen the glint in Whaley's eyes. He stepped towards Braden with the evident intent of putting the half-wit on report for deliberate disobedience to a direct order. A flogging offence. Oh, Mr. Whaley, Merriweather had called. Whaley paused momentarily, glanced towards Merriweather, then looked back at Braden as though he would finish with that business before responding to the summons. Mr. Whaley! Whaley had then turned reluctantly. Yes, sir. I should like to see you a moment at your convenience, please. Whaley had stepped briskly over to be drawn out of earshot, and Braden explained. At the mast he certainly would have mitigated the charge, but it would have put Whaley in a bad light to have brought such a complaint and then be overruled in a public hearing. With an effort, Merriweather turned his attention back to the signal instructions, but it was impossible to concentrate on them. His eyelids were heavy. He was tired. He had not regained the weight lost last year in the ride across Persia. No use to fight it, he decided, and went to bed closely followed by Caroline. Just before he dropped off to sleep, he wondered again if he might have contracted the distemper. It must have been only a few minutes when Merriweather came awake with a start, and then found himself quite unable to sleep again. A sense of doom settled over him. He racked his brain. Had he overlooked some essential in the refitting and commissioning of Pitt? Was he in default in his reports to Bombay Castle? Was there something yet undone in settling his accounts for the trip last fall to Tehran? The thought of Persia reminded him of the diplomat he had accompanied on the mission last year, Alfred Robert Percy, a man polished hard as a diamond, Caroline had said. He no longer felt the sense of shame the fear of discovery of his bastardy that had haunted his adult life. He realized that without conscious logic, he had accepted the fact that he was Percy's son, was tacitly recognized as such. He felt an inner confidence, even a sense of pride that he'd never experienced before. Caroline moved restlessly beside him and turned to him in the coolness of the night. The depression of a moment ago vanished as she welcomed his attentions gladly and with spirit. The Earl of Minto, Gibby Elliot Percy had familiarly called him, was an affable outgoing man who spoke in slow rounded sentences, quite different from the quick incisive style of Sir George Barlow. The new Governor-General of India presided over the small gathering in his chamber with an air of great good will almost brushing aside the formal deference accorded him. Commander Land had taken Merriweather in to present him a few minutes before the arrival of the other conferees. 
Ah, yes, Merriweather. I read your report a few weeks back. Interesting. And Rob Percy's too. He thinks the peril of Bonaparte's invasion through Persia is ended, but boy Malcolm will yet attempt to see the Shah. And how was Rob when you last saw him? I heard a rumour that he was painfully wounded. Yes, Your Excellency. He lost a leg by reason of gangrene setting in after a bullet wound. A pity. Rob so loved to ride to the hounds. He was the most complimentary of your services in the mission. Said it would have failed but for your enterprise. And now I think our party has gathered. He tinkled the bell on his desk. In the momentary interval before the secretary opened the door, Merriweather wondered what reward he might receive if Percy expected a barony out of the affair. He then decided that speculation was futile. The secretary held the door as the officers filed in, led by Vice Admiral Sir Edward Pellew, Commander-in-Chief of the India Station. Merriweather had met him briefly two years ago after the French frigate sent to supply Tipu Sultan was taken off Ceylon. He saw with astonishment that Pellew had become grossly fat, with a vast belly and pendulous jowls lapping over his collar. The sedentary life of an admiral seldom now at sea, and the rich drink and provender had betrayed the energetic Pellew. The introductions were brief. Merriweather was flattered when Pellew remembered the occasion of their previous meeting and shook his hand. The others were General Sir John Stanley, commanding Fort William, Colonel Lionel Smith, commanding H.M. 65th Regiment, Major Eric Abbott, commanding the 1st Battalion of the 47th Infantry, Captain Ian Dunbar of the Royal Navy, and Captain Richard Seaton of the Bombay Marine. Chairs were already ringed about the large desk that had replaced the table Sir George had used. Merriweather slid into the one at the left end of the ring beside land. Gentlemen, began Minto, looking left, then right. It is a most felicitous occasion that brings together so many distinguished officers of our military forces to plan what promises to be a challenging operation. He paused to pick up a sheaf of notes on foolscap, looked at them, and continued, It involves a place called ras ul Khaima, if I pronounce it correctly, a fortified town on the south coast of the Persian Gulf and the seat of Sheikh Hassan bin Rama, who commands the Juasme pirate fleet. It was inevitable, Merriweather thought bitterly. He had spent most of his first three years in the Marine cruising against those Arab cutthroats who delighted in executing captured infidels to the last man, and had hoped never again to enter the Persian Gulf after last autumn. Still, if the presence of the Commander-in-Chief of the India Station and the General Commanding Fort William betokened anything, it promised to be a well-planned and well-mounted affair. He gave his full attention as Minto continued. This office is in receipt of the most urgent representations from the government of the Bombay Presidency, supplemented by a report from Mr. Bruce, the political agent at Bushir, and transmitting a formal request for assistance from our ally, the Imam of Muscat, against whom this Hassan bin Rama seems to be leading the Wahhabis in revolt. Minto looked at Captain Seaton. You had concluded a treaty with the then leaders of the Juasmis only some two years ago. Yes, Your Excellency, replied Seaton, a tall, fair man with prominent nose and chin. February the 6th, 1806, to be exact. The Wahhabis are reported to be a dissident sect of the Muslim religion, and in addition to their piracies, they seek to convert their captives on pain of having their throats cut, Minto continued. They have taken more than a score of country ships and those of our friends in Muscat and Persia this past year. Only a few weeks ago a squadron of their ships overpowered the company packet Minerva in the Gulf, hacked her master into bits, and then killed every man in her. 
save only one mate and the carpenter. Then last week we had another report of an attack by these same pirates on a country ship just north of Bombay, but they were frightened off by the appearance of a marine cruiser. Merriweather listened to the measured cadence of Minto's voice, visualizing for himself the bloody actuality of the events mentioned. The Joasmiths had only come to be a serious problem about the time that he had entered the marine, but in the half-dozen brushes he had had with them, they had proved to be very fair seamen and ferocious fighters, seeking first to cripple and surround their prey, then carry her by boarding. In light of all the circumstances, the Governor-General and Council is constrained to grant the relief sought by the Imam and the Bombay Government. These facts have previously been communicated to Admiral Pellew and General Stanley, with the request that the Navy mount this operation in combination with the Army and the Bombay Marine. Do you have a report, Sir Edward? Yes, Your Excellency, said Pellew briskly. Captain Seaton is in possession of fresh intelligence. He is of the opinion that a destruction of the fortified town of Ras ul Khaimar is that the pronunciation will deny the pirate fleet a base, and we can then sweep up their vessels in the Gulf at leisure. Commodore Dunbar, Colonel Smith, and Captain Seaton have drawn the actual operation order, of which we have copies for all concerned. He laid a slender packet before Minto, and fair copies were passed around the circle of officers. Merriweather felt a twinge of resentment. Apparently he was to be a part of the expedition, but Seaton had not seen fit to consult with him. He suppressed his peak and looked at the order, much briefer than the one he had drafted with so many doubts last year for his Bengal squadron. The names leaped out. Dunbar with the temporary rank of Commodore to be in command of the combined naval forces, Smith, Colonel of the 65th with his pockmarked face to command the military forces and siege operations, and Seaton to have political charge of the expedition, including the use and deployment of troops to be supplied by the Imam of Muscat. Hell's bells the order created a three-headed monster, he could foresee endless confusion and friction with the authority and responsibility for the mission thus divided. Merriweather read on. His name finally appeared in one of the concluding paragraphs. Commodore Dunbar would exercise direct military command over all ships present, but Captain Percival Merriweather, HCS, was designated senior officer present in the marine ships for liaison and administrative purposes only. Hell's bells, he thought again, all the onus and headaches of the operation, and no real authority to deal with them. He felt Land stir restlessly beside him, clearing his throat. But Land did not say anything. Appended to the order was a list of ships and forces to be embarked. HMS Chiffon, 36, and Caroline, 32 both no better than fifth rates and four transports to be furnished by the Royal Navy. There were eleven company cruisers with Pitt heading the list. The Marine had again drawn the heavy end of the operation, Merriweather thought sourly. He turned the page. The flank companies of His Majesty's 65th Infantry, a detachment from the 47th, mostly sappers and engineers, a battery from the Bombay Artillery Regiment, and a thousand Sepoy Marines completed the list. The company was furnishing two-thirds of the ships and forces, but had no control over them. Merriweather sat back again, awaiting the discussion. To his surprise, there was none. Outside, the army officers mounted horses held by troopers, and cantered off towards Fort William with their escort. Sirs, said Land to Pellew Dunbar and Seaton, I would be honoured if you would join us for lunch. I cannot, Commodore, but I thank you. I have a previous engagement, but perhaps these gentlemen will keep you company. 
they uncovered as a footman assisted Pellew to hoist his ponderous weight through the door of his carriage. Of course. The two parties each mounted their tongas and trotted around to the Calcutta Club. Bland, Seaton and Merriweather had gin, Dunbar chose Madeira. Glasses clinked and each officer sat back to assess the others. Dunbar was a rarity, a lowland Scot who had achieved high rank in the Royal Navy, which tended to draw a majority of its officers from the sons of landed gentry in the southern counties of England. He was of moderate stature with a square ruddy face wearing a perpetual expression of great good humour. Yet his eyes were hot and brown. Merriweather speculated whether he might be easily inflamed to anger. Seaton he had known casually from his earliest days in the Marine. The man was two years Merriweather's senior in the captain's list, but he had not seen active service for a long time, his linguistic accomplishments in Arabic making him far too valuable as a political agent and diplomat to risk at sea. Well, Merriweather, said Dunbar suddenly, I saw you frowning at the operation order. What displeases you? The direct question took Merriweather by surprise. Dunbar's expression of good humour had not altered, but there was a hard glint in his eyes. Merriweather took a sip of gin and tasted the half-lemon before he made his reply. I suppose, Commodore, I was surprised that there is no commander-in-chief designated. Dunbar looked hard at him for a moment, then sat back and glanced away. Oh, that... Simple enough. Pellew wouldn't have the army in command or Stanley the navy. And of course neither would accept a Bombay marine officer. He smiled. I thought mayhap you questioned the strategy or tactics. No, not at all, said Merriweather, despising himself the while for his insincerity. Dunbar had a temper with a short fuse, he concluded, and also pride of authorship in the operation order. Merriweather resolved to govern himself accordingly in his future dealings with the man. Now Land led the conversation into other fields. Seaton appeared to be a man of reserve, pleasant enough but taciturn, painfully slender with thin greying hair. The few remarks he interposed were penetrating, even witty. Land called for another round of drinks after he had placed their orders with the waiter. Halfway through the second gin, Seaton's reserve dissolved, and he suddenly intruded into the chit-chat, cutting Dunbar off in mid-sentence. The imam of Muscat trusts and relies upon me implicitly, he said in a loud, carrying tone, causing heads to turn across the room. He has promised hold fast, Seaton, said Land. No cause to tell all Calcutta. Seaton continued as though he had not heard the interruption, a hectic flush blossoming on either cheek. Ten thousand men, forty guns, and the transports to move them. He never... Land shook him by the shoulder. Quiet, man! Seaton looked at the Commodore for a moment, mouth open, then tossed off the remainder of the gin and subsided in his chair, staring into space. The waiter appeared with his retinue of assistants bringing the first course, and Seaton revived as he was served. Merriweather wondered at the reaction. He had a time or so before encountered a man to whom alcohol was poison, but never one so suddenly afflicted as Seaton had been. Merriweather came away with a confusion of impressions. Dunbar, straightforward, but a man not to be crossed, Quick and violent in temper. Seaton, quiet, reserved and intellectual, but susceptible to spirits in astonishingly small quantities. And Colonel Lionel Smith, he had formed no impression beyond the hard, pocked face. Smith had made no comment during the Council of War, but few rose to his rank in a line regiment without ability and influence. I don't like the thing at all complained Land as they drove back to the dockyard. A three-headed monster, 
and they'll be at one another's throats before they are over the horizon. Merriweather was a little surprised at Land's use of the very phrase that had entered his mind when he read the order. It was mid-afternoon, hot and sultry, and the gin had imparted a lassitude that threatened to overwhelm him. He forced himself to go out to Pitt and observe her progress. Less than a week, he concluded, and she would be ready for sea. Merriweather had moved his furnishing as a board pit two days ago. His sea chest, a few odd belongings, and the shelf of books Caroline had assembled for his further education and entertainment during this commission remained in his lodgings. The quarters were spacious, but by no means as well arranged or comfortably fitted as rapids, since this ship had been built as a ship of war with flimsy bulkheads designed to be knocked down in a trice when she cleared for action. His sleeping cabin on the starboard side was crowded by two thirty-two-pounder carronades that crouched at either end of the cot bolted to the cabin floor. He would have preferred the brass bed from Rapid, but there was no space for it. He had been able to indent on the dockyard as custodian of Rapid's allowance for her desk and chairs to furnish the day cabin, and had boldly walked off with the rack of four blunderbusses and truncheons, daring land or the yard gunner to challenge this bit of petty larceny. The flag cabin on the port side was a mirror image of this one, but locked and empty, completely unfurnished. Merriweather hoped it would remain so this cruise. There was a knock, and Whaley entered with the morning report. Whaley laid the slip on the desk and looked downstream through the stern lights with a smug expression. Four more hands have run, sir. Two of them petty officers from Rapid. Who? demanded Merriweather. This was a shock. The men had extended their enlistments only last month. Carson and Butterwreck. Carson had been a gunner's mate and Butterwreck the senior cooper's mate in Rapid. Merriweather had been in the process of solving their problems of seniority with Pitt's petty officers by the expedient of making Carson a master-at-arms and transferring Butterick to the carpenter's crew. Now they had incurred all the penalties of desertion. You have notified the dockyard and the sheriff of Calcutta, I am sure, Mr. Whaley. At least we are not short-handed for the nonce. Whaley's satisfaction in making the announcement galled him, and he turned back to the manifest he had been reading in dismissal. Still, the matter was disturbing. Only yesterday, Ames, a promising mizzen topman and rapid, had almost fallen to his death from the royal yard when a foot rope parted. He had managed to catch a backstay with one hand and divert his hurtling body head first into the starboard shrouds to survive. The parted line showed where, but there were particles of grit, possibly from a fragment of holy stone in the fibre. Ames was rope burned, sore, shaken, and apprehensive. Merriweather sighed laid aside the manifest and wrote a chit to transfer him to a billet with the master-at-arms while the matter was fresh in his mind, taking the place of the deserter, Carson. His assignment to this ship had been ill-starred from the first day when she went adrift on the tidal bore. Then, all of her officers save Whaley and her surgeon, Mefford, had requested transfer and reassignments though that now appeared to be a blessing in disguise, since he was able to replace them with Rapid's contingent. Now, two reliable petty officers who had served him well for more than two years had apparently found their condition intolerable, and another was convinced that an attempt had been made on his life. Merriweather blamed himself for not acting sooner with more vigour to suppress the hazing by Pitt's old hands. There was an almost continuous hammering just above his head, pounding in his ears, as the carpenter and gunner installed their mounts for the long nine pivot gun he had removed from Rapid. He could stand it no longer, and escaped ashore. 
All he could see was the top of Caroline's head gleaming in the lamplight as she bent over the table on which her selection of books was laid out. Some were from her own small travelling library, but most had come from the bookseller at Fort William. Since you follow the profession of arms, she said with an upward glance, this translation of the Iliad should engross you. And I've managed to find the decline and fall in a good octavo edition. I have the collected works of Goldsmith and Pope and Johnson's Rasselas, as well as the works of the Bard. You should not want for entertainment on your voyage. Merriweather thought of the day's events, and wondered if he would have time or inclination to while away the days and nights at sea absorbing the contents of his bookshelf. With the conflict in his crew, his compelling need to direct the men into an effective hole to work and fight the ship, and his responsibility to keep the peace between the marine forces, the Royal Navy and the Army, he could foresee few idle hours. Thank you, my dear. I shall try to further my education. And now, shouldn't we be on our way? Caroline picked up the blue cape she had devised and Meriwether held it as she draped it over her shoulders, and arranged it so as to conceal her ungainly figure. They went out to the waiting Tonga and rode through the cooling evening the short distance to the townhouse of Mr. Andrew Salisbury, a senior company official and uncle by marriage to Miss Mary Wilkins. McClellan had said nothing, but the reason for the affair was obvious. It promised to be a long night. Here, on Friday, the first week in February, all the repairs, refitting and victualling of Pitt had been accomplished. She awaited only the arrival of the hoy from far upstream, filled with clear water from an uncontaminated spring before reporting ready for sea. McClellan had asked Merriweather to stand up with him at the wedding to be solemnized Saturday afternoon at St. John's Church. Caroline, in her condition, had demurred to serving as an attendant to Mary Wilkins, but she would preside at the tea table at the reception afterwards. Frivolous distractions, Merriweather decided, as he thought of the sullen crew in pit. Even Rapid's men appeared to have become infected with the general discontent. If there was the remotest possibility of mutiny, he had the absolute duty not to get the ship under way. But Larkin, McCamey and Dobbs, together with Boson Caldwell, insisted the air would be clear once the regular routine at sea resumed. The Master at Arms reported no leader in flaming the hands, and the consensus was that the present temper was the result of an arduous tropical operation last year, followed by the past weeks of back-breaking labour in refitting the ship. He hoped their judgment was sound. It would be more than a week before the transports and Royal Navy would be ready to embark the troops. They had ample force to escort the convoy without pit, and Merriweather felt that he required at least a week of general and special drills at sea to re-establish the skills and teamwork of his crew, so that they would respond with the correct action in the heat of battle without direct orders. "'I'm dubious, Merriweather,' said Land. "'I'd have to get consent from both Pellew and General Stanley for you to proceed independently.' "'Only to Bombay, sir,' urged Merriweather. Lord knows I need the time to shake the crew down, find out the mismatches in the station bill, and, and I must learn the sailing qualities and handling characteristics of Pitt for myself. I can't believe you'll find that much difference. But I shall ask, when do you want to sail? Monday, sir, if the water is on board. The water hoy came in sight while church services were being conducted by Purser Davis on Sunday morning. Doctors Mefford and Buttram took their samples, pronounced it potable, and the cooper with his mates took charge of the watering operation. Merriweather seized the opportunity to call a meeting of his officers to ascertain their state of readiness. He still had no word from land. 
As he waited in the day cabin for the messenger to deliver the summons, he drank his fourth cup of coffee. Tea simply did not possess authority enough this morning, and ate a slice of toasted bread, his first solid refreshment of the day. It had indeed been a gay affair, the nuptials celebrated with fitting solemnity, the bride radiant but entirely self-possessed, and Big McClellan pale and tremulous. Once the ceremony was over and the party had adjourned to the reception, Caroline at the tea-table found little custom. This was a hard-drinking array of officers and civilians, one toast after another offered and drunk. Larkin, Dobbs and Buttram had determined that this would be an event their old shipmate would remember, and their exuberance had lifted and carried Merriweather along in spite of his resolve to abstain. The party had continued long after McClellan and his bride had stolen away, and he hoped that those gentlemen were nursing heads as sore this morning as his. Sang slid in the door, coffee-pot in hand. Not now. Be sure you have enough for the officers, he told the steward. I think they will appreciate it. He was beginning to feel human again enough so that the nagging worry that had possessed him these past weeks escaped him for the moment. The order to proceed independently to Bombay came out to the ship during the first dog-watch. Merriweather hoped no word of it would reach the port watch on shore leave, since he intended to drop down the hoogly on the ebb tomorrow morning and he wanted no more desertions. This was his last night ashore with Caroline for some indeterminate period and he felt a flush of tenderness for his wife, who must now cope alone with her pregnancy. McClellan and his bride, both glowing with self-consciousness, were guests for dinner. They were boarding with Mrs. Wilkins here in the other half of the bungalow until McClellan's orders for Bombay could be executed. There was a ceremonial round of toasts drunk in Madeira, then dinner, and an early parting. Later, Merriweather and Lady Caroline sat in companionable silence in the yellow lamplight, engrossed in their private thoughts. Merriweather's mind inexorably turned back to Pitt, and he found himself stiff and tense at the prospect of taking her down the river tomorrow, even with the counsel of the Indian pilot who had brought her up. Foolishness, he decided. She might have her quirks, but she should handle as well as any other ship. He relaxed, poured another brandy, and invited Caroline to bed. Two days later, Pitt dropped the pilot at the Sandheads in the late afternoon. It was too late to commence any drills, and Merriweather was in no mood for such after the trying descent of the Hoogley. Pitt was more than three feet deeper in draught than rapid, and must needs stay exactly in mid-channel. With the launch and cutter towing alongside, prepared instantly to pull bow or stern about, two anchors ready for letting go and only topsails, headsail and spanker set, he found her momentum frightening in these swift, narrow waters. He had anchored last night with a great sense of relief at the few hours of surcease from the constant tension of being alert for hazards, no matter who had the deck. He had broken one of his own most cherished precepts and drunk two gins before Sang served his dinner. Now in the open waters of the Bay of Bengal, he felt a wave of relief as the special sea details were relieved by the underway watch. All plain sail was set, and the ship steered south-southwest toward Ceylon, under the vigilant eye of Lieutenant Dobbs. The first two days will be almost entirely drills on seamanship, tacking, wearing, reefing, taking in and setting sail, Merriweather told the assembled officers and warrant officers the next morning. I want every man to know what his duty is under every conceivable condition at sea. Indeed, we may surprise you with a fire, collision or man overboard drill at random to add spice to our affairs. The balance of our time will be spent at gun drills and then at target practice. I intend to burn up those kegs of stale powder in your magazines at targets, Mr. Vance.
he said in an aside to the fat little gunner who grinned in approval. Now, are there any questions? There was a restive movement among the officers ranged about the bulkheads of the day cabin anticipating their dismissal. They understood only too well, he knew, a week of back-breaking exertion for all hands, of driving men until they had mastered every detail of their duties in this ship, and were able to perform them in darkness or gale or with round shot whistling past their ears. He heard another throat cleared, and Whaley spoke up. Now I demand that each of you gentlemen bear a hand. No lollygagging or sightseeing about the decks. No Irish penance or gear adrift, pipes knocked out in the kits, and I want every idler on report, whether he is in your department or not. We'll have no Nambi pambies in the ship. Very well, gentlemen, said Merriweather after a pause, seeing the expressions of irritation on the faces of Larkin, Dobbs and Hamlin. I think you understand the necessity of these drills, and you may be excused. Whaley's gratuitous admonition had left a sour taste with these officers, the feeling that they were under more of a compulsion than the implicit demands of their professional duty. He wished that the first lieutenant had remained silent. The first three days of ship handling and seamanship exercises went well enough. Most of the hands were practised seamen. The weather was fine and comfortably cool. Merriweather soon discovered that Pitt handled nearly as well as Rapid. Despite her size, her underwater lines were finely drawn, and she would sail within a quarter point as close to the wind. His confidence was restored, and he looked forward to the gunnery drills and target practice with the thirty-two-pounder main batteries of short guns and carronades. Some of the sullen disposition in the crew seemed to have evaporated and the spirit of teamwork became more evident as the evolutions were repeated. Masts and yards had been sent back up and sails bent on for the third time this cruise. Pitt settled on the starboard tack as close hauled as she would lie, and the hands came pouring out of the rigging down ratlins and stays for a well-deserved breather. Man overboard! The hail came from far forward and for a moment it crossed his mind that Whaley had staged an impromptu drill on his own initiative. Then he saw hands peering over the starboard bulwarks and realised it was a live emergency. Hamlin pulled loose the lifebuoy at the break of the poop and sent it spinning down as Merriweather reached the rail. He saw a white face in the water, eyes staring up blindly, arms and legs thrashing in mad panic oblivious of the boy bobbing only a few feet away. "'Hands to the braces!' Dob shouted forward. "'Where ship?' Over his shoulder he tossed the command to the wheel. "'Starboard your helm!' It was entirely the correct reaction, much quicker than going about, and a course of a point or so to the left of the reciprocal of the ship's track should bring Pitt back through the same waters it had just traversed. Away, quarter boat! shouted Hamlin, and there was a rush to man the falls of the boat maintained on davits on the starboard quarter in readiness for just such a duty. Yet something was inexplicably wrong. The bow was swinging to starboard. Dobbs and Merriweather realized almost simultaneously that the quartermaster had erred, either misunderstood the command, or had a mental lapse and put the helm hard over to port. It would still be all right to come to the wind and go about, though not as fast as wearing, and the ship had sufficient way on to carry her bow past the eye of the wind and settle on the port tack. It was then that Dobbs made the first error of judgment in a matter of seamanship that Merriweather had noticed in a year and a half. Shift your helm! shouted Dobbs, fairly dancing with rage. As you were! shouted Merriweather. But it was too late. The quartermaster, suddenly conscious of his initial error, had already reacted. The shifted rudder had halted the swing of the bow, her way was insufficient to carry her now past the eye of the wind, and the ship was in stays, caught dead aback, helpless for the moment. To compound the matter, there was a horrendous crash on the deck aft, 
and the quarter-boat rested at an angle on its stern, a wooden block split cleanly through dangling from the afterfalls to explain the casualty. Dobbs had regained his composure. He let Pitt gather stemway, then put the rudder over. The hands hauled around on the braces and the sails filled as the ship settled on the port tack. There was yet a chance of recovering the man if he had overcome his panic sufficiently to see and reach the life boy. They sighted the boy ten minutes later, but there was no head in the water beside it. The man was lost. Who was he? inquired Merriweather of Whaley. Why, a young lad named Rush, I'm told. I didn't know him. He was out of rapid. Rush? An image of a bony, homeless waif of fifteen, articled as a ship's boy at Bombay Castle over a year ago, appeared in Merriweather's mind. He had served in the galley and as a powder monkey at quarters last winter during the cruise of the Bengal squadron. Only yesterday the lad had re-identified himself, grown five inches taller, heavier thirty pounds, beginning to sprout a sandy beard, and proud that the boatswain had accepted him as a striker in the deck force. It might have been himself fifteen years ago, Merriweather thought. Poor fellow, he said to Whaley. But few men would drown if they would only keep their heads. In blind panic he could not see the boy right in front of his nose. Well, enter him in the log, inventory his sea-bag, though I doubt he had a family, and have the purser cast an account of his pay. The vision of the white face and the staring eyes haunted him, but the exercises continued while a crestfallen Hamlin oversaw the reaving of a new fall for the quarter-boat David. It was apparent to Merriweather that sheer panic, not the failure of the tackle or the mental lapse allowing the ship to be taken aback, was responsible for the loss of a life. But it seemed an ill omen to lose a man so uselessly so early in the commission. The gunnery drills, commencing the next morning, had degenerated into a shambles by the end of the second day. Experienced hands performed poorly, and some did not even go through the motions. Larkin and Gunner Vance cajoled, threatened, and shamed the crews without visible improvement. The southern atmosphere of a few days ago had been replaced by a muttering undertone, defiant eyes, and reluctant movements. By the end of the day, Larkin had sacked three gun captains for inefficiency. The breaking point came when a seaman let go the gun tackle he was heaving on, turned and spat between Larkin's feet, splattering his shoes and stockings with tobacco juice. Put that man in irons! Two masters at arms stepped forward, billy clubs at the ready, as the man retreated among his mates. The masters at arms pressed into the group, seeking to reach the offender, then found themselves jostled, their clubs snatched from their hands and thrown over the side. Boson Corwell came up on the double with four more masters at arms, moving in with practised authority to scatter the crowd and seize the culprit. In short order, three men were frog marched forward to the brig. Merriweather had been below when the melee erupted and arrived on deck only in time to see the end of the affair. Bloody filthy swine! Larkin raved, wiping the stains from his shoes with a wad of oakum. I've never held with the cat, but this time it's the only answer. His pale blue eyes glinted and his face was suffused with fury. Bring these three and the other members of the gun crew to the mast in the morning, Merriweather said. Do you intend to conduct target practice tomorrow? There had not been a case meriting a flogging in Merriweather's crew in over two years, and he shrank from the prospect. Yes, sir, though I'm afraid some of these Donkeys may blow themselves or the ship up. What with the way they've performed so far? Very well. Merriweather turned to go aft, and became aware that he was the subject of an intense scrutiny by three men lounging at the break of the forecastle. They were Bats, Sublet, and Osborne, captains of the four main and mizzen tops, respectively, 
all lithe, agile, slender men as befitted highly skilled seamen who performed their duty in a web of hemp and canvas far above the deck. Batson's sublet turned away, but Osborne's feral yellow eyes stared into his for an insolent moment before he too moved forward. This was the man mentioned by Ames, the topman he had transferred to the Master at Arms Force, after he had almost fallen from the mizzen top a week or so ago. Merriweather wondered for a moment if the man might still be vindictive. Ames had been in the party that came to the aid of the disarmed masters at arms. Unlikely, yet unaccountably two lines from the bard popped into his mind. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Merriweather shrugged off the thought as he went aft, but he slept ill with the thought of the flogging in his mind. The mast he convened at the commencement of the forenoon watch was brief. Larkin made his statement, and the master at arms identified the two men in the gun crew who had disarmed them. Actually, Merriweather considered as he listened to the character given each of the prisoners by the leading petty officer. The offence committed by the man who splashed Larkin with spittle was minor by comparison with the disarming of the masters at arms. A breach of discipline and a personal affront to Larkin deserved punishment, but the action of the other hands in protecting him was symptomatic of a far more dangerous spirit of unrest in the crew. Is there anything further you have to say in your defence? he demanded. No. Then find the charges proved in each case. Step forward, Bell. Bell the spitter took a pace forward. I sentence you to six lashes with the cat to be administered by the leading master at arms. Bell hung his head as he stepped back into ranks. Step forward, Carter and Phillips. They took the step and looked defiantly at Merriweather. Carter and Phillips. Your offence is most serious. I have considered convening a court of inquiry which might very well sentence you to hang. I prefer, however, to settle this matter within my own ship. I therefore sentence each of you to receive twelve lashes with the cat to be administered by the leading master at arms. He realised instantly that he had made no impression on the two men. As for the nine other men of the gun crew who failed to give assistance to the masters at arms, extra duty for thirty days, and deprivation of shore leave at the next port. The boatswain's mates passed the word throughout the ship, down hatches and scuttles to the very bowels of the vessel, bringing up pale-skinned holders and storekeepers who rarely saw the light of day on deck. All hands to witness punishment! All hands! All hands! The response of the crew was sluggish, but finally the hands were in ranks mustered by divisions. Bell was led to the starboard main shrouds, stripped to the waist and triced by the wrists. Samuels, the leading master at arms, a short-legged man with the torso of a giant took position behind and to the left of the man. He wore a leather glove on his right hand to reinforce his grip on the cat, while he held the nine leather tendrils gathered in his left hand. Merriweather steeled himself. Carry out punishment, he commanded. Samuels brought the cat back, then forward in one fluid movement. Red welts erupted across Bell's back from shoulder to waist, but he threw back his head, mouth opening soundlessly. One, said the boatswain. God, said Buttram, turning away. Samuel stroked the tails of the cat back into alignment with his left hand, using his fingers as a comb. Two. By the sixth blow, blood was trickling down Bell's back to soak his waistband. The masters at arms disengaged his wrists, threw his shirt over his shoulders, and led him forward to the sick bay where the loblolly boys would minister to him. He had not uttered a sound during the flogging, but now he walked unsteadily, racked by dry sobs. 
Carter, carry out punishment. The man twisted between the masters at arms to look over his shoulder and smirk at the hands. There was a mutter in the ranks, instantly silenced by the petty officers. Samuels was truly an artist with the cat. He laid a criss-cross pattern on Carter's back that was almost exactly symmetrical, completing the design with the twelfth lash. Carter stood rigid, refusing to cry out or wince. Nine times twelve thought Merriweather one hundred and eight welts. When Carter was released, the masters at arms had to carry him below. Phillips, carry out punishment. The man was very fair with milk-white skin. He cried out hoarsely at each blow after the third. The twelfth lash to complete Samuel's design was high on the back. One of the tails flew loose above his shoulder, and the weighted knot in its end curled around his head to strike Philip squarely in the eye. It was entirely unintentional, but punishment had been inflicted far in excess of the sentence. See to him, Buttram. Merriweather went below, sick and trembling. Sang brought tea and then brandy. It was nearly an hour before Buttram knocked and entered. Blinded, he said. The eyeball was ruptured. Nothing I can do but apply medications and give him enough laudanum to make him sleep the rest of the day. Truth to tell, sir, I could use a bit of that brandy too. Useless, said Merriweather. Of course it was an accident, but the man is maimed. Here, have some brandy. He thought of the young seaman lost overboard, and continued, An unlucky cruise. Merriweather was diverted by the knock and entrance of the messenger from the office of the watch, bringing a request for permission to exercise at quarters, target practice. I'll come, he told the man. The target raft was ready to be hoisted over the side when he reached the deck. Send the hands to quarters, he told Dobbs, seeing Whaley going forward to his battle station on the forecastle. The practice went surprisingly well, considering the reluctant conduct of the gun crews during the drills yesterday. It was more interesting, of course. The men could hear the guns speak and see for themselves the results of their aim. By the conclusion of the drill, the raft had been reduced to splinters. An excellent practice, he was able to tell the perspiring Whaley and Larkin in the late afternoon. I begin to entertain some hope that we may hold our own in an engagement. He watched the chattering hands skylarking as they dispersed from quarters with the words, Up spirits ringing in their ears, and told himself the morale was on the mend. The smoking lamp had been relighted in the forecastle, and several members of the watch below clustered on deck, forward in the twilight, puffing on their pipes. Whaley, Larkin, the gunner, and Merriweather could only attempt a reconstruction from the scanty evidence that remained after the event. Hamlin had passed the word for the second dog watch to relieve, and one of the pipe smokers moved over to knock the dottle out in one of the spit kits placed about the decks for that purpose. They were simply clay pots fitted with a metal lid with a hole in its centre, designed to hold ashes and sparks from pipes or cigars and prevent them from blowing about the deck. Their use was relentlessly enforced by the petty officers under the direction of Whaley, both to keep pit shipshape and reduce the danger of fire. Hamlin's evidence was explicit. As the man wrapped the bowl of his pipe on the metal edge, an orange ball of fire erupted, accompanied by a low-order explosion, and engulfed three of the four seamen standing near the pot. The deck was blackened and scorched, but there was no fire. The metal cover flew high in the air, glanced off a stay, and sailed into the sea. There were only minute shards of the pot to be found, interspersed with charred fragments of surge from a thirty-two-pounder carronade cartridge. Some person or persons unknown had concealed the gunpowder in the spit kit, 
with the intent that just such a casualty as this would result. Two of the men survived less than an hour. Their lungs were seared, doctors Mefford and Buttram reported by breathing in the fiery gas. The third had burns on face and hands, but would recover. The pot with its removable lid had not sufficiently contained the powder to cause a full-scale explosion. Merriweather made an entry in the log appointing Whaley, Larkin and Bosun Caldwell as a board of investigation, and they spent the better part of the night cross-examining witnesses. Sirs, Gunner Vance testified, Mr. Larkin told me he would fire five shots each from the main battery 32-pounder guns and carronades. I used the oldest powder in the magazine to make up 200 cartridges. I still have 20 of them. I made only 10 nine-pounder cartridges and you saw them fired. What about your regular supply? demanded Whaley. It tallies exactly with my ordnance inventory, sir, the gunner insisted and the bale of empty cartridges we took on at Calcutta is under lock and key. Never been opened, sir. A stream of gun captains, powder monkeys, and even the sepoy marines stationed during general quarters as sentries at each hatch and companionway denied that any cartridge brought on deck had not been expended. The smoking lamp and galley fires had been put out from the time the gunnery drill commenced so the cartridge might have been placed in the pot at any time during the day, with the expectation that no spark would reach it until late afternoon. The investigation ended with a close interrogation of the masters-at-arms, who could name no suspects. Merriweather shook his head as he read the report. It had been a senseless, vicious act aimed not at any particular person, but only at the first man who might casually drop a spark into the kit. Pitt had lost two able seamen, another was painfully burned, and the madman remained at large within the ship. Copy your report into the log, he told Whaley the next afternoon. Corbin understands that his masters-at-arms are to continue the investigation and report any inkling, no matter how trivial, that may point to the culprit. Yes, sir. And you know, I was within a dozen feet of that kit all day yesterday. I don't remember a soul approaching it after the word for quarters was passed. But a number knocked out their pipes in it just before the drill commenced. So the powder must not have been in it then. Possibly. But the ways of gunpowder are chancy. In the surge cartridge, no spark may have been hot enough to penetrate. Merriweather went on deck to stand with Dobbs and Hamlin as they took the evening star sights. The ship was making a good six knots by the log under all plain sail, and by their reckoning should be off Polk Strait, separating Ceylon from India by dawn. He noted in his night order book the possibility that Pitt would be challenged by a Royal Navy picket ship by morning, and made sure the watch had the current recognition signal before he went below to dine. Merriweather never knew what caused him to wake. It was dark, entirely silent except for the continuous background creak and sigh of the ship, and he knew it must be some time in the middle watch. He could smell the hot metal of the dark lantern mounted overhead with its tiny aperture open to focus a beam of light on the tell-tale compass above him. The course was south by west, entirely steady, not even a quarter point off. Dobbs, he knew, had the watch. The northeast breeze came pleasantly cool through the stern lights at this hour, though Pitt was now only ten degrees north of the equator. The door to the day cabin had been hooked open to increase the circulation of air, and he sleepily resolved again to have the carpenter cut a vent for a windsail over his bed for more comfort. A shaded dim night light was mounted on the bulkhead in the day cabin beside the door to the passageway, to light the way of the messenger should he come. There was an audible thump on the deck below him, followed by something that could have been an inarticulate cry muffled by three inches of teak planking. Whaley? 
He occupied quarters immediately below the sleeping cabin. A nightmare? Merriweather's eyes flicked up to the tell-tale compass again. The ship was swinging slowly to starboard, almost two points and still moving. But he had not heard the usual squeal of the blocks as the tiller ropes strained through them. On this course, with the wind over Pitt's port quarter, the helmsman customarily carried a few degrees of starboard helm to balance her tendency to sag off before the wind. The wheel must be unattended. Merriweather was off the cot in an instant, and had started into the day cabin in his shirt when he heard faint sounds in the passageway beyond the cabin door. From time immemorial, in King's ships a marine sentry was posted outside the entrance to the captain's quarters, for this was a precaution the Bombay Marine had rarely found necessary in its ships. He saw the latch on the door lift, snatched a blunderbuss from the rack on the bulkhead and retreated into the darkness of the sleeping cabin to shelter behind the door jamb. The door to the passageway eased ajar. A head peered in. Then it was pushed fully open and three barefoot men carrying billy clubs came silently across the cabin towards him. Hold, said Merriweather, stepping through the door and drawing the hammer on the gun to fall cock with an audible click. Drop those clubs. The three men froze. Drop them, he insisted, swinging the muzzle from side to side. Only then did the clubs rattle onto the deck. Hands behind your heads. In the dim illumination furnished by the nightlight, he recognized them. Bats, Sublet, and Osborne. He realized suddenly how vulnerable he was. He had allowed these quick, agile men much too close and at this range the charge of shot in the gun would be a solid mass. At least two could reach him in a leap and kill him with their bare hands. Turn around and keep quiet! They hesitated for what seemed an eternity while Merriweather read their thoughts, and he moved the gaping belled snout of the blunderbust left, then right. They decided by common consent not to chance it, uncertain which of them might die and turned about. There were three oak stanchions along but separated from the inboard bulkhead, placed there last month to brace the deck beams when the long nine-pounder pivot gun was mounted as a stern chaser. It was worth the clutter and inconvenience in the cabin to have an accurate and effective gun there, Merriweather had decided. Now he had found a use for them. Each step forward slowly, and stand against those stanchions, he told the men. Once against them, he looked about for a line, an unlikely article of cabin furnishings, then saw the cord supporting the curtains over the stern lights. He picked up the penknife from his desk, eased sidewise and cut the cord loose. It was laid up out of linen thread, waxed smooth and hard, strong for its size. Now... Bats and sublet, turn around. Put your hands behind you on either side of the stanchions. Osborne, I want a slip knot about one wrist, then four turns around the other as tight as you can pull, and finished off with a square knot. A square knot, I say. No thief's knot. A thief knot superficially resembled a square knot but its bitter ends came out on the opposite sides of the loops, and it slid apart without holding a strain. A seaman suspecting that a shipmate might be rummaging his bag and helping himself to tobacco frequently tied such a knot. If he found a square knot on the sea bag when he returned, he knew it had been opened. Osborne carried out the order, yellow eyes glinting in the glow of the nightlight. Merriweather watched him closely. Now you do the same. He secured the wrists, working carefully with one hand until he was ready for the knot. He then tore a curtain into strips and gagged each man. There was only a moment to take stock of the situation. Any second, another mutineer might come into the cabin to see what was detaining the three men. Evidently, the off-watch officers have been surprised in their quarters and Dobbs overcome on deck. They must have control of the ship, he decided. 
she was back on course according to the tell-tale compass. Meriwether could not guess how many were involved, but there must be many more than these three. He had no chance to overcome them single-handed. Although he might kill some, the others would surely overwhelm him, and they undoubtedly were armed by now with at least the officer's personal weapons. His one salvation was to get Gunny and his marines on deck, seal all hands below and recapture the helm, then retake the ship a section at a time. The thought of Caroline and their unborn child crossed his mind. If the mutiny succeeded, he would die. If by some chance he survived but lost the ship, his career was ended in disgrace. His future surely depended upon the course of action he took in the next few moments. He slid home the inside bolt on the cabin door. It should delay entry. Any delay would be to the good. The marines were quartered forward on the main deck, but aft of the crew's quarters. He sought a route by which he could reach them without hindrance. He had prowled this ship, but there were areas yet he had not explored. He tried to visualize the compartments and passageways from the stern forward, from the keelson to the weather deck. There was no way below except from the passage outside his door and certainly the mutineers would have posted guards by now at every companion hatch or ladder. He forced himself to concentrate on the problem, oblivious of the hate-filled gaze of the three top men. He thought of Sang, irrelevantly wondering where he might be at this juncture, and saw in his mind's eye Sang bringing a laden tray up to the pantry through the scuttle from the cabin galley below. It was in the forward inboard corner of the pantry, a convenience installed by those Parsi shipwrights at Bombay in this frigate to ensure that the captain's meals would be piping hot, served without delay from the stove to the table. The cover came up easily. He laid down the blunderbuss as an encumbrance, put his legs into the narrow opening and lowered himself into darkness, smelling the odours of tea and spices, as he dropped the short distance to the deck. The galley gave him no more access to the forward part of the ship without risk of discovery than the passage above. But the lazarette filled with cabin stores and spirits was below it, and there was a hatch in the corner. He went through it gingerly into utter darkness, stumbling over casks and boxes and dunnage fumbling for the door. The bolt was inside, thank God. It moved stiffly but came free. There was a cask right in front of the door with only a narrow space over it to the deck beams. Merriweather slithered through and began to crawl forward. The casks contained fresh water with heavy donnage to hold them secure against any pitch or roll Pitt might make. Merriweather made detours, blindly feeling his way across the tops of the barrels hearing the scurry and squeal of an occasional rat, but pressing forward to leave the water and smell the beef casks. He must be almost to the forward waste hatch, where there was a ladder. Here, far below the water line, he could hear the surge and splash as the ship ploughed through the sea, a background to the continuous sighing creak of the vessel and its cargo. He came to the end of the tier of casks and dropped to the deck. The hatch was in place but not secured. He pushed it up, and with a Herculean effort slid it back a foot. The storeroom in which he emerged contained by the smell of it biscuit, flour, peas, spices, all dry stores. On the deck above were the Sepoy Marine Quarters. He tried the hatch, then found the manhole in it and emerged in the passage just aft of the Marine Quarters. Sheikh Gunny, the senior Jemadar of the detachment, had a private cubicle on the starboard side. He awoke instantly in full possession of his faculties. Gunny, I need you. We've a mutiny. All your men, don't bother to dress. The Marines came to life. There was barely a rustle and patter of bare feet on the deck, not a clink as bayonets were fixed. Gunny told off two parties. 
one to take control of the helm and weather decks, the other he led himself with Merriweather at his side, armed now with a cutlass and pistol from the marine armoury, but still wearing only his shirt. At the aft companionway to the wardroom and officers' quarters, a lantern shed yellow light to outline a figure lounging at the top of the ladder, a pistol dangling carelessly in his hand. Gunny stepped noiselessly forward and was at the top in a single bound. The man lay suddenly senseless on the deck. They found another guard in the wardroom who instantly threw down his pistol and surrendered when they appeared. Whaley was tied unconscious in a chair, a great knot on the side of his head. Larkin was conscious of bloody bruise on his jaw. McCamey, Hamlin, Buttram and Mefford were conscious and unmarked, while Sang squatted unharmed in a corner. And now on deck! There was a brief melee aft, and two pistol shots forward, wounding a marine. After the rounding up in the grey dawn, thirteen men, all petty officers from Pitt's old crew, were in irons. Some may have escaped, melted into the puzzled, unaffected hands locked below in ignorance of the event, but as to the prisoners in custody, there was no doubt as to guilt. Dobbs, the quartermaster, boatswain's mate and messenger of the watch were found trussed and gagged in the quarter-boat. A guard had been posted in the warrant officer's quarters, but they had not been aroused. A cooper's mate was the first to break. A fair young man with a button of a nose, trembling uncontrollably with tears running down his plump cheeks, the very antithesis of a mutineer. Yes, sir. I thought at first they was only lollygagging, talk, yamming, don't you know, about this king's ship what set their officers adrift, loaded her with lassies from an island and never been seen again. Bly and the Bounty Merriweather knew the story had been often enough repeated in the forecastles of the marine. It was bound to appeal to the young sailor who now stood in handcuffs, flanked by two masters at arms before his desk in the cabin with Whaley, head bandaged, Larkin, Dobbs, and Boson Caldwell seated on either side. How many more hands than you thirteen were in this? demanded Merriweather. Speak up, man. You know you stand in a mighty slippery place with the noose about your neck. I don't rightly know, sir. I never told anybody. Who recruited you? asked Whaley thickly. He yet appeared half stunned, suffering a mild concussion by Buttram's diagnosis. Osborne, I guess, sir. He said it was too much haze in last cruise and starting again this one. He was to be the captain and Batson sublet the mates. There was others, I heard, say they wouldn't come in, but they wouldn't peach or pike. Merriweather was sure there were others, but he tended to believe this contrite and terrified lad. All right, Plunkett. He decided to terminate the interview. You have to stand trial with the rest, but if your testimony is the same as it was here, I will intercede with the court of inquiry and ask mercy for you. Now lock him up separate from the rest. The masters at arms led the weeping Cooper's mate out. Bly, said Caldwell, he were first in Jupiter when I were coxswain of her gig in eighty-four. A hard and he were, and we all laughed fit to kill when the word came back he'd been set adrift. He laughed again at the recollection, then sobered suddenly to return to the business at hand. Very well, gentlemen. We were lucky, and came off without serious casualties. Merriweather felt the lassitude of reactions setting in, and while it was almost more than he could face, he felt compelled to address the crew. I have the authority to convene a court on board this ship, since we are on detached service, try and execute them, but I would have to certify that the ship would be endangered otherwise. I prefer to transport them to Bombay Castle for that purpose. And now, I want all hands on deck mustered by divisions. He despised himself for his squeamishness. Nearly any other captain in the Marine would have had the mutineers dancing on thin air below the yardarm by now, he told himself. 
He could read disapproval in Whaley's face as the meeting adjourned to the deck. It had been a well-planned and coordinated operation. The helm, deck watch party, wardroom and warrant officers all struck simultaneously, and only Whaley had been able to offer resistance. It was the blow and the muffled outcry that had warned Merriweather. He felt a little more warmth for the man, who was no poltroon, but could not bring himself to like him. Pitt crawled sluggishly up the latitudes, clawing her way against unfavourable winds past Portuguese Goa, finally to come in sight of Bombay. The wind here was dead foul, but Merriweather put the launch and two cutters with double-banked oars over the side to tow her in to an anchorage off Bombay Castle. It had been an unhappy and tedious voyage, men needlessly lost and injured, a determined effort made to take the ship, foiled mostly by luck. And yet the performance of the crew had improved, he told himself cynically, not because of his silver-tongued oratory the morning after the mutiny, but more likely in an effort to convince the officers that they had had no part in it. Merriweather combed his hair, adjusted his hat and belted on his sword to make the official call. The gig was waiting at the starboard gangway. Commodore Waldron was away in the frigate Bombay, accompanied by the sloops Prince of Wales and Mercury, he discovered, scouting to the south in preparation for the oft-postponed operation against Mauritius. Commodore Tollett was acting in the absence of the Commandant, visibly chafing at the inactivity his recent promotion to flag rank had imposed upon him. He took the report and replied to Merriweather's query. No, Merriweather, we have no report of the convoy from Calcutta. You were the first to arrive. I presume you had orders to proceed independently? I did, sir. I needed to shake down Pitt after we transferred Rapid's crew into her. And now I have thirteen prisoners to be handed over for trial by a court of inquiry. For what? Mutiny, sir. My report speaks of it. Well, I'm damned. Tell me about it. Merriweather felt a flush of embarrassment as he made a bald report of the events leading up to the night of the attempt, conscious of the fact that it was the first such incident in a marine ship in more than sixty years. So, after the three ringleaders were secured, I managed to get forward through the hold and alert gunny. There was no trouble after that, though I am sure some of the mutineers escaped and are still on board. This fellow Whaley, began Tollett. Oh, he did very well. In fact, it was his resistance and outcry that warned me. I didn't mean that. It was just that during the time I was with Walden in Pitt before Rapid joined us, it seemed that every day it was all hands to witness punishment. Of course, poor Bridges was sick during most of the commission, and Whaley had a heavy responsibility. But I never thought the cat served a very useful purpose, and certainly not every day. Tollett paused and looked out over the harbour, with Pitt swinging to her anchor in the foreground. You expect more trouble? No, sir. Morale seems to have improved, and liberty in Bombay should help. Very well. You might consider adopting the custom of the Royal Navy and post a marine sentry at your door for a time. I don't believe it is necessary. He would serve little purpose if a determined move was made, and it would complicate matters for Gunny. Very well. Deliver your mutineers to the prison marshal in the morning. But I'm afraid we must wait for the convoy to find enough officers for a court of inquiry. It is, after all, a capital offence. Tollett started to rise in dismissal, then checked himself and looked narrowly at Merriweather. This affair hasn't shaken you, robbed you of your confidence, has it? It was a disquieting question. The thought had not crossed Merriweather's mind, and for a moment he was not sure himself. But it would never do to admit the slightest doubt. Even a hesitation in denial could be fatal. 
He might be relieved as a commander and his career would be at a dead end. One of the listless officers growing old in the service, waiting out their pensions, puttering about at routine duties on some backwater station. Not at all, sir, he told Tollett sharply. I would not take Pitt to see if I had the slightest doubt. No offence, Percival, said Tollett, smiling as he rose. It's just that I've seen a loss of confidence cripple otherwise excellent officers. I shall see you tonight at the Governor's reception. Merriweather was quickly at a loose end. There were few old acquaintances to renew here at Bombay Castle just now, and these were soon visited. It was only early afternoon. Liberty for the starboard watch would have commenced, and he did not yet feel the compelling necessity to return to Pitt to see if all was well. He decided to go over to the bazaar in the town where he had bought Caroline's emerald ring the previous autumn, and at least try to find another gift for her. In his boredom, he even looked forward with unaccustomed anticipation to the social affair tonight. Customs varied considerably between the presidencies. The overpowering formality of Calcutta under George Barlow, and only slightly less of Penang, did not hold here at Bombay under Governor Jonathan Duncan's regime. He led his contingent of officers into the foyer of the governor's residence, and was quietly directed without announcement to the ballroom for dancing and an adjacent salon for refreshments. He soon encountered Tollett and his wife, made the introductions, and a young staff second lieutenant was told to acquaint the younger officers with their contemporaries, while Merriweather was drawn aside to be presented to His Excellency. Yes, Merriweather, it has been three years this month since last I saw you here. You were first in Sir John Shaw, sailing for Calcutta, and I have heard good things of you since. Merriweather was not surprised at the accuracy of the recollection. Duncan was famous in the company for his memory. This plain, solid man in late middle age, upright, incorruptible and just, a veteran of thirty-six years with the company and governor of Bombay these last thirteen. He was popular with the Marine. No matter how parsimonious the court of directors might be, Duncan could find the powder and victuals for its ships, and Cornwallis had relied implicitly upon his fiscal advice during his first administration. He felt a flush of satisfaction at being remembered so favourably. Thank you, Your Excellency. They moved on to the tables. Most of those in Tollett's party he had met at one time or another, two captains and three senior lieutenants with their wives. Mrs. Tollett, was a small Yorkshire woman who did her best to conceal a sense of insecurity. She had married a penniless young second lieutenant with no inkling that he would rise to Commodore in the Marine, and her social obligations had increased accordingly. Merriweather was greeted, introduced to two of the wives he had not previously met, and then to another woman apparently unattached. And Mrs. Hale, wife of Captain Hale. Hale, he knew, was in command of the frigate Bombay, now south in the Indian Ocean, flying Waldron's flag during the reconnaissance of Mauritius. Merriweather bowed and murmured in response, and then found himself seated beside her. But she was turned half away from him. Gin and lemon, he told the hovering servant, and tell him to bring one for me, said Mrs. Hale over her shoulder in an unexpectedly strong voice. Merriweather amended the order and tried to take another look at the woman. The last time he had seen Hale on a social occasion was some three years ago in this very room. His wife then had been fair, fat, and forty, but this woman, from what he could see of her, was of olive complexion, slender with black hair piled high on her head and no more than twenty-five. He could only assume that Hale's first wife had died and he had married this woman some twenty years his junior. She was perfectly aware of his appraisal, and her dark eyes snapped as she spoke over her shoulder again. Yes, I'm the second wife, married less than a year and half Portuguese to boot. 
Mrs. Hale said sharply. My father was in the Marine and married my mother right here at Bombay. I came back from England last year to see my cousins, and stayed to marry back into the Marine, worst luck. Merriweather was embarrassed. He had intended no offence. He looked about the table, but no one appeared to have noticed the woman's outburst except Mrs. Tollett across the table, who was looking at him with a curious expression of concern. His thoughts were interrupted by the approach of the Indian waiter, followed by his assistant bearing a tray with the two glasses of gin and a plate of quartered lemons. The waiter served them with a flourish, then withdrew with a salaam. Well, said Merriweather brightly to the woman's back, first today, cheers. He lifted his glass to Mrs. Hale, and she turned in her chair to respond with a perfunctory wave of the glass, then drank off the gin neat without lowering it from her lips. Order me another, she said now facing him. She was a beauty, he saw, white teeth, red lips, straight nose, and bold, challenging brown eyes. Her shoulders were bare, and her torso was encased in a skin-tight jade bodice which exposed the upper half of her breasts. No other woman present was dressed in such fashion. I suppose you're like the rest of these marine heroes, fearless at sea, but timorous as a mouse when the husband is a captain. Merriweather managed to mask his astonishment by signalling the hovering servant and giving him her order, then taking a sip of gin and a taste of lemon. He looked across the table to see the barely perceptible shake of her head from Mrs. Tollett, and realised that the music had commenced again. Commodore Tollett was off on some mission with the governor's party, and as the unattached male he conceived it to be his duty to lead the Commodore's lady out for a dance. He excused himself, rose hastily, and moved around the table to proffer his invitation to Mrs. Tollett. Safely in the ballroom, Mrs. Tollett shook her head at him again and said, A sad affair. Poor Captain Hale. Him with grown children and grandchildren. Fair cast a spell over him, she did bewitched the man into a panting, lovesick moon-calf, so that he married her two months after Emma died. They parted in the evolutions of the dance, but when they came back together, she continued as though there had been no interruption. The captain has only been gone two months, but the gossip is that she's betrayed him with three different men, none of them in the Marines, thank God. Her family has quite disowned her. They're old Portuguese merchants here in Bombay near two hundred years. And Captain Hale is a jealous man. If he learns of these affairs, he will call them out. You're a married man yourself, Captain. The question caught Merriweather by surprise. He certainly had entertained no notion of dalliance with the woman since she had been so obvious, and a drunken woman presented distasteful problems. But he realised in shame that the thought of Caroline had not crossed his mind during the episode. The music stopped, and they went back towards their table. Just before they reached the door, he saw Mrs. Hale again clinging possessively to the arm of a tall, handsome man in civilian dress. They went towards another table, well away from the Commodore's, both apparently convulsed with laughter the woman almost doubling over with mirth at every other step, and then pressing herself against the man as he whispered in her ear. A disgrace, breathed Mrs. Tollett. And that is Mr. Conroy, the company's agent to the court of the Mughal. He has a lovely wife and two children in Yorkshire. Shame. He's a long way from home, said Merriweather. He had intended the remark lightly. The circumstances of enforced bachelorhood out here for many of the company's servants were so common as to occasion little concern. Some of the bluest blood of England ran in the veins of half-castes around the older establishment, though they were recognised only as Indians by the British. He saw the couple reach their table, servants pulling back their chairs for them when by apparent common consent 
the pair embraced in a passionate public kiss. There was a titter of laughter from the tables nearby as they disengaged and took their seats. Such a display by a half-English, half-Portuguese wife of a senior marine officer was, Merriweather realized, a bit more than even Bombay society was willing to accept, particularly at the governor's ball. Tollett rose as they rejoined the group. Mrs. Tollett soon acquainted the Commodore with the scandal. He raised his eyebrows in half-humorous resignation and departed to find the second secretary who was managing the affair. Twenty minutes later, Merriweather saw Mrs. Hale, still escorted by a red-faced, angry Conroy, hurry past the doorway, her chin in the air but her gait unsteady. Evidently, the pair had been invited to leave the entertainment. It was two hours after midnight when the affair broke up. A long line of carriages plodded under the port cochere to load their passengers. Merriweather had no transportation. He could find none of his officers, and decided the walk to the landing would do him good after the gin and rich provender. Here at the end of February there was a bit of a tingle in the air at this hour. The streets were well lighted, and many of the night watch were about since so many distinguished personages were aboard. Only a short distance from the main gate to the naval establishment was a public house, operated by a former purser in the company's maritime service. It did a thriving business and had three large public rooms, one restricted to officers, another to warrant officers, and the third for enlisted men. In addition, at the back, opening off the side street were several private rooms available for officers to rent for lodging, drinking, dining, or the discreet entertainment of a female friend. Merriweather had often enough patronized the establishment in former years, but he had no intention of stopping tonight, though by its lights and the sound of voices the evening was by no means over. He passed by, glancing over the half-door into the enlisted men's bar to see the clouds of tobacco smoke hanging over the happy faces of the patrons and catch a whiff of the aromatic spirits. He had almost reached the corner where the narrow lane intersected the broader street when he heard running footsteps, a wordless shout, and the sound of a blow on flesh. A brawl, he surmised, as he cleared the corner of the building, prepared to dodge sidewise if necessary. Within the entrance to the lane a curious tableau met his eye. There were two struggling figures illuminated by the glow of a lantern mounted on the wall. A woman's shapely back was presented to him, naked from the waist up, bare arms flailing the air, striking at a barefooted man clad only in a shirt. The ripped ruin of a jade green bodice dangled below her waist, and Merriweather recognized the pair. Here now, he commenced, just as Conroy managed to capture both of the woman's wrists, transfer them to the grip of his left hand, and strike her a heavy blow across the side of the face. Merriweather was aware that several persons had emerged from the public house behind him, attracted by the shout. Evidently the blow had stunned the woman, for she commenced to slump, and Conroy caught her about the waist with the evident intention of carrying her back through a door that stood ajar a dozen paces down the alley. It was a private matter. He was certainly under no obligation to the woman. He had no desire to make a powerful enemy in the company hierarchy. But the blow had been brutal. Once back in the room, worse might follow. The little group from the bar stood aside, as sightseers only. Merriweather decided that he must intervene. Loose her, he said urgently. Conroy's furious red face looked over his shoulder. Keep out, he shouted. Come on, you slut! Walk! It was only two steps. Merriweather caught the man by the shoulder and spun him around, alert for the blow, stepping inside Conroy's vicious swing with the instinct cultivated during the years in the lower deck, then driving a left and right to the belly. The woman had fallen to her hands and knees beside them and scuffled out of the way. 
The man was fit, a half-head taller. Sober, he might well have taken Merriweather's measure. But the two trip-hammer blows to the midriff brought his hands and head down, and the third blow was flush on the jaw. Conroy collapsed on his face in the alley. Good on you, said a voice behind him. The woman was on her feet now, bracing herself against the wall, fumbling at the tatters of her bodice dangling about her hips. Merriweather looked around to see Harry Putnam, the proprietor of the grog shop, standing in the group. Can you get a carriage? he inquired. The Cockney Putnam had been a sharp-faced little fellow when he first opened the establishment, but years of sampling his own wares had made him almost portly now. Half a mo, Captain. He spoke to a man in a white apron who turned and went down the street. I'll lend you my chonga, all itched and ready. Merriweather unbuttoned his coat and draped it about the woman's shoulders, shutting off from view her rather splendid display. Come, can you walk? Conroy groaned and moved on the cobblestones, his hands flailing out to either side as the barman led the horse up. Merriweather handed her into the seat and took the reins. Where away, madam? He had to repeat the question three times before it penetrated. Back the other way, past five, no, six streets, and then left. The words were slurred. Her jaw and eye were already puffed, and she swayed in the seat. There was no conversation on the way. The combination of spirits and the blow had left her groggy. She roused up as they turned off the main street and indicated a substantial, well-lighted bungalow with a drive leading to the door. Merriweather handed Mrs. Hale down, and she pulled the bell knob. After a moment... A sleepy Indian maid opened the door and gazed in astonishment at the spectacle of her mistress attired in a blue uniform coat and bearing all the evidences of violence. Mrs. Hale stepped through the door with dignity. Evidently her faculties had revived in the cool morning air. Get me a robe, she told the maid and turned back to Merriweather. I owe you a reward, Captain. And ordinarily I'd pay it now, but you wouldn't care to bet a woman in my condition. For a moment, Merriweather did not grasp the import of her words. Then the meaning penetrated, and he stepped back in confusion. Why, never mind, Captain. Merriweather, I'll put it to your account. And now I've made a complete fool of myself this night and deserve to be destroyed, as I surely shall. Tears were running down the swollen cheeks. Her left eye was almost closed. That Conroy! He seemed decent enough at the outset, and I'd have betrayed old Hale easily enough, but the man is a beast. His pleasure comes from inflicting pain. The maid reappeared with a robe. Mrs. Hale slipped out of the uniform jacket, handed it to Merriweather, and shrugged into the waiting robe. Good night, Captain, she said firmly, placing her hand on the knob of the door. He stepped back and the door closed. It was ten minutes back to Putnam's where he found the proprietor waiting in the doorway, the lamps now extinguished. I'm really much obliged, Harry. Merriweather told the little cockney. There was no sign of Conroy. We sloshed a bucket of water on him and he went back to his room to sleep it off. I blame myself for letting the pair have the room, seeing as how tipsy they was. Putnam shook his head. I hope he don't make trouble for me, nor for you, Captain. Merriweather reached the ship as dawn appeared over the hills to eastward, too tired to speculate on the night's events. The saluting gun in the battery on the mole at Bombay Castle spat out its single sullen report at ten o'clock, six days later, to signal the convening of the Court of Inquiry to try the mutineers. While the reverberations were still echoing across the harbour, 
the Master at Arms and his mates marched in a doleful crew, chains clinking between their leg irons as the warder and prison governor held the doors open. The procession moved in a shuffle. The chains limited each man's step to no more than a foot. This was the same chamber where Merriweather had stood his trial a year and a half ago, but now he was seated with the officers and witnesses from Pitt in two rows of chairs behind the recorder's table, occupied by Lieutenant Mayfield. The master-at-arms pushed the men into two rows of five each before the court, where they would stand thus during the course of the trial. Of the thirteen mutineers, Plunkett was separated as a prosecution witness, and two hands had died of jail fever during this past week. The convoy had arrived two days ago, and the superintendent of the Marine immediately ordered the court of inquiry. Its composition was anomalous. Five senior first lieutenants from the Bombay Marine were the post captain and commander of the Royal Navy completing the seven-member court. Such a combination was not without precedent, Tollett told him. When it had occurred in the past, it was because of a lack of disinterested marine officers available to serve, and this was once again the case. Merriweather stood with the rest as the master at arms intoned the call to order. Captain Fontaine and Commander Bevan, Royal Navy, as senior officers on the court, briskly took charge. Merriweather had met them formally less than an hour ago, and they appeared to be decent men, not particularly enthralled with their assignment to this duty. They were out of a frigate and sloop in the harbour, not part of the expedition to Ras ul Khaimah. I have here orders from Sir James Campbell, Superintendent of the Honourable Company's Naval Service, to Commodore Evan Tollett, acting in the absence of Commodore Sir John Waldron as Commandant of the Marine, to convene a court of inquiry to try diverse seamen and persons accused in specifications of charges appended thereto, of certain offences against the Company and its Naval Service, to wit, a mutinous assemblage, and overt acts of violence against the lawfully constituted commander and officers in HCS Pitt on or about February the 22nd, 1808, while that ship was at sea in the Bay of Bengal. I read the orders. He paused, looked left and right, and then proceeded to do so. I might say in explanation of Commander Bevan and myself serving as members of this court, that we were designated so to serve in orders from Sir Andrew Boyd, Rear Admiral of the Blue, commanding His Majesty's naval forces in the Arabian Sea, upon the request of Commodore Tollett, owing to the unavailability of disinterested officers of the Marine of the rank of Captain. I read those orders. He read them then looked at the double rank of prisoners. Is there any objection or challenge of the convening authority, or of any member of this court? Yes, may it please the court. The plump young second lieutenant Farris was his name, stood erect, his earnest face gleaming with sweat. Tollett had designated him with another young officer, Renfro, to defend the men. I submit, sirs, that the superintendent of the Marine lacks authority to delegate the appointment of any members of this court to Admiral Boyd, an officer not under his command. He paused, and then added hurriedly, Nothing personal, of course. Of course not, Mr. Uh... Fontaine looked down at his documents. Ferris. Mr. Recorder, do you desire to respond to the objection? Mayfield, tall and stout, with a sardonic, weathered face, stood up. Yes, may it please the court. The identical composition of this court was convened in 1804 to try Lieutenant Ambrose of the Marine. The same objection was made, denied, and the conviction was confirmed by the Governor-General in Council. It was then affirmed in an appeal to the Court of Directors. He paused portentously and picked up a paper. I have here an exemplified copy of that decision, which contains references to two other similar instances, 
one in ninety-eight, and the other in eighty-two. I submit, sirs, that the objection is without merit. He sat down. Fontaine looked right and left along the table, receiving a series of nods. The objection and challenge to the convening authority and this court is denied, he said briskly. Swear the court, Mr. Recorder. This was done. I now shall read the specifications of charges. He proceeded to do so, reeling off the list of names. As to Williams and Sexton, I declare these charges abated by death since the event. And now, Mr. Ferris, how plead the accused? Not guilty, may it please the court. There was a movement in the two ranks of prisoners and the clink of chains. So say you all, demanded Fontaine. Out with it. Let each man answer for himself. There was a series of mumbled responses down the ranks, with Fontaine watching sharply to make sure each man had entered his plea. He then turned to Plunkett, the cooper's mate, who stood alone behind the recorder. And you? Guilty, sir. Plunkett was pale but otherwise composed. Merriweather felt a flash of sympathy for the young man so desperately afraid for his life that he was willing to save it by the expedient of testifying against his shipmates. He had spoken in guarded tones to Mayfield yesterday of the willingness of Plunkett to give evidence of the conspiracy for the prosecution, and received an equally guarded assurance that the recorder would recommend mercy in exchange. Call your first witness. Mayfield rose. I call Captain Merriweather. Will the court swear all the witnesses now? Merriweather took the chair set at right angles to the court and the ranks of prisoners opposite the recorder, so that all might see him and hear his testimony. There followed an interminable succession of questions to establish ownership of Pitt, his orders into her as master and commander, introduction of the articles of enlistment entered into by her hands, including the accused, the orders to proceed independently to Bombay, exemplified copies of her log, finally arriving at the early morning hours of February the 22nd, Alt. And now, Captain, will you detail to the court the events which took place to your knowledge during the middle watch that date? Merriweather made a bald recitation of fact, commencing with his awakening. The sounds had alerted him that something was amiss, the veer-off course betrayed by the tell-tale compass to the final round-up of the mutineers. Now, Captain, do you identify any persons now present before this court as participating in this mutiny? I do. Bats, Sublet, and Osborne are the men who entered my cabin armed with billy clubs. He pointed them out at the urging of Mayfield, seeing the yellow glare of Osborne's gaze. The others did not meet his eyes. Reed was the man armed with a pistol posted as a sentry at the head of the ladder in the passage to the wardroom. Moser and Sexton, since deceased, have mounted guard over the officers in the wardroom. Turner was found armed in the warrant officer's quarters. The Marines took the others on deck outside my presence, and I cannot identify them on personal observation. A number of questions followed. Then the recorder turned him over to Lieutenant Farris for cross-examination. The plump young officer approached his task with earnest enthusiasm, evidently beginning to enjoy his role in the trial. Hamlin had reported that Farris had been articled as a solicitor in Manchester before he joined the Marines, and he put his questions in surprisingly professional tone. Now, Captain... You do not know the purpose with which these three men, Bats, Sublet, and Osborne, entered your cabin, do you? Why, certainly, said Merriweather. I thought it obvious from my previous testimony. But, Captain, isn't their action as consistent with the fact that they were coming to warn you and assist in suppressing the mutiny as with their participation in it? Merriweather was astounded at this sophistry and looked narrowly at the young man, who flushed, but stood his ground. Certainly not, 
They were armed with billy clubs and almost in my sleeping cabin before I confronted them. They offered no such explanation. You have testified that you commanded them to keep quiet under threat of a blunderbuss, and then you gagged them. Meriwether stole a glance at the court and found all eyes fixed on him. With an effort, he contained his indignation at this pettifogging line of questioning and forced himself to make a reasoned reply. Why, sir, I thought I made it plain. I had already heard the sounds of Mr. Whaley being taken. The ship had veered far off course while the wheel was unattended, and then these armed men entered my cabin. Besides, I've heard Osborne was to be captain and— Objection! interposed Farris. Hearsay! Quite, said Captain Fontaine. Let that part of the captain's answer be stricken. And so it went. The forced admissions that he had not seen six of the defendants do any act in furtherance of the mutiny, and that he knew of no reason why responsible petty officers such as Bats, Sublet, and Osborne should participate. Merriweather finally escaped, resentfully conscious that the young man had made him look a proper fool in many respects taking advantage of every loophole in his testimony, making evidence that had appeared incontrovertible seem ambiguous. But Mayfield soon demonstrated that he had other strings to his bow as he spun a tightening noose about the necks of these unhappy seamen. The trial ground on, a plodding succession of witnesses, each describing in his own small segment in the affair, ultimately to weave the whole web of evidence until the court adjourned at a half after four. It appeared there would be three more witnesses for the prosecution, including Plunkett, before the defendants undertook their defence. Merriweather invited Dobbs and Buttram to go over to Harry Putnam's public house after the adjournment for a drink in the officers' bar. Whaley, Larkin, Hamlin and Dr. Mefford went back to the ship. For Merriweather still felt some unease for her safety, though she was anchored under the guns of the battery. The dispatch brig had come in this morning from the Red Sea, bringing the overland mail, and the latest London papers were posted inside the door. Merriweather felt a glow of satisfaction as he read that Bonaparte had invaded Spain last January. The mission to Persia must indeed have diverted the Corsican and his million soldiers from following Alexander's route to India. Merriweather and his party found an unoccupied table under a punkah and placed their orders. Ah, Captain, I hope you will forgive me, said a voice behind him. Merriweather craned his neck to see young Farris, a glass in hand, at the bar. You understand, sir? I'm only representing my clients. Quite all right, said Merriweather stiffly. The cross-examination of the morning still rankled, but there was no reason to be rude. Come join us, Mr. Farris. It proved to be an interesting hour of conversation. Merriweather had consulted a solicitor only once in his life, last summer when he made his will, and the ways of all lawyers were mysterious. And how— demanded Buttram, did the solicitor find his way into the Bombay Marine? Farris laughed. I came into my chambers one morning and saw all those tin boxes stacked along the wall, each filled with deeds, wills, demises and contracts, all as dry as dust, but I decided I needed a breath of air. My grandfather is a proprietor in the company, so I had a bit of interest going for me to gain an appointment in the Marine. He laughed easily, and Merriweather found his resentment melting. But you know, I think I have changed my mind again. I may lose these men to the hangman, but not for lack of a fair defence. And the experience has been most exhilarating. I have concluded that I first chose the wrong branch of the law so I shall go back to Lincoln's Inn to read more law and seek a call to the bar as a barrister. By the time he reached Pitt, Merriweather was already hazy as to the mysterious distinction made between barristers who pleaded cases and the solicitors who employed and briefed them. 
but he concluded that not all lawyers were bad. There was a stack of official mail on the desk in the cabin. Merriweather paid it little attention. Time enough for that once he had dined. Then he noticed another letter without the heavy red seals of the marine. It was a single paragraph in a neat feminine hand. My dear Captain Merriweather, a note of gratitude for your gallantry last week. Merriweather looked hastily for the signature. Creosa Hale. Who? He turned back to the commencement. In rescuing me from my folly, my life in Bombay is finished and I take ship later in the day for Macau where my mother's sister is the wife of the commandant of Portuguese forces. I shall not forget my debt to you. Of course, it was the woman he had conveyed to her home from outside the public house. He started to throw the note away, then slid it into the portfolio and the desk drawer where he kept his personal documents and promptly forgot the matter. The Court of Inquiry concluded the trial before noon the next day. Plunkett, Cooper's mate, was the last witness called by the prosecution, and his testimony put the finishing touches on the nooses already spun about the necks of the mutineers. Farris rose to cross-examine. Now, Plunkett, what have you been promised? Objection, imposed Mayfield. I don't know what the question is yet said Captain Fontaine pleasantly. Let him complete it. What have you been promised for your evidence against these men? Objection! I have promised him nothing, and neither is this court, said Mayfield. Let him answer, ruled the presiding officer. I haven't been promised anything, quavered the young man. After I told the master at arms I wanted to confess, and did, Captain Merriweather said he'd speak a good word for me. Aha, said Farris, leaning forward to fix the trembling man with a glittering eye. And you call that nothing? What will he say for these other men? Dunno, sir. Well, I know. He'll say let justice take its course. Objection, said Mayfield again. The evidence shows this witness has been promised nothing, and that his confession came voluntarily out of conscience before ever he saw Captain Merriweather. Yes, the court has the matter well in mind. Let us get on with the case, Mr. Farris. The remainder of the trial went quickly. Five men took the stand to swear fervently that they had had no part in the mutiny but Mayfield demolished each defence with his artful cross-examination. Bats Osborne and Sublet did not testify. Apparently they had given up all hope. They stood sullenly staring at the floor. Let the record show that these defendants stand mute, said Captain Fontaine. Now, do you gentlemen desire to sum up for the benefit of the court? I don't believe it necessary replied Mayfield. I do, may it please the court, said Farris. In that case I shall make a short summation. Mayfield spoke for six minutes, driving his points home like nails in a coffin, then relinquished the floor to Farris. May it please the court, I submit that this case rests upon the testimony of a co-conspirator without corroboration. The conduct of Bats, Osborne, and Sublet is as consistent with their innocence as with their guilt. A reasonable doubt exists as to each and every of their defendants. Farris made a damnably ingenious argument. Berryweather looked sharply at the members of the court, but could read no reaction on their impassive faces. Clear the court, master at arms, said Fontaine at the conclusion of Farris's argument and Merriweather found himself in the hallway where he had awaited a verdict himself the year before last. He felt a curious anxiety. Farris had adroitly put him on trial with the mutineers, but he was relieved when the master-at-arms appeared to march the prisoners back in. The court had reached its verdict. This court will reconvene, 
said Captain Fontaine briskly. Let the prisoners step forward. They did so, manacled hands clenched before them, and Fontaine delivered the judgment of the court. This court finds the specifications of charges proved, and the following prisoners to be guilty of mutiny. Bats, Osborne, Sublet. He read through the list, all ten of the surviving mutineers. Merriweather looked at the group. Bats and Sublet were as white as the others, but Osborne simply stared at the court, a derisive smirk on his face, eyes glittering. Merriweather wondered for a moment if he could have presented so bold a front under such circumstances. And now, before this court passes sentence, has counsel for the prisoners anything to say by way of mitigation on their behalf? Farris was a bit white himself, and his voice had a tremor in it as he spoke. I call to the attention of the court that the evidence against these men is not as strong as it might be and request that this fact to be considered in passing sentence. Very well. Now, as to Plunkett, who entered a plea of guilty, does any person desire to say anything in his behalf before this court passes sentence? Mayfield stood up, Plunkett's stricken gaze fixed upon him. In view of his repentance and honest confession, I would not object to tempering justice with mercy, sirs. I call on Captain Merriweather for his recommendation. Merriweather stood up self-consciously, feeling not only the imploring eyes of Plunkett fixed on him, but the ironic smile that Farris wore. I, too, have no objection to a reduced sentence for this man. Very well. Clear the court. It was only a few minutes before the court reconvened. This court has considered the evidence and law in this case. It is our unanimous judgment that in the cases of Bats, Osborne, Sublet, he read down the list and continued, having been convicted of the most infamous crime of mutiny on the high seas, that they and each of them suffer death by hanging at a time and place to be fixed by the superintendent of the marine. He paused but only a dry sob from one of the prisoners broke the silence. As to the prisoner Plunkett, in view of the recommendations of the recorder and Captain Merriweather, we fix his punishment at ten years at hard labour, and to be transported for execution of the sentence to the custody of the prison governor in Australia. Relief flooded over Plunkett's face. He could serve his time, and if he lived, be free by the time he was thirty. The findings and sentences of this court will be delivered to the Commandant of the Marine to be by him transmitted to the Superintendent for his review, confirmation, commutation, or reversal. This court is now adjourned without day. Remove the prisoners, Mr. Marshal. It was five days before a counterpart of the superintendent's letter to the Commandant of the Marine came to Merriweather. To the Commandant of the Marine, the undersigned has reviewed the findings made and sentences imposed by a court of inquiry convened to try diverse seamen listed on the attachment hereto for the crime of mutiny on the high seas in HCS Pitt, Captain Percival Merriweather commanding. This authority is of the opinion that these findings and sentences are fully justified in the cases of Bats, Osborne, Sublet, and Plunkett, and they accordingly are in all respects confirmed. As to the other seven prisoners, this authority is of the opinion that the ends of justice will be satisfied by a commutation of sentence. Accordingly, the sentences imposed upon these seven men are now modified, and said prisoners are now sentenced to twenty years each at hard labour to be performed under the directive of the prisoner Governor of Bombay. The sentences of Bats, Osborne, and Sublets will be carried into execution seven days hence in the ship from which they came at eight ante meridian. All ships present shall furnish as large a party of seamen as their boats will accommodate to witness punishment. Given under my hand and seal this 30th day of March, 1808.
Sir James Campbell, Bart, Superintendent. Consternation seized Merriweather. The thought had never crossed his mind that the men would be delivered back to Pitt for execution. At the beginning of his career in the Marine as a boatswain's mate, he had been told off to serve in the hanging of a murderer, but the man had died of fever before the sentence could be carried out. He wondered at his squeamishness. He had killed other men in his time, albeit not in cold blood, but the thought of a party of seamen walking away at his command, with the bitter end of a rope rove through a block at the yardarm to hang a man by the neck until he kicked his life away, made his flesh crawl. Damnation! Why could the job not be done on the gallows at the prison by the governor and warder? Of course, he knew, these executions were designed to have the maximum effect on all hands in the expedition. That was the reason for the order to send witnesses to the punishment. Merriweather checked his morbid thoughts. He had no reason to fret himself into a blue funk. The die was cast, and he must carry through the process of justice, unpleasant though the prospect might be. Messenger! The lad appeared at the door. My compliments to Mr. Whaley and Boson Caldwell, and will you ask them to see me at their convenience? It was only a few minutes before they knocked and entered. Merriweather read the superintendent's order to them, seeing Whaley's expression harden at the commutation of sentences for eight mutineers. It appears that we must carry out the executions in this ship. Do either of you have any experience in this sort of thing? Whaley shook his head. I've witnessed several hangings, but never had the duty of turning off a man myself, he said in a tone of regret. Simple enough, I would think. I've served an hangman's party back when I was in the Royal Navy, but the Master at Arms always handled the details himself. I do know how to tie the knot. Merriweather knew that himself. It was a macabre accomplishment that every striker in the seaman branch learned early in his career. I don't want a botch job, Merriweather told them. None of this strangling for a quarter of an hour. And by the same token, no jerking the man's head off his shoulders. I suggest you consult with the prison warder and the boatswains in other ships present for the details. The order had left a bad taste in his mouth, and he went ashore early to the public house to get the matter off his mind. The day of execution dawned bright and clear, the sort of day to inspire a man to live. Merriweather awoke at the first light and called Sang for tea, then coffee when the tea fell to take hold, but took no solid food. The dreadful event was less than three hours away, and object depression possessed him. While he waited for the coffee to cool, he went through the packets of papers that imposed the duty upon him. The judgment and sentence of the Court of Inquiry, signed and sealed, the confirmation of the sentences by the Superintendent of the Marine, and the death warrants, signed, attested, and countersigned. All appeared to be regular. He sighed and drank the coffee. Boatswain Caldwell, the chief master at arms, and the senior boatswain's mates comprising the hanging party, had concluded only yesterday an intensive short course of instruction in how to hang a man efficiently, taught by the boatswain in HMS Chiffon. Merriweather hoped there would be no bungling to embarrass him. Pitt had been warped in close to the Mole, where the military and naval forces in the garrison of Bombay Castle would be formed up to witness the executions. Other ships present had shifted their anchorages so as to give all hands a clear view of the proceedings. The other witnesses would be transported in boats to lie off Pitt. It was as though the event were a circus a public entertainment designed for the amusement and edification of a vast audience. Of course, the purpose was clear. 
the certainty of swift vengeance for mutiny must be brought home to all. A knock came on the door, and Whaley entered. All is in readiness, sir, he said with an air of satisfaction. The scaffold is rigged, the noose is tied, and an extra platoon of sepoy marines from the castle is aboard. The chaplain from HMS Caroline is with the prisoners. Six bells sounded. The grisly event was only an hour away. Very well, Mr. Whaley. It was time to shift into full dress with sword, Merriweather decided. But he sat at the desk in a reverie until he heard seven bells. The entire ship's company was formed up by divisions in the waist. The sepoy marines had formed a hollow square facing outward on the forecastle, bayonets fixed. Merriweather had Purser Davis now acting in his capacity as ship's clerk to his left, made his way forward through the ranks as eight bells began to sound. Pitt was half encircled with boats, each crammed with silent men. On the mole there were solid ranks of scarlet coats standing at attention, and at one end a considerable assemblage of sightseers, civilians, dockyard clerks and artisans with a small contingent of Indians behind them. As the sound of the last stroke of the bell faded, Merriweather could hear the solid clump of his heels striking the deck in the dead silence as he and Davis marched to the forecastle the marine ranks parting to allow them passage, then closing behind. As he reached the foremost, Whaley stepped forward. Attention on deck! The marines presented arms, and there was a ruffle of drums as the officers and petty officers saluted. Carry on. The mutineers were ranged in a row, facing him just abaft the foremast, hands manacled behind them, Leg irons locked on. Bats and Sublet were pale but composed, eyes downcast, but Osborne's feral yellow gaze bored defiantly into his, almost with an expression of mockery. I have here orders from Sir James Campbell, Superintendent of the Marine, by way of the Commandant. He read the confirmation of the sentences. The ship's clerk will read the death warrants. Davis did so in a high-pitched voice, one after another, identical but for the names. Have these men made their peace with God? Yes, Captain, said Whaley. The chaplain has been with them for nearly two hours. Merriweather took a deep breath. Carry out your orders, Mr. Caldwell, he told the boatswain. Two boatswain's mates took each man by the arms and propelled the three prisoners towards the curious structure the carpenter had rigged last night. It was made of long planks battened together a yard wide, three quarters of its length protruding beyond the bulwarks over the water. The inboard end lashed to a heavy ring bolt in the deck by hemp line. Three stanchions supported a rope along its forward edge to which the nooses at the ends of lines rove through blocks on the fore main yard arm were secured with loops of small stuff. It was the design of Benton, boatswain in HMS Chiffon, who claimed to have been in the hanging party at Sheerness after the Norm mutiny ten years ago. Its operation was simple enough. At the signal, the line securing the inboard end of the scaffold would be cut with a hatchet, and the planks would simply fall out from under the prisoners, leaving them suspended in the nooses after a drop calculated to break their necks. They would then be hoisted above the bulwarks and left hanging from the yardarm on display to the fleet for one hour. Merriweather had approved the method proposed. It had appeared entirely humane as compared to the common practice of having a party simply walk away with the bitter end of the rope leaving the man suspended to die in the slow agonies of strangulation. Hoist the yellow flag, said Merriweather, as the party mounted the inboard end of the scaffold. Stand by the gun! The flag indicated the executions were in progress. The gun would signal the instant the mutineers were actually turned off. 
he looked past the party now shuffling along the platform to glimpse the half-circle of boats off the starboard side holding a sea of upturned faces. Bats reached the outboard end of the platform, and one of the boatswain's mates released the noose while the other pulled a black hood down over his head. Sublet followed to stop in front of the second noose. Osborne moved out, taking the twelve-inch steps dictated by the chains between the leg irons, and one of the boatswain's mates let go his arm to unfasten the twine securing the noose, while the other reached for the black hood tucked into his belt. Osborne's knees bent suddenly, dislodging the one-handed grip of the boatswain's mate, then straightened, propelling his body backward in a lazy arc, to enter the water cleanly head first. Merriweather's mouth opened in astonishment. He rushed to the bulwarks. A mass of bubbles was breaking the surface of the water in the centre of a widening circle of ripples. Osborne had cheated the hangman, but he wondered a moment if it were much easier to die of drowning, pinned to the bottom in the mud by the weight of leg irons and handcuffs, than of a broken neck. The thought passed through his mind that he would be the laughing stock of the fleet, but there was no help for it, and he must get on with the grisly task, delaying only long enough to make sure Osborne did not surface in spite of the irons. The ripples had spread and vanished. There were no more bubbles, and he looked up to see the nooses in place, the bulky spiral knots positioned behind the left ears of bats and sublet. Merriweather signalled the boatswain's mates in to the deck and caught the eye of the gunner. Fire, he told him in a low tone. The blank charge in the forward port carronade belched out a hollow report. The hatchet blade flashed down, severing the line, securing the inboard end of the scaffold, and both men were left dangling, their necks twisted sidewise at acute angles, their bodies twitching in brief involuntary spasms. At least this part of the affair had gone as planned. Well, said Tollett an hour later, he's just as dead as though he had been hanged, but the object lesson has failed, at least as to him. Osborne will be a hero in the lower deck for years to come, for having cheated the hangman in the full view of a thousand witnesses. I know, said Merriweather miserably. But the thing appeared to be so much better than the usual method. Spilt milk, said Tollett briskly. Forget it, and let's get on with the expedition. The only thing holding up the sortie has been this affair. Can you sail on the morning tide? Merriweather racked his brain. The water casks could be topped off this afternoon. There might be other small items. But he was sure Davis could manage them by morning. In any event, it would be a relief to be underway after all the vexatious delays. Yes, sir. Very good. The sailing orders will be delivered during the day. Now! Will you join Commodore Dunbar, Colonel Smith, and Captain Seaton with me for lunch? I haven't had the opportunity yet of talking to all of you together. It was a pleasant affair in the flag officer's room of the Bombay Club. Tollett, an abstemious man, served only Madeira, and Seaton did not lose his self-control, as he had with the gin at Calcutta. Tollett came to the point quickly. I am informed that your expedition is in all respects ready for sea, he said to Dunbar. The Sepoy Marines and Bombay Regiment will be embarked this afternoon, and the siege guns are already aboard ship. Yes, replied Dunbar with his hot glance, but two of the four forty-two pounders are in Vesuvius, an old bomb catch that requires eight hours pumping a day, and the other two in a store ship that sails better sideways than ahead. I have doubts that either will reach the gulf in time to be of any use. We have to make do with what we have, said Tollett, reddening. What with this operation and our other commitments, the marine is stretched perilously thin. The meeting broke up after a few more remarks. Merriweather slept poorly again that night. No nightmares as he had experienced at Calcutta, but 
shadowy dreams that brought him awake with the conviction that he had overlooked some important detail. But he was unable to discover during his wakeful periods any omission. Only nerves, he decided. The reaction after that horrible morning added to the mounting tension in anticipation of the sortie. He finally dropped off to awaken in broad daylight with Sangs setting out the toast and pouring the tea in the day cabin. Osborne felt the sting against the top of his head as it struck the water and jackknifed his body as soon as it was fully submerged to sink with the weight of the shackles feet first to the mud bottom. His left hand was free of the handcuffs halfway down, and he took the bit of wire he had secreted in his cheek and bent over to get at the lock on the leg irons, remembering to release a quarter lungful of air as he did so. The lock yielded. He left the irons sticking in the mud and struck out with a powerful kick and breaststroke angling upwards under the shadow of Pitt to emerge cautiously on the port side midships. He had been under water a little more than a minute and surfaced just in time to hear the gun fire above him signalling that Batson's sublet had been turned off. No one on deck could see him here. The nearest vessel anchored on this side was more than a cable's length away, and he paused long enough to inhale and exhale deeply several times before he sank beneath the surface again to swim to the stern. He came up beside the rudder post, shielded from above by the overhang of the transom, then found foot and finger holds on the gudgeons and pintles by which the rudder was hung. Fools, he thought contemptuously while he regained his breath. To think he would tamely submit to kick his life away at the end of a rope. He had been reared as an acrobat and performed his underwater escape trick at half the fairs in England before the press gang snaffled him. It had been a stroke of luck when they rigged that scaffold over the side but he would have managed somehow to throw himself into the water no matter what. The bay was not uncomfortably cold, and he endured the day, ducking his head under when an occasional boat passed, even hearing snatches of conversation that mentioned his name. He would be famous. Osborne had little regret for the action that had brought him to this pass, though if he had to do it over, his tactics would be different. He thought with cold hatred of Whaley, the hazing and continuous pressure, the niggling rules and heavy-handed vengeance visited upon the unlucky during the last cruise, though he had personally escaped the cat and disrating. The new man, Merriweather, appeared to be a decent sort, but he had not had time to make his character felt in the lower deck when the attempt was made. News of the impending operation in the fiery furnace of the Persian Gulf and the brutal floggings in which a man lost an eye had precipitated the mutiny prematurely while the ship was still in the Bay of Bengal, though the tales of the uncharted islands to the eastward, peopled with beautiful women and food for the picking, had had its influence. Osborne regretted only his moment of indecision that night in the captain's cabin. If the three of them had jumped Merriweather, he might have killed one of us with his blunderbuss, but the survivors, and he was sure he would have been one, would have subdued him. By now, he might very well have already been king of his own island, with a harem of dark-eyed beauties to comfort him. When darkness fell before moonrise, Osborne swam underwater surfacing at intervals to catch lungfuls of air clear of the anchorage, then strongly on the surface westwardly towards a cluster of native huts on the mainland. There were fishing boats anchored in the shallows. He found a substantial one, pulled up the stone anchor and let it drift on the ebb towards the harbour entrance, where he hoisted the simple sail. By dawn he was twenty miles south, and there was no pursuit. Certainly not for a dead man. He found a mouldy loaf of native bread and some half-rotten fruit in the locker under the stern that staved off hunger, 
and two nights later sighted the lights of Goa. He swam to the beach a mile or so north of the harbour, waited for daylight, and strolled nonchalantly by the day watch. A Portuguese trader was short-handed. Osborne found a berth with no questions asked and sailed for Macau on the morning tide. At least the cruise was in the right direction. He had no intention of going back to India or England where there was a chance of recognition dead though he was accounted. Three months later, when the ship reached Macau, he had grown a moustache in the Dago fashion, let his curly hair grow out in ringlets, and learned enough Portuguese to get along. What with the blood of his gypsy grandmother, he could now pass without remark in this company. The constant attrition of disease and death out here made every colonial garrison short-handed. Osborne had no difficulty enlisting as a master gunner in the provincial forces on duty in the colony. He felt reasonably safe. Though there were agents of the company here, they served its maritime and trading interests, not its marine. He soon contracted a liaison with a half-caste Indonesian girl and adapted himself to a new way of life. Two days northwest of Bombay came a gale, fermented by the change of season from the northeast to the southwest monsoon. The convoy had held together reasonably well to this point, under a steady succession of imperative signals hoisted by Commodore Dunbar to chivy the stragglers back into formation. The blow, accompanied by four hours of blinding rain, forced the clumsy transports most of them in ballast awaiting the imam's troops at Muscat, to heave to under reefed storm sails. But they found themselves going to leeward more rapidly than the men of war, and in danger of colliding. Pitt was the leading vessel in the port column well clear of the unmanageable transports, and Merriweather felt little concern for the blow. In late afternoon, the first casualty occurred. The messenger burst into the cabin, leaving a visible trail of rainwater. Sir, Mr. Dobbs says Vesuvius is sunk. Merriweather ran up the ladder to the quarter-deck. Right there, sir, said Dobbs, pointing off the port quarter. She was there one minute, and then all I could see was her mast sliding into the water. In this sea, the huge weight of the siege guns must have taken the bottom right out of the old bomb catch. Starboard your helm! Merriweather shouted to the quartermaster, and Pitt played off. Coming to the starboard tack under storm jib staysails and double reefed spanker. The rain had slackened to a drizzle, and the wind had moderated, but the seas were mountainous as the ship ran down the last bearing Dobbs had for Vesuvius. There was a shout from forward as a dark object appeared on the crest of a wave a cable's length ahead. Heaving lines and grapnels, shouted Dobbs. If the ship passed the floating object, it would never be able to beat back to it, and launching a boat was unthinkable in these seas. Merriweather saw the object again, almost dead ahead on the crest of the next wave but one. Steady as you go! He thought he had seen two white faces beside what now appeared to be a bulk of timber, probably used as dunnage for the siege guns. The object was on the crest of the wave ahead as Pitt slid down the slope into the trough. There were two men clinging to it as it passed a starboard thirty feet off. Lines arched out, at least three criss-crossing the timber, and the men took hold, abandoning their support. Put your helm! The ship came about, rolling horrendously in the trough for a moment, but easing the strain on the lines. Somehow, the pair managed to hold on as they were dragged through the water, then up the side of the ship, where helping hands could pull them on deck. Doctors Mefford and Buttram ministered to the waterlogged, rope-burned young men. An hour later, Exuding a powerful odour of medicinal brands, they were in the cabin making their report, as Pitt, pitched and rolled, hove to again. Marlow, sir,' said the elder, apparently about sixteen. 
The other lad was even younger. Midshipman in Vesuvius, and this is Kate, apprentice. We were hove to, sir, riding fairly easy, I thought, when she put her bow under and it didn't come up. Were there any others got off that you saw? I saw three swimming, but they couldn't have lasted long. We were lucky. The timber floated off right beside us. It must have been a terrifying experience. Evidently, the rotten bottom had opened up under the tremendous concentrated weight of the forty-two-pounder guns, and the vessel had sunk like a stone, taking with her nearly fifty officers and men. Half the siege train was lost too, but Merriweather refused to speculate on the effect this might have on the success of the expedition. With his luck running the way it had these past three months, he might have to stand a court of inquiry himself for failing to rescue the entire crew and cargo of the bomb catch. There is only one midshipman aboard now, so there's no trouble to find you a berth. You will serve as junior watch officer with Lieutenant Dobbs, at least until we reach Muscat, he told Marlow. What were your duties on Vesuvius, Kate? Why, sir, I was learning the Cooper's trade. As senior officer present in the Marine Squadron, Merriweather had full authority to deal with casual ratings such as this survivor. Very well. Report to the Cooper. He has recently lost a mate. Both of you may see Mr. Davis the purser and draw such clothing and supplies as you require from the slop chest against your pay accounts. Merriweather sat a few minutes more at the desk. Darkness descended outside. The wind subsided to no more than a fresh breeze. Even the drizzle had ceased, but the seas were still rolling relentlessly under Pitt's keel, lifting first bow, then stern in their passage as she lay hove to once more. His thoughts turned back to Calcutta, only two months before Caroline's confinement, and he wondered what the child might be. Girl or boy, the odds were even though he realized he possessed a normal vanity in desiring to perpetuate his name. Unaccountably, his thoughts shifted to Osborne, wondering if the fish had picked his bones clean yet on the bottom of Bombay Harbor. Tomorrow would be a day to try his soul, he knew, the scattered convoy to be rounded up and herded again into formation. It behooved him to get a good night's rest, Merriweather heaved himself out of the chair and went on deck to deliver the night order book to McKamey. Five days later, the convoy made its landfall at Ras el Had, and course was changed to parallel the coast northwestwardly. The convoy was off Muscat by six bells in the morning watch next day. Merriweather spent the morning in fuming impatience on deck, pit hove to as one flag hoist after another blossomed on the flagship, giving the order of entry and place of anchorage in the cove. The first eighteen signals were addressed to the transports, and it was not until they were completed that the signal came to the cruisers to take anchorage in the open roadstead. It was safe enough in this season when the prevailing chamal blew out of the northwest. If the Kaos out of the southeast or the Nashi out of the northeast should come on to blow, the ships would have to put out to sea. It took most of the day to get the transports into the harbour and anchored. Then the signal came from the warships to proceed to anchor, closely followed by the imperative addressed to Pitt. Captain, come on board. Captain Napier, commanding HMS Caroline, met Merriweather at the gangway, and escorted him to the cabin. Dunbar, Colonel Smith, and Seaton were seated at the long table, and Merriweather took a chair opposite them. Well, said Dunbar in a hard accusing tone, his hot brown eyes flashing. Already we have troubles. Tell him, Seaton. Seaton's thin face was impassive, but his voice was shrill with surprised indignation. The Imam has failed me, Merriweather. He professes to have only eight hundred troops equipped for the expedition, instead of the four thousand he had promised. The officer spread his hands to indicate his helplessness. 
We had relied in our plans on the native forces to invest the town of Russell Kana from the land side and prevent escape or reinforcement. It may be best to postpone the expedition. Like hell, interposed Smith. My force is ready come what may, but I seem to get precious little assistance from my seafaring opposite numbers. Seaton's face was a pale mask of pure hatred, and Dunbar had turned almost purple. The colonel continued, at the outset, Seaton, I gave little enough credit to your bluster of the influence you possess with the imam. It only means I have to detach two companies to stiffen your native rabble and prevent them from running away at the first shot. Seaton started up from his chair, and Merriweather reached across the table to place a restraining hand on his elbow. A duel at this point could only wreck the operation. No, gentlemen said Dunbar belatedly. No need for personalities. It can't be helped. Evidently Colonel Smith had reached the same conclusion. He spoke now in a milder tone. Very well. I say take what we have and get on with the enterprise. He looked across at Merriweather. Of course you've also lost half the siege train. Merriweather understood instantly how Seaton had felt. Blood pounding in his ears at the unfairness of the accusation. He had had no more to do with the decision to employ the rotten bomb catch for the transport of the guns than Smith himself. He opened his mouth, but Dunbar was quicker this time. Gentlemen, said Dunbar, no more of these recriminations. There are enough other guns in the fleet to serve our purposes. Let us embark the troops that are ready and be on our way. Do you have a comment, Merriweather? I am in agreement. Oh, agreed, said Smith in a pleasant tone. I intended no personal affront to anyone present. I just hate to see a mare's nest made of well-laid plans and spoke from a full heart. Seaton and Merriweather declined the proffered refreshment and took their leave, while Smith remained behind in the cabin. On deck, Seaton was still trembling with fury, hectic spots now on his sallow cheeks. God damn him! God damn! Now control yourself, Seaton. He knows as well as you that the imam is at fault. Still the gratuitous accusations rankled. Merriweather came back on board Pitt, feeling limp and exhausted in the blazing heat. It would obviously be the morrow before the imam's forces could be embarked and the next day before the transports would sortie from the cove. He felt a sudden overpowering desire for a drink in congenial company to erase the memory of the recent unpleasantness, and dispatch sang with invitations for Larkin, Dobbs, Buttram, Hamlin and Marlowe to dine with him in the cabin. It was like the old days in Rapid. Among the friendly and familiar faces, only Marlowe's was still strange. But Merriweather desired a closer acquaintance with the boy he had snatched bodily from the sea. McCamey was a loner. He would never notice the snub. Whaley had indeed looked narrowly at him as he passed. But Merriweather could not bring himself to like the man, and gave it no thought. The festivities lasted well into the first watch, and Merriweather felt himself a little fuddled as he saw his guests out. It was black dark, but Merriweather was still conscious of the vaulted ceilings and rich tapestries on the walls. It must be a palace, but Caroline had met him in the garden and led him here, to blow out the candles in one graceful pirouette and then draw him to her. Waves of passion were sweeping through both of them. Her body was delightfully firm, skin smooth as silk, the unsightly bulge in her middle had vanished, and they mounted swiftly towards climax. Oh, Caroline, Caroline, I love you! Her breath came in gasps as her lips sought his. No need to wonder how she was with him. There came a great burst and he saw that the woman in his embrace had black, not red-gold hair. Who was she? 
The eyes were closed, the mouth twisted yet in the throes of passion, but the face was damnably familiar. Not Caroline, not his wife. Merriweather came awake in the sleeping cabin in pit, feeling the hot discharge on his belly, looked automatically up for the telltale compass to see that the course was steady, then remembered that she was at anchor in the roadstead off Muscat. God damn! He had not experienced such a dream since he was twenty. He rose, found the pitcher of fresh water, washed himself, then slipped into his robe to go on deck. All was well. It was a quarter hour to the end of the middle watch, and McCamey had the deck. He was ashamed of himself, though no one would ever know of it. The dream had been vivid, so real that he felt himself sated. He yet felt a lassitude. His weight, these weeks past, had remained below normal, though Buttram had found no objective symptoms of any disorder. The name swam unbidden into his consciousness. Creusa? Yes, Creusa Hale. He almost laughed at the thought, and returned to sleep dreamlessly until Revalli. Pitt lay at anchor in four and a half fathoms, a little more than two miles off Rassel Keimer. Merriweather had edged her in yesterday afternoon as close as he dared, the leadsman in the cutter feeling the way. The town with the two stone towers of the fort rising on its northern edge, one with a star flying the blood-red flag of the defiant Joasmis, was plainly visible through his glass. The town was built on a promontory some three miles long, forming the western boundary of a lagoon in which the masts of upward of a hundred vessels could be seen, a major portion of the pirate fleet. A boat crew had discovered last night that there was no more than three feet of water over the bar at the entrance to the lagoon, which accounted for the presence of the vessels trapped inside though the next nor'wester was likely enough to sweep the drifting sands again to a clear ten feet. "'It will be a hard knot to crack,' volunteered Whaley, also sweeping the shore with a glass. "'Not only the fort itself, but the houses in the town with their stone walls and flat roofs. Each one is a blockhouse. Merriweather made no reply, intent on fixing in his mind as much of the terrain and defences as he could in the cool of the morning with the sun rising behind the town. In two hours' time, the image would be shimmering in the fierce glare and dust devils dancing outside the walls. Satisfied, he turned his attention inboard to the waist, where Larkin, Hamlin, Marlow and Gunny were in the centre of a circle of seamen and marines. Dunbar had called on Pitt to supply the beachmaster and his party to oversee the landing, and direct troops and material to their designated sectors in an orderly manner. Larkin was clearly the best qualified man for the responsibility, but Whaley had seemed a bit put out at the choice. Merriweather had soothed his ruffled feelings with the explanation that he intended to be ashore during a portion of the operation, and command of Pitt should devolve upon the first lieutenant. He wanted a man ashore not only possessing iron resolution, of which Whaley had enough, but one also capable of persuasion with something more than the threat of the cat. He watched Larkin now drive his points home, fist pounded into palm, pointing from time to time to the large sketch chart of the spit spread out for all to see. He anticipated no difficulty in the carrying out of this assignment. Gunny and his marines could provide security against any sortie by the pirates. The landing was scheduled for daybreak the next day, though embarkation of the landing force would actually commence at four bells in the mid-watch. The first elements to land would be the two companies of light infantry of the 47th Regiment, who would serve as skirmishers and seize the low wall that ran across the spit some seven hundred yards north of the fort. The 65th would follow to take up positions five hundred yards farther north, entrenching themselves, and then the Bombay Artillery Battalion with its six twelve-pounder field guns 
would be positioned in sandbag emplacements in the centre. Merriweather had small hope that the field guns would do more than pock the face of the fort. Seaton's intelligence had reported the north walls were five and a half feet of stone. But with the remaining two forty-two pounders, a breach might ultimately be made. He turned his attention to seaward. The transports were engaged in launching the clumsy flat-bottomed troop lighters they had brought on their decks, and the four larger barges for the field guns that had been towed out here were alongside the Bombay Marine cargo vessels to take off the battery and its ammunition. This evolution appeared to be going well enough, though Merriweather could imagine the sweating seamen and the profane exhortations of the boatswain's mates in each of the ships. He shifted the glass to the transport Ceylon, with the two huge forty-two pounders on her deck. A barge with a pair of shear legs protruding at an angle over her bow was being warped up against another barge moored alongside Ceylon. Her blunt bow slanted upward, exposing several feet of bottom, evidence of the pig-iron ballast she carried astern to balance the weight of the gun she would lift from the deck and deposit in the barge. Merriweather watched with idle interest as the boatswain's mates spun their skein of blocks and tackles, preventers and stays, finally recruiting additional hands from the transport to double-bank the capstan bars and sway the gun up, then out, for deposit in the barge. An efficient evolution, he noted, as he racked the telescope and went below to look over the morning reports. It was an hour later when he heard the word passed. Away! Rescue, Natty! Ceylon! The messenger came clattering down the ladder. Sir, they've dropped a gun and sunk the barge. Merriweather came on deck to see confusion on Ceylon's deck, heads bobbing in the water alongside, the men being pulled to safety. Other boats were closer to the disaster, and he checked the embarking rescue party in the quarter boat. They dropped the second gun clean through the bottom of the barge, Whaley told him with an air of satisfaction. Merriweather put the glass to his eye. The wrought iron strong back joining the two timber legs of the shears at the top had broken right in half, releasing the heavy block through which the lifting cables led to the capstan and letting the gun fall straight down into the barge, instantly sinking her. Both guns were four or five fathoms under, and although the second gun still had the lifting cables attached, there was no way to bring it up until the shear legs were repaired. Divers would be required to attach lines to the other siege piece, if there were any available in the fleet possessing that skill. Merriweather wondered sourly what more could go wrong with this commission, as he awaited the inevitable summons to the flagship. He comforted himself in the meantime with the thought that the shear legs had been manned by the Royal Navy. By first light the next morning, the landing was well under way. Larkin, with his party, followed the two companies of light infantry which raced through the dawn to seize the low wall across the spit, then spread a line of skirmishers forward, taking shelter in the folds of the terrain southwardly towards the fort. With flags, the beach party quickly marked the points of landing for the main force, while the marines under Gunny established an arc of rifle pits from the end of the wall to the water's edge as a second line of defence to secure the flank along the beach. Not a shot had been fired as yet, but Merriweather heard the faint sounds of defiant trumpets and cymbals across the water from the fort in the dead quiet of early morning. The Juazmi forces had sounded the alarm. Well, said Whaley unnecessarily, it won't be long now. The flotilla of lighters, crammed with soldiers of the 47th and 65th regiments, was crawling towards the beach under sweeps in an orderly array, and others filled with the imam's troops were headed to a landing south of the town. Look there! shouted Whaley. From some concealed sally port to the east, a troop of mounted Joasmis had emerged at a canter in a loose column formation headed towards the point of landing a few hundred yards north of the light infantry positions. 
as they came westward towards the beach, the pickets and skirmishers began to fire shots at long range, then retreated and paused to fire again. Meriwether could see no results, and the Arabs pressed on. The first lighters loaded with the regulars were already in the shallows close to the beach, most vulnerable as they began to disgorge their cargoes in a stream of scarlet coats with bayonets flashing in the rising sun. The cavalry troop changed course to aim at the beach at the point where the low wall ended in the sand. With the evident intention of flanking the light infantry along the wall and striking the disembarking force behind it before the regulars could form up. Their route took them squarely against the almost invisible semicircle of rifle pits occupied by the Sepoy Marines. It appeared at this distance that the mounted Arabs had already overrun the pits. Then Meriwether saw puffs of smoke blossom all around the Ark, and after an appreciable interval heard the faint sound of the volley. The troop split. Men and horses were down, and the main body wheeled to its left and back up the beach out of range, while a smaller contingent veered to its right paralleling wall. The second group was instantly met by a volley from the light infantry company and sconce behind the wall while the marines fired again into their backs. More men and horses went down, and the survivors galloped off in frantic retreat towards the fort. Well done! shouted Merriweather, waving his hat and dancing as though the marines could hear and see him. A well-disciplined and resolute infantry force had demonstrated once again its ability to deal with cavalry, particularly a troop as loosely organized as this one had been. The landing proceeded without further incident, the regulars taking up positions some four hundred yards behind the low wall, digging trenches and fortifying them with sandbags. Other working parties began to pitch tents for the camp well towards the north end of the spit, and Merriweather soon saw the twelve-pound field pieces with their limbers landed. A large party of Indian navvies were filling bags with sand and erecting a redoubt for the battery opposite the east tower of the fort, where reconnaissance had disclosed chinks in the mortar and some stones fallen from the outer wall. His thoughts went back to the council of war yesterday afternoon following the loss of the siege guns, hearing again the bitter recriminations. Well, Dunbar, your blundering idiots have crippled me again, Colonel Smith had said. It was the failure of material that no one could have foreseen, Dunbar replied. I have already ordered the landing of four thirty-two pounders from this ship to replace the siege guns. Too little and too late, countered Smith. If we had all the troops Seaton promised, I would order a frontal attack with scaling ladders. He had paused and looked speculatively at the marine captain. In fact, to get some use out of what we have, I think I'll order an immediate attack by the Imam's troops on the town from the south. What? cried Seaton, leaping to his feet. You have no right. I am in absolute control of the employment of the Imam's forces. I forbid it. It was only a bad jest, Seaton, the colonel said. I doubt you could induce them to move out of camp. Berryweather decided to bring an end to this pointless bickering. Is there some further duty in which I can assist the operation, gentlemen? Yes, said Smith unexpectedly. Take Pitt up to the sea wall west of the town and pound the backside of that fort. Merriweather had asked one question too many. He opened his mouth to explain the impossibility of such action when he received unexpected aid from Dunbar. Pitt, as do all but the smallest cruisers present, has several feet too much draught to approach within gunshot of the shore, Colonel, Dunbar explained. Now, Merriweather, I think it only fair that Pitt furnish three gun crews for the thirty-two pounders, so that they may be manned around the clock. And I see no necessity for prolonging this council, gentlemen, though I desire a further word with Captain Merriweather. Smith and Seaton took their leave without delay. 
and Merriweather resumed his seat with some trepidation as to Dunbar's motives. "'Well, Merriweather,' said the Commodore, returning from the door to his place behind the desk. "'You see what a dragon we have in that damned smith. "'And with all due respect to your service, Seaton is not my cup of tea either.' He reached forward to ring the bell, and his servant emerged from the pantry. "'What will you have, gin, rum, or scotch whisky? "'God knows it's seldom enough I take a drink at sea. "'But this is purely medicinal.' Merriweather had not wanted a drink in the heat of the afternoon, but it would be rude to refuse. "'I leave the choice to you, sir. "'No need being finicky. "'Merriweather could choke down the whisky and make his escape. Two gins and lemon, Aiken. The servant departed, and Dunbar slid down in his chair, peering at Merriweather from under his thick brows. Of course, Smith is bracing for the brevet as Major General at Fort William during the leave of General Sir John Stanley next year. This operation will mean little enough in success, but disaster if it fails since he possesses no interest beyond his own abilities. The gin and lemon came in on two trays, and Dunbar paused while Aiken served them. Cheers, Captain. He took a sip, and Merriweather followed suit. The gin was exactly right, and the lemon complimented it perfectly, even in the sticky heat. I have held post rank eleven years now, I did have a bit of interest going through my wife's family, which is old in Devon, and has turfed out seven admirals in the last hundred years. But from captain to flag is purely seniority, and I'm still a long way from the top of the list. I fear Bonaparte may be defeated before attrition brings me within striking distance, and peace time will be much slower. He shook his head dolefully and took another sip. Merriweather felt vaguely uncomfortable, but the drink tended to alleviate the tension. Well, you're still a young man to possess so much seniority, Commodore, he said in an effort to commiserate without giving the appearance of it. But if I could pull this operation off quick and sharp, I might get a command in an area where I could make some prize money. God, look at the fortune Pellew has made these past five years while he got fat sitting on his veranda. Merriweather thought of the Admiral, now so gross that he required assistance to enter his carriage. A caricature of the man who had made his reputation as the most dashing frigate captain of the decade, and wondered if money was sufficient compensation for such degeneration. He made a final effort to lend a word of cheer. This should not take long. We will have the siege battery set up by morning, and the Arabs are not noted for prolonged resistance to a siege. He hoped he could make his escape. The glass was almost empty, and he certainly did not desire another. Dunbar appeared to come to the same conclusion. He drank off his gin, rose, and resumed his expression of goodwill. I suppose I'm in a blue funk, but I feel better after a bit of fellowship with another naval officer. Thank you, Merriweather, and I expect to rely upon you implicitly. God knows I have no one else. It was a left-handed compliment, but he could not doubt Dunbar's sincerity for the moment at least. He took his departure from a deck crowded with hands hoisting out the thirty-two pounders to replace the lost forty-twos. In the early morning light, Pitt's decks had little activity. Only the most inferior ratings were visible aside from the watch. With the marine contingent and fifty-odd qualified gunners ashore, the ship served little useful purpose in the operation for the moment. It was merely a headquarters and supply depot, with the readiness to repel an unlikely attack from the sea. Merriweather scanned the beach through the glass, examining the two batteries of light field guns the Joasmis had erected on the western beach outside the walls of the town. A single broadside from moderate range would knock down the sand and timber revetments that shielded them, 
and the back side of the fort was evidently much lighter construction than its northern face. He suddenly wondered exactly how much water there was off the town, and realized he had taken the estimates entirely on faith. There were not a half dozen soundings noted on the chart. Messenger, would you ask Mr. Dobbs to see me at his convenience? While Merriweather waited, he examined the hands now appearing on deck after breakfast to turn to on ship's work. They no longer seemed to be the sullen crew who had witnessed the executions last month. The days at sea, the storm, and now the exhilaration of lying at anchor in the face of the enemy appeared to have swept away the unhappy mood. The old adage concerning idle hands was true enough, he decided. He saw Dobbs's head appear in the companionway. You see the batteries, Dobbs? I want a survey made of the bottom between this anchorage and a point some six hundred yards off the beach. Cast your lead at twenty-foot intervals on lines of bearings. He saw that he had lost Dobbs and started over. What I mean is, I want the soundings recorded on the chart in the form of a grid each on a bearing from an identifiable point ashore so as to make a true profile of the bottom between here and the town. It is possible, what with the tidal range and the northwest gales, that some channels could be discovered. Dobbs's face cleared. Aye, aye, sir. And since we may be in range of those batteries, I'll take the quarter-boat to make as small a target as possible. Merriweather soon heard the coxswain pass the word for his boat crew. Half an hour later, it had commenced its monotonous task. Dobbs hunched over the chart, recording the leadsman's chant, while the oarsman pulled on a succession of courses set by the boat's compasses bearings on landmarks ashore. The enterprise might be wasted effort, but at least the company would have, for whatever it was worth, first-hand information on the bottom profile of the sea west of Raz ul Khaimah. And now it was high time he went ashore to see for himself how his hands were faring. He called away the gig. Merriweather arrived ashore in time to witness the emplacement of the third thirty-two-pounder. It had been dragged a half-mile across the spit by the sweating hands on boards laid over the sand for the trucks of its carriage to roll on. The carpenters had knocked together a platform of heavy timbers to support it and its tackles within the sand-bagged redoubt. The gun was inched into place under the supervision of a paunchy, self-important Royal Navy gunner, and the tackles secured. So far, aside from the abortive cavalry sortie yesterday morning, Russell Keimer remained ominously silent, with only an occasional figure silhouetted briefly on the parapet where the blood-red flag flew defiantly from its tall staff. The fourth gun was approaching, followed by a file of Laskers bearing two thirty-two-pound round shot each, slung over their shoulders in nets. The operation appeared to be progressing satisfactorily and Merriweather turned to go and find Larkin and his party. The battery of twelve-pounders manned by the Bombay forces opened up, and he paused to watch. A few splinters flew from the wall, but there was no visible effect. The ragged salvo from the fort came as a surprise. Missiles ploughed up the sand in a wide area about the gun emplacements, at least two striking solidly against the sand-bagged emplacements. The file of Laskers scattered like a covey of quail, leaving the shot in the sand. A dozen feet away, a seaman began to scream hoarsely. What had been his face, now a featureless mass of blood. A shot had blasted up a great abrasive gout of sand as it ricocheted, to obliterate skin, nose, lips and eyes in an instant, leaving teeth and white bone gleaming through the torrents of blood. Fortunately, the man died in moments of the massive hemorrhage. He had been the only casualty. "'Here, get on about your business!' shouted the gunner in the accents of Cheapside. Petty officers were rounding up the Laskers and chivying them back to pick up their burdens of shot. "'Sir, 
We'll be ready to open fire here in half a mo, and give those buggers summit more to think on. He continued in belated recognition of Merriweather's rank. He traced the trajectory of one of the projectiles to find it still smoking in the sand a hundred yards behind the battery. It was merely a round stone, the size of a thirty-two pound shot, but probably no more than a third the weight. He found other stone missiles, some shattered, together with nine and twelve pound iron shot, but no thirty-two pounder iron balls. The pirates were evidently in short supply of effective munitions. He saw a powder monkey come trotting towards the battery, a covered copper bucket in either hand bringing up the powder charge. It was only a few moments before two of the massive guns spoke, while the others were still being emplaced. One shot was short, but it ricocheted to tear a gap in the light wall at the top of the parapet. The other hit squarely in the eroded target area of the wall, already pocked by the steady fire of the Bombay artillery battery. It knocked out a cloud of splinters, but it was a long way from penetrating. The stone under the mortar chinks was still sound. As Merriweather came back to the battery, he saw that wet cloth pads had been draped over the barrels of the guns to cool them. Even so, after a half-dozen shots, the metal was too hot to touch, and it was hazardous to reload the weapons. "'Have to slack off, sir,' explained the gunner. "'Let them cool down a bit. These big guns holds the heat a deal longer than the smaller ones.' Looking towards the fort, Merriweather saw a little cluster of men emerge in front of the wall from some concealed sally port. They appeared to be searching for something on the ground, stooping, then rising in the posture of a man carrying a heavy weight to disappear into the fort again. He could not fathom their mission for the moment and took shelter from the blistering sun in the shade of the sandbag parapet to watch the gunners again wet down the cloth pads on the guns with seawater. It evaporated almost instantly, leaving a rime of salt encrusting the barrels. The gunner put his hand gingerly on the breech and opened his mouth to make some observation, but it was drowned out by the roar of the salvo from the fort. Three tremendous shocks went through the redoubt. There were men down and the gunner was looking incredulously at the blood gushing from the wrist where a moment before his hand had been. They had taken three direct hits, not by round stone balls, but by navy issue thirty-two-pound shot. Merriweather realised now what the stupors had been doing. The pirates had come out to retrieve undamaged balls in the sand, and had now returned them with interest. As senior officer present, he took command of the battery, saw a tourniquet applied to the half-fainting gunner, and ordered him transported to the army surgeon's tent. The other wounds were slight, the guns intact, but the redoubt was damaged, and there would be more to come. Stations! he rallied the gun crews. Load! The hands resumed their duties steadily enough. Just as the gun captain was inserting the quill of priming powder in the touch hole, the fort fired again, and he felt the impact of the balls against the face of the redoubt. This was good shooting. A few more such hits and the emplacement would be demolished. Merriweather shifted the point of aim of the gun, peering through the notches in breach a muzzle that served as crude sights signalling the man with the handspike as he levered the carriage around in train a fraction of an inch at a time. Mark! The shots had come from three narrow embrasures halfway up the wall and fifty yards to the right of the former point of aim. Merriweather moved clear of the gun. Fire! The gun roared out, but the smoke did not obscure the view from this vantage point, and a gaping hole appeared in the wall between two of the embrasures, giving the face of the fortress a snaggle-toothed expression. The lack of lateral support in the wall occasioned by the openings on either side made this point of aim vulnerable to the heavy guns. 
He heard commands given to the Bombay artillery battery in its adjacent emplacement, and the twelve-pounders shifted their point of aim to the breach. If the fort's thirty-two-pounders were not already out of service, this steady bombardment should make the position untenable, and prevent further fire from those formidable weapons, though the fortress mounted at least fifty smaller guns. Same point of aim, he told the gun captains, and shift the guns a bit in train for each shot so as to enlarge the hole. The beginning breach was far too high on the wall to serve as a point of entry by infantry, except with the dangerous expedient of scaling ladders. But at least it was a beginning. The third gun was in place, almost ready to open fire, and the fourth was on its way from the beach. He heard his name called and turned around. Sir, Colonel Smith sends his compliments and hopes you will join him at his headquarters at your convenience. The speaker was a beardless subaltern wearing the aiguillettes of an aide-de-camp on his shoulder. He was standing at salute. Merriweather returned the salute, and the officer brought his hand down smartly but remained at rigid attention. Very well, carry on. The youth about faced and marched out of the redoubt in the direction of the army camp. Smith was evidently a stickler in the formalities of military courtesy. Oh well, Merriweather thought, might as well find out what that abrasive army commander wanted without undue delay. He left orders to continue the bombardment with the senior gunner's mate, and walked towards the army camp through the blistering sunlight, feeling the sweat trickling down the small of his back, to find the headquarters tent marked with the regimental colours. A soldier stood rigidly in red coat and full field equipment before the entrance, oblivious to the sun. Captain Merriweather to see Colonel Smith. The sentry shifted his eyes to look him up and down without moving his head. Merriweather realised that he did not cut a very impressive figure, powder-grimed, jacketless, shirt open at the collar, wearing the broad plaited straw hat with the handkerchief now dried, hanging out from under it to shield his neck. Come, man, he said a bit sharply. The colonel wishes to see me. At this the soldier turned his head, made an unintelligible utterance, and resumed his stance. In a moment a grizzled sergeant appeared beside the tent. And what is your business with the colonel, mister? I am Captain Merriweather of the Bombay Marine. Colonel Smith sent me a message by his aide. Oh, said the sergeant, saluting reluctantly. That one. I'll send word. He disappeared into what must be the guard tent. In a few minutes, the subaltern appeared, held aside the flap, and Merriweather entered. Colonel Smith was sitting on a stool before his field desk, stripped to the waist. The side of the tent had been propped up to admit the mild northwest breeze, but the place was nevertheless stifling, and sweat rolled down the hairy torso. "'Well, you came promptly enough,' Smith growled, looking up with cold grey eyes. "'Pull up a stool.' Merriweather seated himself gingerly on one of the folding wood and leather contraptions, and looked about. The tent was furnished with Spartan simplicity. Only two brass-bound campaign chests set at either end of a cot along one side, and the unfolded desk in the centre with two more stools before it. Dunbar and Seaton should be here before long, the colonel added. I was already ashore at the battery, Merriweather explained. The colonel picked up a cup and drank. Only cold tea, he said. Spirits in this climate don't agree with me. He turned his attention back to his desk, picking up a quill as though to write, then pausing to reread what appeared to be from upside down a report of several sheets. Merriweather sat in discomfort, sweat oozing down his spine and belly, a premonition of prickly heat beginning to creep down under his arms and belt. He hoped Dunbar and Seaton would soon appear, then heard their voices outside. "'Well, gentlemen,' said Smith once they were seated, "'I'm plain-spoken, and I'll get to the point at once. I don't like the situation.' I don't like the progress you have made in establishing a siege. My men are camped here with nothing to occupy them. 
There have been three bloody brawls since we landed. We have had twenty cases of what the surgeon called heat stroke. Can you give me an unvarnished report of where we stand? His eyes glinted under heavy brows as he looked first at Dunbar, then Seaton. Dunbar coloured a bit at the tone and looked at Seaton, then at Merriweather, before making a careful reply. A breach has been started by the thirty-two pounders, and they are enlarging it with every shot, but it must be twenty feet above the bottom of the dry moat at the present. With scaling ladders? No! exploded Smith. No and no again! I'll not have my men slaughtered in any such asinine venture. I was promised a respectable breach would be blasted through the wall by bombardment or your sappers, and the guns silenced before the attack. Lord knows it will be hard enough fighting from house to house once we gain entry to the town. He glared from one to the other a moment, his bare torso heaving. The full heavy battery has only just commenced its bombardment, said Dunbar. We've lost one man killed and a warrant gunner wounded so far. Give the battery a chance, Smith. His square, ruddy face still wore its expression of good humour, but it appeared nearly ready to crack. Seaton sat quiet, looking from colonel to captain, a curious expression of triumph on his narrow face, as though he knew a secret not shared by the others. Very well, Dumba said Smith in a milder tone. All the artillery is under your control. But I warn you, give me a respectable breach of ground level or nearly so within forty-eight hours, or I re-embark my force and leave you to the tender mercies of Seaton here and the Imam's troops. Seaton bounded to his feet. Just as suddenly he resumed his seat without uttering a word. Merriweather had watched the curious tableau with foreboding. The three-headed monster of command was snapping and growling. A bit more and each set of jaws would be ripping and tearing at the other's throats. Dunbar obviously was near to losing control of his temper, but Seaton had resumed his cryptic expression of self-satisfaction. Colonel, I shall set out the details of this remarkable interview and your stipulation, more accurately your unreasonable ultimatum in my reports to the Governor-General, said Dunbar in a tight voice. Quite all right, Smith said. My complaints are already in writing here on my desk, lacking only signature and seal. He pointed his finger at the sheets. And you say, remarkable? I've cited chapter and verse for each of your remarkable failures and blunders. Merriweather realized Dunbar's self-control had reached the breaking point. At the risk of involving himself, he decided to intervene before the irretrievable challenge was thrown. Gentlemen, I suggest we adjourn this council of war. The colonel has made himself plain enough, and duty calls all of us. There was a moment of silence punctuated only by the heavy thuds of the siege guns in the background. By common consent, Dunbar and Seaton stood up, wheeled and marched rigidly out of the tent without a word or backward glance. Merriweather rose to follow them. Smith caught his eye and crooked his finger, then looked past him out the entrance. After a moment, he threw back his head and laughed. Well, Captain, did I throw it in hot enough for them? he inquired, a sardonic grin now creasing the hard face. I intended to blast them both off their backsides. I fully expected to be called out by one or both. But it is just as well that you spoke when you did. Such affairs of honour in the field tend to become... messy. Merriweather hesitated. He was in a ticklish position. Being technically under the command of Commodore Dunbar, it was impossible for him to agree with Colonel Smith. But he could not offend him either. He despised himself for the equivocation, but felt compelled to adopt it. 
Then I would say you accomplished your purpose, Colonel, he said. You know, Merriweather, this is no major campaign, important mainly to the company, but bungled, it may wreck a man's career. General Sir John Stanley goes back to England on leave in October, and he has promised me a brevet as Major General to command Fort William during his absence. He paused, looking keenly at Merriweather. I'm almost forty, nothing spectacular in my record, but I don't descend even from a county family. But I've made my own way in the army, and with the brevet in my record, I'll be in line for the permanent commission. Merriweather could sympathize with the man appreciate his anxiety to get the operation over quickly and effectively without a bloody butcher's bill to stain his record. I wish you luck, Colonel, he said. Of course, the batteries are making every effort to enlarge the breach. He made his escape in the twilight to go back to Pitt, hearing the measured reports of the siege guns from across the water. He could not make out the effect on the breach he had started high up. But if the bombardment persisted, the wall eventually must fall. He sponged the salt rime from his body with a pint of fresh water, consumed a light meal, and dropped off to sleep immediately. Merriweather surfaced to consciousness as though rising from a great depth. Midshipman Marlow was tugging anxiously at his shoulder. Sir, oh sir, Mr. McCamey says the magazine must have exploded over on the beach. He repeated himself as Merriweather tried to grasp the import of what the boy was saying. All right, lad, I'll come. He struggled into the fresh uniform Sang had hung out, then into the heavy landing force boots, still soggy with the sweat of yesterday's shore excursions. By the clock, it was almost six bells in the middle watch. On deck, he found McCamey and Whaley peering through glasses at the shore two miles away. He could see lights there dancing like fireflies, evidently torches and lanterns. What is it? he demanded. I'm not sure, replied Whaley. A heavy explosion followed by a series of smaller ones. It appeared to come from the gun emplacements, interposed McCamey. And then there was a bit of musket fire. Call away the rescue party and send for Buttram and Mefford. Pistols and cutlasses for the boat crew. The launch and cutter were already in the water, riding to the boat boom rigged on the port side, but it was a quarter of an hour before they moved towards the shore. As they approached the landing area, there was a brisk challenge out of the darkness, evidently from a Sepoy Marine outpost. Merriweather stood up in the boat and opened the slide of his dark lantern to focus its ray of light upon himself. Pit! shouted the coxswain. The sentry apparently was satisfied, and the keel grated on the beach. Once ashore, a small party was left to guard the boats, while the rest pressed forward in a rough formation across the spit, stumbling in the soft sand burdened with their gear. Doctors Buttram and Mefford panted along beside Merriweather, their medical kits borne by four loblolly attendants. It was no more than a quarter of an hour before they reached the site of the battery. The sandbag revetments had vanished. The heavy timber platforms which had supported the thirty-two pounders were in splinters. The guns themselves, including the lighter field pieces, were scattered over a wide area, dismounted, half buried in the sand. There was a crater, forty feet across and more than a fathom deep, where the sand was blackened and the acrid odour of sulphur hung in the air. There were dead and wounded men scattered about in the flickering light of the torches, with three army surgeons and their orderlies trying to minister to the living. Buttram and Mefford took off their jackets and pitched in with the rescue party to lend assistance. Merriweather heard footsteps in the sand and recognised Colonel Smith a dozen yards away, formerly attired, scarlet coat and all. You've certainly played hell now. The injustice of the accusation set Merriweather's blood to boiling. 
He opened his mouth to reply in kind, to hurl or accept the inevitable challenge, then caught the glint of gold lace on blue cloth to his left, and realized that he was not the target of the remark. Me? shouted Dunbar, coming into view in outraged tones. It was your light companies that let the buggers in, and never a shot or word of warning. Merriweather saw an expression of doubt across Smith's face and the balance of the conversation between the colonel and commodore became inaudible. He looked about to see Jemadar Gunny approaching. Sir, we were posted to guard the right flank where the cavalry made its attack. I think the Joasme sent a party crawling along the beach to the east along the lagoon behind the light infantry pickets, and struck the men off watch first. My men heard pistol shots after the attack had commenced and sent a platoon to investigate. The enemy used scimitars on the sleeping men first, then overwhelmed the gun crews. They moved the powder barrels from the magazine into the redoubt and exploded it to destroy the guns. How much of a breach has been made in the wall? It has been widened, but it is still a good ten feet above the bottom of the ditch. Were any of your men injured? Only slight wounds, sir. They were more than a hundred yards away when the explosion came. It had been a daring and incredibly successful sally, with only the lightest of casualties, and Merriweather felt reluctant admiration for the enterprise and courage of the beleaguered Arabs. They had effectively destroyed the siege train of the expedition for the present, and if Smith held to his forty-eight-hour ultimatum, had saved their town as a base of operations. Thank you, Gunny. He moved back to the nightmarish scene. Each heavy gun had had three crews of sixteen men to man it around the clock, two hours on duty and four off. Most of the men on duty had escaped the massacre by scattering in all directions from the redoubts when the enemy appeared. But of the 128 men off watch under their tarpaulin shelters, 33 had been killed outright in their sleep, Buttram reported, and another 29 wounded, some mortally. Pitt had lost seven killed and three wounded out of the three crews she had supplied. Merriweather heard his name called and joined the cluster of officers to find that Seaton was now present. No need to wash our dirty linen in public said Smith, and Seaton here says he has momentous news to impart. We'll adjourn to my quarters. The conference in the flickering light of two lanterns in the tent resembled that of yesterday only superficially. The chill in the pre-dawn air made it comfortable enough to keep coats and jackets on. Smith pulled out a drawer of one of his campaign chests to produce a dark bottle, brandy by the looks of it, and four silver cups from a leather case. "'Purely medicinal, gentlemen,' he said, pouring them full in a row. It was an excellent Spanish vintage. "'No, Seaton, what is your news?' demanded Dunbar. Seaton leaned forward to sniff the aroma from his cup, then raised his head to display a triumphant expression. "'You have seen fit to belittle and disparage me and the imam's troops.' he said slowly. But now I alone possess the means to take Rasul Kaimar without the firing of another shot or the loss of a single man. He looked about the circle, a benign smile on his thin face, then raised the cup to sniff again. Get on with it, man, snapped Dunbar impatiently. Seaton ignored the interjection as he enjoyed the aroma again, then finished off the brandy in a gulp and held the cup out for more. Merriweather watched the scene as though it were a play. What solutions Seaton fancied he possessed he could not fathom. Certainly his force had neither the numbers nor inclination to mount a successful attack on the town. You gentlemen who follow merely the profession of arms do not understand that there are stratagems and expediences in many instances mightier than the sword, he continued pedantically. Dunbar opened his mouth, then resigned himself to wait and hear Seaton out. 
I confess I was disappointed, continued Seaton, at the force the Emma made available for this expedition. But among its numbers, there are several quite accomplished men, with acquaintances, even kinsmen, who were with the Joasmids in Russell Kaimar. He looked around the group again with a slight smile. Merriweather felt a flush of exasperation, wishing that the officer would come to the point. Smith poured another tot of brandy for himself, his hard face perfectly impassive. "'Take your time, Seaton,' said the colonel. "'You have nearly forty hours before I order my force to re-embark.' The remark seemed to amuse Seaton. He threw back his head, laughed, then sobered. After three tots of brandy, his face was flushed, but he appeared to be in complete control of himself. Within an hour of our landing, I had my intelligence within the fortress, and by nightfall had a complete report of the situation there. He shook his head as Smith offered more brandy. As for small arms, the Joasmis are well supplied. They have some four thousand troops in the town and are prepared to make a building-to-building -building resistance if the fortress is breached. They have a great store of powder, captured in the company's storeship Princess Caroline last year. As for missiles, they have an ample store, but for thirty-two pounds shot, and they expect to recover enough of our spent balls to supply their largest guns. They have a three-month supply of grain, and their wells flow freely. Their spirits are high, as witnessed the attack just made and the destruction of our siege train. Are you saying we should abandon this operation? Dunbar demanded in a hard tone. I should be, but for one factor, replied Seaton. And this I shall come to in my own time. He sat on the stool staring a moment at Dunbar over his laced fingers. I only wonder whether you possess the courage to act when I disclose it. What? shouted Dunbar, leaping to his feet. Wait him out, said Smith. It had better be good. Back in 64, continued Seaton, Major Hector Monroe of the 89th Native Infantry under Clive suppressed a mutiny among the Muslim sepoys. He executed twenty-five of the mutineers by blowing them from the mouths of his guns. Merriweather had heard of the savage mode of execution, employed in more unsettled days as an example to strike terror into the hearts of the Indians, in a manner that a simple hanging or firing squad somehow failed to do. The Muslims had always reckoned it an ignominious and shameful death, to be bound spread-eagled over the muzzle of a field gun and then blasted to bloody rags. But he wondered at the relevance of the anecdote. Seaton continued, I've heard that even Arthur Wellesley used it on occasion. Interesting, said Smith. Seaton went on as though he had not heard the comment. Yesterday afternoon my intelligence reported that a considerable number of women and children had been evacuated upon the appearance of our fleet, including the wives and children of Sheikh Hussein bin Ali and his brother Saud bin Sugur, the rulers of the Joasmis. Seaton looked about the assemblage, eyes glittering. They were sojourning in a house some twelve miles south of here under guard. I knew immediately my course of action. A mounted party led by myself surprised their guard last night and seized the four wives of Hussein bin Ali and three of his brothers, together with nine children, including the elder son of bin Ali. Well, I'm damned, said Smith with evident admiration. She'll be able to make the sheikh jump through hoops holding those hostages. Dunbar's face had lighted up, too. Where are they? I delivered them within the hour on board Pitt, with a detachment of my troops to serve as guards. They are occupying the flag cabin. It was Merriweather's turn to be angry. By what authority? he commenced. It is the most secure place to hold our hostages, 
and I can conceive of no valid objection on your part, said Seaton evenly. But you had already come ashore, and I could not inform you. Merriweather resumed his seat. Better wait the man out, he decided, though he knew in his bones what was coming. Will those buggers over there honour a flag of truce? inquired Smith. I think so, said Seaton, provided one of my native officers carries it. Besides, I have here a talisman the Sheikh cannot doubt. He held out a glittering gold amulet set with a single large ruby. It appeared to be made for a child. This is the device worn by his eldest son as a token that he is the heir apparent to the Sheikdom. No, said Dunbar. How best can we couch our ultimatum? I have it already written out. Seaton pulled a folded paper from his pocket. I will read it for you. To Sheikh Hussain bin Ali, most revered leader of the Jaismis, greetings. Be it known that we have as our honoured guests your wives and those of your princely brother Saud bin Sugur, together with nine of your children, including Salim Ahmed, your firstborn son and heir apparent. We are desolated to inform you that unless within twenty-four hours hence you lay down your arms and march out of Rasul Khaimah in unconditional surrender, we shall be compelled at intervals of one hour to blow your wives and children from the mouths of guns until your line is extinct. Should you deem it prudent to accept our terms, you and your brother Saud bin Sugur shall signify the fact by an approach to our lines under a white flag to surrender your persons to us as further sureties for the behaviour of your forces. Herein, fail not. Seaton looked up, his thin face alight with pride. Of course I shall dress up the language a bit when I translate it into Arabic. Twenty-four hours, said Dunbar. Why not make it twelve? Or six, said Smith. We hold all the cards now. No, said Seaton. I know the nature of these men. Too short a time, and they would defy us in bravado. Give them time for their imaginations to work a bit. By the by, asked Dunbar, how old is their heir apparent? Oh, four, possibly five. The Sheikh only came to power last year. He is still quite a young man. Merriweather felt outrage boil up and course through his body as he looked at these three callous men sitting around the desk in the yellow lantern light in their cold-blooded moment of triumph. That they would even consider the slaughter of women and small children seemed incredible, no matter how important the end to be gained might be to them. He decided instantly that he would have no part of this monstrous scheme of blackmail, and if it came to be a counted mutiny, let them make the most of it. When he spoke, his voice cracked as it had that day at Bombay when he ordered the mutineers turned off. Gentlemen, all three officers looked at him. I cannot agree with this course of action. It violates every law of war and humanity. What of that, sir? snapped Smith. We are not dealing with Europeans, but with bloodthirsty pirates. Uh, we must meet them at their own game, fight fire with fire. You saw what they just did out there to our siege train? The conventions of war, as Europeans observe them, do not obtain in this operation, said Dunbar pompously. Entirely a legitimate stratagem of war in these parts, said Seaton. Even Cornwallis took the sons of Tipu Sultan as hostages for his good behaviour. Besides, under the operation order you have no authority over its conduct. But if you did, you have been outvoted, sir. Merriweather considered for a moment simply washing his hands of the affair. He could easily enough disavow any responsibility for the atrocity in his reports of the operation and let these men justify their own action. 
And then it was entirely possible that Seaton's estimate of the reaction of the Arab sheikhs was accurate, that with twenty-four hours to consider their situation, they would capitulate. Success in the capture of Rasul Khaimah would not invite close examination of the means employed, while failure or even delay would almost certainly be fatal to the ambitions of these men. He was, he realized, perilously close to wrecking his own career. A report of insubordination, or even a simple failure to cooperate, would surely deprive him of any further command in the Marine. He had no present solution for the dilemma in which the expedition found itself, other than the obvious one of ferrying more heavy guns ashore to blast a breach in the wall, and the time was far too short for that. He temporized, despising himself for his sudden irresolution. Are you certain that Sheikh Hussam bin Ali will capitulate? Could it only make him resist all the more? I am certain, snapped Seaton. This boy is the apple of his father's eye, the living image of the Sheikh. Seaton held up the glittering amulet to the light again. We would prefer, Captain, to make this decision unanimously. Though you exercise no authority over the operation, Dunbar said. The sudden realization came to Merriweather that two of these three officers were by no means as certain either of the success or the morality of their gambit as they wished to appear. If the blackmail failed and the sheikh defied them, their hands would be forced and they would be compelled to commence the executions. There was grave doubt that British seamen, with their traditional sentimental regard for women and children of whatever race, would carry out an order to blast such innocent beings from the muzzle of a gun. He decided to see if he might shake the resolution of one or more of the officers and divide the triumvirate. Of course, George Barlow, my wife's uncle, might well agree with your plan. But Gibby Elliot is a somewhat different kettle of fish, he said offhandedly. He saw Smith and Dunbar look up sharply at his use of the familiar diminutive in referring to the Governor-General. Undoubtedly they were recalling that he had been closeted with Minto in chambers last January, when they were ushered in for the conference, and suddenly were uncertain as to how close and cordial his acquaintance with the Governor-General might be. And Barlow, as Governor of Madras, was still a factor to be reckoned with in India and Merriweather had reminded them that he was related to him by marriage. He allowed the doubts to take root, realizing the fragility of the bluff he was attempting. He was particularly conscious of Seaton's anger. I fear that once your ultimatum is delivered, you are irrevocably committed, and upon continued resistance will be compelled to carry out your threat. Balder dash! shouted Seaton. In my judgment, the mere delivery of the ultimatum will result in immediate surrender. But if it does not, do you conceive that British seamen will carry out your order to execute helpless women and children? And think of the stir in the ladies' literary circle, not to mention the cries of shame in the Calcutta Gazette. He saw Smith look at Dunbar a moment as though seeking a signal. I suggest you defer any ultimatum for the present. The hostages will keep, and the sheikh will soon enough learn of their unexplained absence from their place of refuge. Uncertainty may very well bring him out under a flag of truce without our having to commit ourselves. Merriweather saw glances exchanged again between Smith and Dunbar, and suddenly was certain that his bluff had succeeded at least with those two officers. I think your suggestion has some logic and merit, said Colonel Smith slowly as Dunbar nodded. And I particularly like the idea of not immediately exposing our trumps to those buggers. I am inclined to extend by twenty-four hours the re-embarkation of my troops, in the expectation that the matter will be resolved within that time, either by surrender or by you and Dunbar completing the breach you have started. Yes, said Dunbar, 
and in recognition of your eloquent plea to conclude the operation by conventional means, I direct that you proceed to do so. Possibly you may prevail on Gibby and George to bear a hand, said Seaton. In the meantime, guard well our hostages. The implications took a minute to sink in, for Merriweather had won his plea to refrain for the time being from the monstrous use of Joasmi women and children to compel surrender of the fortress of Russell Kaimar, only to have the entire responsibility for the success of the operation devolve upon him. Pitt was the only ship in the Marine squadron which mounted thirty-two pounders. While he could require working parties from other ships present, it would still be a back-breaking evolution to hoist the guns out and into lighters, then to drag them through the sand to the site of the battery. Merriweather experienced sudden doubt that even the twenty-four-hour extension would suffice to accomplish the mission. He struggled to conceal the dismay he felt. Do I have full authority and discretion? he demanded. Anything your heart desires, replied Dunbar airily. And now I think we may well adjourn this council since the matter rests in capable hands. In the broad daylight, the sun outlined the masts of the pirate vessels trapped in the landlocked lagoon across the spit. The site of the battery with its blackened crater and debris was deserted but for a party of sepoy marines, sojourning in shallow pits nearby. The dead and wounded removed, with only brown stains in the sand to mark where they had lain. Merriweather had time to reflect as the launch made its way back to pit. The sleepy landing force huddled together in the bottom still, though the pre-dawn chill had melted away. He did not regret the stand he had taken as to the hostages. His conscience would permit no other course. But he resented the sudden turn of events by which the commanders of the operation had foisted off their responsibilities upon him. In his preoccupation he brushed aside Dobbs's attempt to speak to him as he came on board. Early breakfast, Mr. Dobbs, but I want all hands on deck as soon as possible. Send the boatswain, gunner, and carpenter to see me at their earliest convenience. And seeing Whaley approaching, You too, Mr. Whaley, in the cabin in ten minutes. He hurried on aft, already feeling the precious minutes ticking by, to pull up short as he glimpsed the strange spectacle in his ship. There was a party of Arab soldiers squatting in a semicircle on the port side outside the entrance to the flag quarters. Brown best muskets furnished by a generous King George to his ally, the Imam of Oman, laid carelessly aside. These were dark, hawk-nosed men robed in white, wearing the silver badges of the Imam's service. A part of his scanty force contributed to the expedition. The scene bore little resemblance to a disciplined performance of military duty. Half a dozen children tumbled and played among the soldiers. There was one sturdy, olive-skinned boy, evidently the oldest of them, with dark, liquid brown eyes and a ready smile, who clambered onto the shoulders of the squatting men to slide headfirst down their backs to the deck with squeals of joy. Hands had paused nearby in their work to watch the sport with weak, sentimental smiles on their faces. And Merriweather shuddered at the thought of being called upon to destroy this attractive, happy child, evidently the sheikh's firstborn, along with the others. A fat young woman, veiled to her eyes, called out sharply, and the children disengaged themselves from their play to run to her in the cabin doorway. The gaze of a frightened doe met Merriweather's over the veil for an instant, before she turned to herd the brood back into the cabin. He saw Dobbs coming aft, and remembered his brusque interruption of the young man earlier. Oh, Mr. Dobbs, I believe you had something to say to me at the gangway. Yes, sir. I have just finished the chart of the soundings between the ship and the beach. It is in your cabin. Merriweather tried to remember how long ago he had assigned this task to Dobbs. Two days? 
three. He had lost track of the calendar during this period of labour, alarms and midnight conferences. Indeed, Mr. Dobbs, I have a meeting just now. Come in afterwards and show me what you found. He went into the cabin calling for Sang to pour the tea. There was a packet on his desk, endorsed in Dobbs's small precise hand. Soundings off western shore of Ras ul Khaima. But he took no time to examine it for the present. His officers were at the door. The council of war was brief, and the warrant officers departed, shouting for their leading petty officers. The first lieutenant would coordinate the complicated task of loading four ponderous monsters into lighters, together with powder, shot, and tools. Whaley soon left in the launch and cutter to press enough boatswain's mates and able seamen out of other ships into service to provide the skilled manpower, while the boatswain and his mates began to lay out the lines, blocks, tackles, spars, and gear that would be woven together to lift out the guns. Dobbs had apparently been lurking just outside the companion, and the chart with its grid of tiny figures was soon spread on the desk. I can't see a sounding of more than two fathoms, and most of them are a half or quarter less, Merriweather complained. Yes, sir, but I noticed a curious phenomenon. Here is Pitt's present position just off the bank, he said, pointing a finger. On the west edge you see a sounding that is some three quarters of a fathom more than the others. Now watch. He began to trace a faint pencil line on the chart, first northwardly, then in an arc through east to almost due south, thence in another arc almost north again. The line formed a sprawling reversed letter S on the chart, some two miles across the bank, its base nearly parallel to and some six hundred yards distant from the western edge of the town of Rasul Khaima. Well? inquired Merriweather, leaning forward to look more closely at the chart. This line passes through a series of the deepest soundings, all at least three and a half fathoms, explained Dobbs. It indicates that there is what amounts to a stream bed cut in the bottom of the sea. I've read about such things during my studies in navigation. He looked up at Merriweather, his plain, blunt face alight. I've adjusted the soundings for mean low tide as well, sir, and following this old channel, there's at least two feet more water than pit draws all the way in. Merriweather knew he could trust the accuracy of Dobbs's observations. To be sure, there was always the chance of a rock or shallow spot protruding towards the surface between soundings, but it would take relatively little time for the quarter-boat to follow out of the channel confirming its depth at every point, and placing unobtrusive buoys to mark it. Why, the thing was perfect. He could take Pitt right up to the beach and demolish the citadel from its backside. He looked up to meet Dobbs's eyes, opening his mouth to issue the order. Then he saw the altered expression. There's only one difficulty, sir. The entrance is blocked from the sea by a wreck. Merriweather stared at Dobbs. He might have known it was too good to be true. He wished Dobbs had never called the matter to his attention. But I have a scheme that may let us enter in spite of it. Well, over to the south end of the wreck, the water lacks only a little more than two feet of being deep enough to allow the ship to pass over it. By using those four lighters as camels, two to a side, we should be able to lift her at least three feet. The idea was by no means novel. He had seen camels or pontoons often enough employed to lift a stranded ship from a bar or mud bank or to enable a deep-draft vessel to cross the silver shallow graving dock. But the idea of taking Pitt into a channel whose only exit was solidly blocked did not appeal to Merriweather. He would be willing enough to take his chances on traversing the underwater stream bed if the manoeuvre promised an early accomplishment of the destruction of Rasul Khaimah. 
but he had no intention of sticking his head into a blind hole with no assurance of getting back out. There were too many uncertain contingencies. The lighters were the property of the Royal Navy, and he had the uncomfortable feeling that if his approach to the fort was successful, he might very well find them unavailable to lift his ship back out. Then there would be the very real technical problem of positioning the cables that would pass under Pitt's keel, attached at either end to a lighter, so that the lift would be uniform. It would be necessary to flood the barges almost to the gunwales, probably by the expedient of boring holes in their bottoms, with the risk of miscalculation and sinking them. It would be a tremendous all-hands evolution to rig the thing, pump out the lighters, move the ship across the barrier, and reverse the process on the other side. He did not for a moment consider attempting to take Pitt, supported by the camels, through the winding channel on the chart. The lash-up would be completely unmanageable, the partially exposed rudder unable to get enough bite to control the unwieldy mass. No, said Merriweather and again no. He saw the expectant expression fade and disappointment replace it. It had been an ingenious idea Dobbs had conceived, and it was difficult to back away from using the channel he had discovered. With two hours of uninterrupted broadsides thundering into the soft underbelly of the fortress, he would stake his life upon the surrender. Too bad, too damn bad. Then, to temper his refusal, he made an idle inquiry. And this wreck, can you determine its size, age, condition? Only generally, sir. I had the carpenter make me a water glass after my soundings found it, and when the light is just right, you can see the outlines quite clearly. Of course, it is all covered with weed and barnacles, lying about half on its side, and sand drifted against it to seaward. I want to see it for myself. It was little more than half a mile to the point where a piece of timber protruded from the water, anchored to the bottom with a stone to serve as a buoy. She lies roughly north and south, explained Dobbs. I would guess her to be about two-thirds the size of Pitt. He looked up at the morning sun. With this light, I think you can follow her outline as we row slowly. He handed over the water glass. The contraption was a truncated four-sided pyramid, a pane of glass corked and sealed with pitch forming its base. Merriweather looked in the small end, his head blocking off the light, to see through the greenish water right to the bottom, glare and reflection eliminated. There was a dark mass just to his left, shimmering with weed that he judged to be the stern of the hulk. Dobbs conned the quarterboat slowly the length of the object, then retraced his course. The wreck had been a substantial ship, and so the hull was evidently largely intact. It had probably been constructed of teak. He could see the outline of a large hatch almost amidships, but the masts and any superstructures had vanished. Hand me the sounding rod. Merriweather plunged the long rod into the water, finally to strike solidly against the hull. He jogged the rod several times, moving it back and forward. The wreck was damnably solid, still holding together in spite of the movement of the sea and the Teredo worm. He looked back towards Pitt. The hands were still in the rigging, weaving the tackles that would lift out the guns. He had nothing to lose. It would be hours before they were actually lowered into the lighters. Return to the ship, Mr. Dobbs. A flush of frustration surged through Merriweather. Was the gunner being deliberately obtuse or simply avoiding a display of ignorance? He had laid out a problem to be solved by this expert in the field of ordnance and was met by a blank stare. "'Yes, sir, Captain,' said Mr. Vance. "'I can cut a piece of slow match to burn most any time you fix, give or take a mo. "'But not under water.' Merriweather considered restating the problem in simpler terms. 
wishing desperately that he had McClellan with his vast technical knowledge and inventive turn of mind at hand. A knock came before he could recommence. Captain, said Whaley, sticking only his head through the door. We will be ready to hoist out the first gun within the half hour. Very good, said Merriweather, irritated at the interruption to convey a trifling bit of information. It was almost noon, and his precious time was slipping away. Come in a moment, Mr. Whaley, he said on second thoughts. I want you to listen to a problem I shall pose for Mr. Vance. I wish to demolish the hull of a sunken ship, Mr. Whaley. Obviously I cannot use fire or the sledges and crowbars of the shipbreakers. The question I put to Mr. Vance is how I can place and ignite a sufficient quantity of powder to accomplish my purpose. He saw a flash of comprehension cross the sullen face with its broad cleft chin and rigid mouth. Van still appeared baffled. During a previous commission, Merriweather went on, my first lieutenant accomplished an underwater explosion at a distance of several leagues by means of a mechanical timing device. But such refinements are not necessary in the present instance, in my opinion. How deep is the hole? At least he had Whaley's attention. Roughly three and a half fathoms. And how large? Two-thirds the size of Pitt. Whaley shifted his gaze to focus on the left upper corner of the day cabin, lips moving soundlessly. Merriweather sat back, hearing the tick of the clock on the bulkhead as time moved remorselessly towards the day after tomorrow, when he would have to admit his failure. In water that shallow, a deal of the force would go up, said Whaley in a musing tone. Merriweather could remember McClellan saying almost the same thing when confronted with a similar problem at Calcutta almost three years ago. Possibly this fellow knew something. He could only hope. If the hulk is half on its side, and there's an open hatch amidships, if that will help any. Might serve to confine the explosion more effectively if we can place the charge inside the hull. He seemed to reach a decision, and turned his gaze back to Merriweather. Two hundred pounds of powder might do the job, so I'll use four to make sure. Quick match still burns at five seconds, and slow match at five minutes to the foot, doesn't it, Vance? Er, uh, yes, sir. Least it did the last I timed a length. You know, Captain, in 96, the first full year I was in the Marine, I served a tour as aide to old Captain Folger, the reckoned salvage master for the company at Surat. The Gem of India... First voyage out, capsized and sunk crossways of the fairway into the anchorage. We had to demolish her to get the homeward-bound convoy out. Three separate times we exploded a barrel of powder in her before she broke open. Whaley paused, then said briskly, I'll need Vance here, the cooper and carpenter. He went out in his short, brisk gait with Vance at his heels. You never know until you ask, Merriweather decided, as he watched the pair go out. If the obstacle barring entry to the channel Dobbs had discovered could be removed, he was prepared to risk the ship in an effort to end this affair in short order. He remembered Seaton's grisly proposal again with horror after seeing on his own deck the children who would suffer the fate he advocated. Even if the way should be cleared by demolition of the wreck, there was the very real hazard of stranding at a point where it might be impossible to kedge off the frigate, and it might be overwhelmed by an attack in the helpless interval from the shore in small craft, a favourite method of the Joasmis. To compound the problem, there were still the light batteries commanding the westward approaches to the beach within easy range. These factors had to be weighed against the enormous advantage to be gained by bringing eighteen thirty-two pounders plus the two long nines within carronade reach of the town, shooting through flimsy walls into the backside of the citadel. If he could bring his broadsides to bear, 
he could make the town and fortress untenable in a fraction of the time required to transport his siege battery ashore, let alone enlarging the breach to practical proportions. He temporized, unwilling yet to make a decision on this rash venture. But on the chance that the passage would prove practicable, he sent for Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs, will you sound out the channel and mark it with boys? I think a length of timber anchor with a stone will be sufficient. No need to go beyond the final turn, too close to the battery. The young man brightened. At least his discovery was not forgotten. It was almost mid-afternoon before the first 32-pounder was finally loaded and secured in its barge. Merriweather was on deck to see the completion of the operation, but not to supervise. The boatswain knew his trade, and had rigged the elaborate skein of spars, stays, preventers and tackles, first to lift, then to swing out and finally to lower the ponderous weapon to its platform in the barge. This was child's play compared to the effort that would be required to move the piece nearly half a mile through the sand to its emplacement. He turned away, shaking his head in frustration. At this rate, he would be hard put even to have the siege battery in action before his deadline. He saw Whaley coming aft, threading through the maze of gear on deck. Captain, you might take a look at the lash up we have put together before we put the lid on. They walked forward to where a large water cask rested on the deck. Since gunpowder has great bulk for its weight, I had to put enough shot in the bottom to make sure it sinks. Then there's a partition, and the rest of the cask almost to the top lined with tarred canvas to make sure she stays dry. Then another partition, and this small space below the head filled with sand. Merriweather could see the length of slow match pressed into the sand just within the circumference of the barrel. Six feet of slow and a foot of quick into the powder, and it should give us half an hour to place the charge and retreat. Whaley was fairly beaming with pride of creation. He addressed the cooper. All right, lead the end of the slow match into this hole and button her up. Be sure you have a bung that's a tight enough fit. And bring your tinder box, Mr. Vance. A sudden complication occurred to Merriweather. Dobbs still had the water glass away in the quarter deck placing his boys yet the four hundred weight of powder would have to be lowered through the hatch, where it would have its maximum effect. He called Marlow over and directed him to hoist the recall for the quarter boat. By the time the launch reached the wreck, the quarter boat had joined it. The cask was lifted over the bow of the launch, the bottom just touching the water, supported by a line running through the fair lead and snubbed to the bits. Let's get as close to the spot as possible before you light off that fuse, Mr. Whaley, Merriweather commanded, seeing the gunner beginning to strike flint and steel into his tinderbox. He transferred to the quarterboat and hung over the gunnels to peer into the water glass. Give way, handsomely, port a point, steady, stop. With the light now coming from the west, he could see the hatch's outline much more clearly than this morning. All right, light her off. The gunner had ignited his tinder, and now transferred the fire to a piece of slow match. When it was burning cleanly, he handed it to Whaley, who applied it to the end of the match protruding through the bunghole. It took fire shooting off smoke and a shower of sparks as the first lieutenant observed it critically, then blew on it. Satisfied, he turned to the cooper. Drive on your bung. It was the work of a moment to hammer it in, then smear a handful of tar over it. Now, Captain, are you ready to guide it down? The sooner we get it placed, the better, because that much is generating a deal of heat in that small space in spite of the sand and the fire might jump. Lower the cask, handsomely. 
Through the water glass, Merriweather watched it sink as the boatswain's mate played out the line, leaving a trail of bubbles in the clear water. He hoped this was not evidence of air escaping from the cask to be replaced by water. Belay! The barrel was about halfway to the canted deck, but the line was beginning to slant to the west. There must be an appreciable current running across the hulk. Come ahead slow! The oars dipped. Lower away. The cask was approaching the hatch, streaming more noticeably to the westward. The current along the bottom accounted for the existence of the channel. It had been dug and scoured out as though with a spade. Now, let her down easy. The bottom hung for just an instant on the combing, then slid out of sight into the hold. A moment later, the line went slack. She's touched bottom, sir. Very good. Now tie a boy to that line. If it doesn't explode, we might want to bring it up again. Not me, said Whaley fervently. That damn fuse might smolder half a day in a spot the saltpeter didn't penetrate, then burn again. Give way. The hands required no urging. The launch was drawing near Pitt, and the faster quarterboat a half mile into the channel to complete its marking, when the thing exploded. Four hundred pounds of powder under twenty feet of water inside a waterlogged wooden hull generates fearsome forces when it explodes. Confined by the incompressible water, much of the force is upward, but expanding in the shape of a cone as it rises. And, of course, the timbers against which the cask rested transmitted the shock to still other beams and planks to which they were fastened. A great column of water rose from the sea, flecked with darker objects which must be wood fragments, and they heard the muffled explosion an appreciable interval after the boat danced from the shock transmitted through the sea. Twenty-nine minutes, said Whaley with satisfaction looking up from his watch. Shall we go back? The water may stay murky for a bit. The launch encountered the expanding concentric circles of waves halfway back to the site, and pitched as it pulled through them. There was a wide area of discoloured water to mark the point of the explosion. Merriweather found the water glass quite useless and put a seaman in the bow with a lead line. There were very few fragments of timber floating, but this would be natural enough since the hulk must have been thoroughly waterlogged. There was a steady chant of three and a half fathoms as they rode through the centre of the discoloration towards Dobbs's first boy. Now come about, Merriweather told the coxswain. The soundings soon disclosed that the bow and stern of the wreck were still in place, but the waist had vanished. There appeared to be a good twenty-five yards blasted out of the hulk to provide a passage for Pitt. With careful handling and a calm sea, she might slip through. Satisfied, he gave the order to return to the ship. He had one more task to complete before dark. That was a magnificent accomplishment, Mr. Whaley. My heartiest congratulations. The officer actually looked embarrassed at the words of praise. Merriweather realized that he had committed himself. He was determined to take the risk, barring some other obstacle located by Dobbs. As the boat approached the ship, the second lighter, burdened by its siege gun, was just pulling away towards the beach. Well, let it go. There were enough others in pit to do the job if he could bring them within range. He sought out the carpenter. No rest for the weary, Mr. Svensson. I want a Danube rudder rigged. What, sir? An extension fished onto the rudder so as to increase its area by at least half again. I need more control of the ship. Oh, you mean what we call it in Sweden? He paused, evidently searching for the correct word in English, then continued. I think a salmon tail. Whatever its name, you understand what I want. Oh, yes, sir. 
such an extension would be much easier to control than the half-submerged hogshead streamed astern that the old master's mate at Calcutta, Jenkins, had described to him two years ago, and he would have to steer small to negotiate that winding channel. He called a sweating bosun Caldwell over. Knock off hoisting out the third gun. Tomorrow is soon enough. He might regret the act, but moving more guns ashore was useless at this late hour. He would sink or swim on his ability to take Pitt through the winding channel tomorrow. He saw Dobbs come back on board dripping with sweat. Did you find any more obstacles? No, sir. I think we will have at least two feet under the keel all the way. Merriweather was beginning to feel the reckless exhilaration he had experienced the year before last, when he led his party of marines ashore to march through the streets of Canton to the sound of drums and bugles, in violation of the laws of China. But it was entirely possible that this action could lead to another court of inquiry, in view of the temper of the tripartite command of the combined operation. It is too near dark to move tonight. We will go in on the morning tide. He saw the purser emerge from the galley. There had been snacks for the hands at intervals during the long arduous day, but no regular meal served, and they deserved a treat. Mr. Davis, you may serve out a double ration of spirits before mess. The cheers were deafening, but a sudden disquieting thought struck him. The women and children. He cursed himself for his preoccupation during the day. Seaton should have been notified long since to remove them to another place of safety. He plunged below to dash off the urgent request, and sent Hamlin off in the gig to deliver it in the imam's camp. An hour later, Merriweather was relaxing in the cabin after a comfortable dinner when he heard the boatswain's pipe, and a moment later the messenger knocked and entered. Sir, Mr. McCamey reports Captain Seaton of the Marine is coming on board. Very well, I'll come. Courtesy demanded that he meet the officer on deck, though he had no desire to see the man again after the bitter session before dawn this morning. Seaton came up the ladder nimbly enough as Merriweather stepped forward, opening his mouth to utter the hackneyed platitudes of welcome, difficult though it might be. Aha! cried Seaton. There you are, Merriweather, goddamn your eyes! His eyes were blazing with fury in the lantern light, and there were hectic red spots on either cheek. McCamey and the deck watch were in easy earshot, staring with astonishment at the confrontation. Come below, Seaton. No need to entertain the hands on deck. He stood aside, gesturing aft. The smell of brandy on Seaton's breath was unmistakable. Tea? Merriweather inquired politely on reaching his cabin. Seaton shook his head and stood facing Merriweather across the desk. There was an appreciable interval, as though the man were gathering his forces. Then Seaton spoke. I do not know your motives, mister, but of the senior officers in this expedition, I thought I could rely at least upon a fellow marine officer. You have failed me, Merriweather, failed me most miserably, a fact that I feel compelled to bring to the attention of Bombay at the earliest practicable moment. But for your sea-lawyer arguments this morning, we should be in possession of Rasul Kaimar by now. He paused to catch his breath, and Merriweather seized the moment. Captain, your scheme violates all the laws of war and of humanity. It degrades the British forces to the level of barbarians. I intend, Seaton shrilled on, to see that you are cashiered and broken not only for insubordination to an officer years your senior in the Marine, but for incompetence as well. I am informed that you have not yet set the siege battery ashore. And then you have the impertinence to send me orders by an impudent midshipman to remove my hostages from this ship, for what reason I cannot conceive. B. 
Because I am taking this ship into action against the fortress within the next twelve hours, Meriwether said. I think your hostages would be of little value to you dead from enemy fire. For that reason, whether you concur or not, I shall see them removed to another ship tonight. I recommend one of the empty transports, and I have the launch alongside to take you and the hostages to her. You are a madman, said Seaton flatly. You have lost your mind. There is no possible way you can bring this frigate within range of the fort. Let me be the judge of that. And now, I must insist that you embark your party. Merriweather felt exhaustion flood through his body. It had been a strenuous period. He could not call it a day, not so much from physical exertion, but from the stress generated by the destruction of the siege battery, the bitter counsel following. He rang the bell, and Sang soon brought a pot of coffee while Merriweather began to write his report. An hour later, he seemed to have revived a bit, and, the report finished, began a letter to Caroline. It must be almost her time, he computed, wondering whether she still was thriving, and what the child might be, son or daughter, vigorous or feeble, or even born dead. He scratched off a few lines, and the quill snapped in the middle of a word. There were other pens sharpened in the shot bowl, but he threw the useless nib away, and collapsed fully clothed on the cot. By four bells in the morning watch the hands had been fed, the launch and cutter manned, and special sea details were stationed fore and aft to stand by bower and stern anchors. The tide had been making for almost two hours. The high was predicted by Dobbs's calculations to be at close to two bells in the forenoon watch, and the wind was light but steady out of the west-northwest. Merriweather sniffed the morning air and looked out at the massive structure of Rasul Kaimar, now outlined against the rising sun, wondering if he could indeed navigate pit across those two miles of shallows. Whaley came up to make his report. All stations manned and ready, sir. Both anchors are at short stay. Hands are standing by to set the jib, main and mizzen staysails and spanker. These four sails comprised only a fraction of Pitt's canvas, but they had the advantage of converting her into a fore-and-aft rigged vessel with the ease and speed of handling sheets, rather than the slower bracing about of her yards in these narrow waters. Very well, Mr. Whaley. You may weigh the bower anchor. As Whaley hurried forward, Merriweather felt a thrill of anticipation as the desperate venture began. Pass the word to the boats to take a strain. The launch and cutter, with their oars double-banked, were linked in tandem to the light cable leading through the eyes of the ship. Dobbs, with a compass in the quarter-deck, to show the way. Stand by to set sail. Weigh the stern anchor. The leading boatswain's mate delivered a volley of reports as the windlass clanked around. She straight up and down, breaking ground. Anchors away. The die was cast. The ship was under way. He climbed to a point of vantage in the starboard mizzen ratlins a dozen feet above the deck. Sheet home, roared Merriweather. Port your helm. Course northeast. Launch and cutter give way. The pulling boats took a strain. The four sails filled, and Pitt came sluggishly around to the point of entry into the channel. God grant that no rib or timber still protruded from the sand in the narrow gap blasted in the wreck, to plunge like a stiletto into the ship's bottom. She passed through but he could see from this height the dark shadow of the remaining bow structure of the hulk slide by a dozen feet to starboard. Change course! Steer north, northeast! The ship inched along the channel to the first turn east in the sprawling reversed S of the approach to Russell Kaimar, and then began to pick up speed as she came almost before the wind. 
The launch and cutter were hard-pressed to stay ahead of her. Take in both staysails! Under jib and spanker, Pitt crept almost south towards the final bend in the channel that would take her to a position just off the town. If she grounded, he wanted it to be as gently as possible with the tide still rising. Coming out of the bend, he would have to jibe. Mr. Corwell, extra hands to the jib and spanker sheets. It might be better to man-handle the sails to the opposite tack than have them go over with a rush as the ship came out of the bend. Haul over! With the sheets snubbed, the sails were hauled back against the wind, held there as Pitt straightened out. Then the sheets paid out again as she settled close-hauled on the port tack. Dobbs was still ahead in the quarterboat, two leadsmen sounding the way to the ship's final berth. Another hundred yards, and the light battery on the beach opened fire from its revetments with a salvo. Mr. Larkin, see what you can do for that battery. The gun crew hauled the forward pivot around. The first shot was in line but high, dashing up a gout of sand behind the battery. The second had the range, but with the ship changing course was right of the target. The third struck in the centre of the revetment, overturning a gun, and there was a general exodus of white-clad artillerymen from the battery and across the beach into the city. A cheer went from Pitt's hands. Men had appeared on the rooftops of the houses along the sea, shaking long guns in the air in defiance and firing, but the range was far too great for their fire locks. Merriweather looked at his timepiece just past one bell in the forenoon watch. The interval of high tide should endure almost another hour, and he felt compelled to try to turn the ship now so as to be in a position to stand out the way he had come before going into action. The channel was far too narrow for a conventional turn, but here at slack tide he should be able to wind her about her stern anchor dropped underfoot as a pivot with the pulling boats. In the middle of the manoeuvre his heart came up into his throat as he felt the stern touch bottom with the ship squarely across the channel. She paused, scraped, paused again, then broke loose from the clutching sands and came on about to anchor bow and stern headed south. Thank God she was lighter by two guns and their ammunition. Merriweather found himself drenched with sweat and quite drained of vitality. He turned to see Whaley in like condition, wearing a wan grin as he mopped his streaming face. Now their efforts would be put to the final test. You may commence firing when ready, Mr. Larkin. It was almost an anticlimax when the first broadside thundered out just as two bells in the forenoon watch sounded. 594 pounds of iron delivered at near point-blank range from 1832 pounders and two nine-pounders was devastating. By the time the fourth broadside had been fired, the buildings forming the seaward wall of Rasul Kaimar were a shambles. The soldiers on the rooftops had vanished, masonry walls had collapsed, and the place had become a hellhole with thirty-two pounder balls ricocheting through the narrow streets. Merriweather remained perched in the ratlins to observe the effect of the bombardment, watching between shots the activity on deck as the guns were served. The concentrated power of efficiently worked guns mounted in a ship was an awesome thing, far more deadly than any siege battery that might be transported ashore. He remarked the smooth teamwork of the gun crews, the darting movements of the powder monkeys as they delivered fresh charges, and remembered that no man had been brought to the mast since their arrival here. In spite of the heat and the hard labours on board and ashore, spirits appeared high. He decided that this crew would do. He heard a hail from the lookout at the cross trees of the mainmast, but he could not understand him and beckoned the man down just as the fifth broadside fired. Sir, the Arabs are abandoning the fort. Where are they going? Why, across the lagoon in boats, some of them, 
and the others around the beach to the south. I could see them streaming over the hills to the east by the hundreds. Women and children, yes, and soldiers too. Merriweather considered the situation. The guns, after half a dozen broadsides in rapid succession, were getting too hot for safety. He must reduce the rate of fire, keeping up just enough to discourage any stragglers in the town or citadel, and the hands must be fed. He signalled to Larkin and Whaley, then sent the messenger for the purser. Reduce the rate of fire to one section every five minutes, Mr. Larkin. It was near enough noon, and he turned to the purser. Feed the starboard watch, Mr. Davis, and then have it relieve the port. And to Whaley, when the hands are fed, I want a landing force of twenty-five steady men told off. Muskets and bayonets for fifteen, pistols and cutlasses for the rest. Oh, yes, and a large-sized marine ensign. He saw Midshipman Marlow standing by, round hat in hand. Mr. Marlow, find Mr. Hamlin, and both of you equip yourselves for duty with the landing force. Merriweather went below to eat a light lunch, for it would not be wise to dine at length before the expedition in the blazing midday sun. Sang had laid out his pistols, freshly loaded and primed, his sword and landing force boots still ripe with the sweat of two days ago. He chose the broad-brimmed straw hat with its wetted neck flap and decided to leave off the sword. The gun still shook the ship at five-minute intervals, methodically working across the backside of the fort, now exposed by the demolition of most of the dwellings screening it. The masthead reported that the stream of refugees had diminished to a trickle. They must be heading for the smaller town of Ram, several miles to the northeast, but also heavily fortified. He waited until two bells in the afternoon watch to permit the town to be fully evacuated before ordering a ceasefire, then called away the landing force to row to the beach just south of the citadel, where the first broadsides had been concentrated. Form up in two sections, he told the midshipmen. Have the men load their weapons. Here, close at hand, he saw why the seaward walls had crumbled so quickly under the gunfire. What had appeared from a distance to be stone was in actuality sun-dried bricks made of a white clay in many instances, and whole walls had simply disintegrated at the passage of a thirty-two-pound shot. The party made its cautious way across the rubble, through what had been a substantial dwelling in which clothing, smashed furniture, dried fruits and splintered roof beams mingled with sharded tiles to emerge in a narrow street. Merriweather was alert for the slightest movement, it was one thing for these pirates to flee the deadly impersonal round iron balls howling through the town in horrendous showers of shattered stone and splinters, and quite another to find a lightly armed party of infidels within arm's reach. He saw the flicker of a movement in the doorway of an almost intact house a hundred feet down the alley, and held up his hand to check his force, motioning his men to take shelter in doorways and alcoves. He drew one double pistol, cocked it, and with two musketeers edged along the ruined walls until he was only a few feet away. There was another flicker of movement, a querulous cry, and he saw a gnarled claw of a hand scrabbling at the edge of the door. He leaped forward, aiming the pistol through the door. They were pitiful specimens, two old cronies, wrinkled, almost blind and so feeble they could no longer stand or walk. They held up their hands imploringly, making unintelligible sounds, then pointed to what appeared to be a cistern. Draw them a jug of water, Berryweather told Marlow, and see if there is any food in that cupboard. The party pressed on, heading for the main entrance to the northern citadel. They passed a dozen bodies in the wreckage who already covered with flies, and rescued a man still alive, pinned down by a beam across his legs. 
The red flag of the Joasmis still flew defiantly from the west tower, but inside the place was a ruin. Guns dismounted and bodies of soldiers numbering in the hundreds strewn through the debris. The outer walls to the north were quarried stone five feet thick, but the walls on the town side had been economically constructed of sun-dried brick in the secure belief that no enemy could approach from that quarter. I want that flag struck, Mr. Hamlin. And then a thought came to him. The arrogance and high-handed conduct of Dunbar, Smith and Seaton still rankled, and Merriweather decided to offer them an affront to which they could take no official exception. The flagstaff was substantial, almost of to-gallant mast proportions, round and smooth. Merriweather saw Ames, the top man he had transferred out of Osborne's mizzen top into the master at arms force. Ames, can you nail this ensign to the mast above the pirate rag? Yes, sir, he said almost contemptuously at the implied doubt of his abilities. They found iron nails in the debris as Ames removed his shoes and rolled his trousers above his knees. Another thought struck Merriweather. Wait a moment. He looked among the shattered lockers that had held supplies for the guns and soon found what he was looking for, a pot of grease still half full, used by the Joasmi gunners to lubricate the axles and trunnion gudgeons on the carriages. Hang this on your belt, and once you've nailed both flags to the mast, make sure that you smear a liberal dose on it as you come down. The man's face creased into a delighted grin as the import of the order sunk in. Ames shimmied up the flagstaff nimbly as a monkey. The folded ensign tucked inside his shirt, the pot of grease hung on his belt, nails in his mouth, the protruding points giving him the expression of a grinning cat. He hammered them home first through the ensign, then the pirate flag, into the seasoned wood with the butt of his pistol, to leave the Bombay Marines thirteen red and white stripes quartered by a red cross, St. George's cross in the canton, sparkling above the red Joasmi flag. Merriweather looked up, feeling exhilaration at the brave display, the conqueror's badge of triumph then out over the parapet to see the army troops advancing, skirmishers in the van, toward the fort. The force stopped in the shelter of the low wall across the spit, and a single officer under a flag of truce advanced towards the fort. When he reached a point about a hundred yards away, he recognised the young subaltern aide-de-camp who had brought Colonel Smith's summons a few days ago. He stepped to the parapet, and shouted through cupped hands. Tell Colonel Smith we hold the town. The officer shook his head and advanced another forty paces, where Merriweather repeated his message. Evidently, it was understood, for the aide saluted, about-faced and marched back to the main body of troops. It was more than a quarter of an hour before Smith and Dunbar appeared at the sally port in the eastern wall of the fortress, at the head of three companies of the 65th. The colonel wore a scarlet coat in spite of the heat, and had his sword buckled on, evidently in anticipation of a formal surrender ceremony. "'Welcome, gentlemen, to the citadel of Russell Kaimar, said Merriweather in ringing tones. Smith looked at the carnage among the batteries and the devastation in the fort with an expression of disbelief. You did this in a matter of two hours? he demanded. Yes, Colonel. Merriweather realized that he had just demonstrated to Smith a classic example of sea power, the ability of a man of war to transport to a strategic point a concentration of guns of far greater caliber and destructive power than any invading land force could hope to manage. I wouldn't believe it if I had not seen it. Smith shook his head and an expression of determination crossed his face. He turned to speak inaudibly to his aide-de-camp. "'Well done, Merriweather,' said Dunbar, offering his hand. "'I had no expectation that you could ever bring that frigate in so close. 
He looked at Smith with an expression of puzzlement as his aide departed at a canter, gave a start, and turned hastily to speak inaudibly to his own midshipman. Merriweather had a clear premonition of the import of each order that had been issued, and decided that he should be absent when the time for execution arrived. He gave a covert hand signal to Hamlin to move out with the landing force. Gentlemen, I believe this concludes my mission in this operation, and I shall return to my ship to make preparation for moving her out to a safer anchorage on the ebb tomorrow. He saluted smartly, and hastened out across the rubble to overtake his party. Halfway back to Pitt, Merriweather could still see the two knots of contestants on the top of the tower, face to face, arms waving, one attired in the blue and gold of the Royal Navy, the other in the scarlet and white of His Majesty's sixty-fifth foot. The Navy had a blue ensign and the Army its regimental standard in hand. Just before the launch came alongside the ship, he saw the blue and gold cluster about the base of the mast, while the scarlet and white withdrew to stand at one side. Evidently Dunbar, with his temporary appointment as a Commodore, had prevailed over a stubborn Colonel Lionel Smith. As he came on deck, he snatched the glass from its bracket to focus again on the scene. One seaman was standing on the shoulders of another, arms about the flagstaff, scrabbling hopelessly as he made the effort to climb the greased pole. He remained so for a long moment, then slid down. The Bombay marine colours still shimmered triumphantly in the breeze, above the blood-red Joasmi banner on the citadel of Rasul Kaimar. Merriweather went below. Part 2 Action at Aden Merriweather could not imagine what Buttram was talking about. I haven't the foggiest notion of your meaning, Doctor. Why, it is Caroline's time by my computations. Surely this week, mayhap this very day. Realization only then had flooded into Merriweather. Caroline had not entered his mind since that night he had commenced the letter to be abandoned in his exhaustion. She could even now be experiencing the agonies of childbirth. Well, Doctor, there is little enough I could do if I were in Calcutta. He comforted himself with the recollection that Caroline had spoken for the services of the most competent midwife in the British community, with a physician standing by should his services be required. The messenger of the watch knocked and entered to hand over a sealed missive. Please be advised that I intend to explode the magazines under Ras ul Khaimah at precisely six post meridian this date. S. Smith, commanding His Majesty's land forces. The event was only a half hour away by Merriwether's timepiece, and it should be a sight to see from the safety of two miles away. Tell Mr. Marlowe to pass the word for all hands, and I'll come on deck when they have assembled. He passed the message to Buttram. I don't believe anyone will want to miss this. There had been nearly forty tons of powder found stored in the magazines beneath the fortress. The town itself had held almost nothing of value. Its treasures evidently had been removed at first sight of the invasion fleet, though a sergeant of the 65th was rumoured to have found a cache of jewels under a flagstone in the courtyard of the house of Sheikh Hussein bin Ali. It had been an unprofitable expedition. The company paid prize money only for vessels brought in and sold, not those sunk or burned. Now Smith evidently was ready to carry out the final direction in the operation order. Raise Russell Kaimar to the ground. The messenger knocked again. Hands are formed up, sir. The fire in the slow match must even now be creeping towards the powder trains leading into the magazine. High time to get on deck himself. It was a spectacular event. One moment the tower was visible, the Bombay Marine ensign still flying proudly above the red Joasmi flag. Then it blurred, seemed to hang a moment in the air, and disintegrated as a huge orange pillar of fire and smoke shot a thousand feet into the air. 
Seconds later, the shock waves set Pitt to rocking, and the sound of the explosion deafened them. Every dwelling, stone or brick within a quarter of a mile of the citadel of Pitt to have collapsed as though made of cards. Merriweather took his fingers from his ears and picked up the glass. There was still fire in the enormous crater, but there was little left to burn. A cheer went up from the hands to see the hated stronghold of the enemy totally destroyed, and Merriweather dismissed them from quarters. He had led his below and soon was able to propose a toast. Gentlemen, the successful completion of our mission is occasion enough for this celebration. However, first I give you the officer who discovered the path by which we were able to succeed, Lieutenant Dobbs. Dobbs's face was red before Merriweather had half completed the toast, but he was modest enough as he accepted congratulations. And now to Lieutenant Whaley, who unlocked the gate that barred our way to the fortress. The officers drank again with enthusiasm. All present were relieved that a period of strenuous and exacting duty had ended and indulged themselves accordingly. Whaley came across the cabin just before Sang announced that dinner was served. The dispatch brig courier came to anchor just before I left the deck. Very well. And now, gentlemen, shall we dine? It had been a long, uproariously happy evening. Now on deck, with the heat already growing oppressive, Merriweather massaged the back of his head as though that would heal the ache. Still thankful that the disagreeable operation, with its cold-bloodedly ambitious commanders, was, for practical purposes, concluded. He went below to drink the coffee he had poured out to cool, and filled the cup again. The ache had diminished, and he had taken breakfast when Davis came in with the official pouch and a slender packet of letters in his hand. With your leave, sir, I'll open this now. He unlocked the pouch and laid out an assortment of communications bearing the seal of the Marine. And here is your personal mail, sir. Merriweather saw the round hand of Caroline in the superscription on three letters, and hastened to break the seal. The first was dated February the 22nd. My dearest husband, I find myself quite unable to sleep this night. I am possessed with terror that you are in great danger and pray for your safety. Merriweather looked back at the date. February the 22nd. Then he recalled, and it was the early morning of the mutiny. Was Caroline clairvoyant? He read on. Our child is becoming more active. There was more. Gossip of Calcutta, the imminent removal of Mary Wilkins and McClellan to his new post of Bombay. He picked up the second letter. More of the same, lacking the foreboding. The third letter was only a month old. Caroline was again despondent. I think the day shall never come. Well, little enough in the way of news. He had, of course, written her from Bombay and again from Muscat, but he could salve his conscience a bit with the thought that nothing momentous had occurred during his absence. He sighed and turned his attention to the stack of marine correspondence, slitting open the dispatches in reverse order of the dates inscribed on the wrappers. The first communication was terse to the point of rudeness. Percival Merriweather, Master and Commandant, the Honourable Company's ship Pitt. When directed by the Commander, Naval Forces, Combined Expedition to Ras ul Khaimah, and when in all respects ready for sea, you are required and requested to proceed in consort with the Honourable Company's sloops Comet and Vigilant to the Red Sea and the port of Jeddah. There you will report your arrival to the senior officer present representing the Commodore acting as the deputy of the company in executing its duties as Admiral of the Mughal. Merriweather came to a halt. Admiral of the Mughal. Deputy of the company. Then he realized that these were only the stilted formal terminology for the post of Commodore at Surat, the most lucrative single office in the company hierarchy. Fifty years ago, 
Commodore Watson had led the Marine forces against the Sidi, hereditary Lord High Admiral of the Mughal fleet, suppressed his revolt against the Mughal and his Nawad, and taken his seat at Surak Castle. By the terms of the treaty with the great Mughal, the C.D. was forever stripped of the dignity and emoluments of his high office, and the post with its revenues was conferred upon the company. The senior commodore of the Bombay Marine was assigned annually to administer the office as deputy for the company. The appointment was for only the one year, but the perquisites and fees accruing to him for enforcement of customs, convoy, and other naval services often exceeded one hundred thousand rupees, enabling the fortunate incumbent to retire to England a wealthy man. It was the ambition of every officer entering the Marine to cap his career with the appointment, since it carried with it luxurious quarters in Surak Castle and the Commodore's own flagship flying the Marine's colours at the peak and the Mughal's banner at the main. He read on, And the company's agent ashore, when the convoy shall have assembled and embarked its passengers, you are further required and requested to assume command of the naval escort and without fail to bring said ship safely to Surat. This twenty-third day of March, 1808, by direction of the Superintendent of the Marine, S. Tollett, acting. Merriweather was puzzled. The annual pilgrimage to Mecca, with the substantial convoy escort fees exacted by the Commodore at Surat, was one of the most profitable sources of his revenues. He employed a number of well-armed, handy vessels to furnish the escort, and he could recall no previous instance in which Bombay Castle had been required to supply three of its cruisers for this duty. And the tone of the order was out of character for Tollett. It was what Commodore Land had often termed a do-or-be-damned order in the days of Governor-General Sir George Barlow at Calcutta, requiring an officer to succeed at his peril in a mission. Well, he thought, he had had such a mission once before, I would have failed to bring back the pirate Abercrombie but for the marksmanship of Larkin and McClellan. He shook his head, wondering what might lie behind the harsh order, then turned his attention to the enclosures. The first was in a neat clerkly hand entitled Situation Estimate, Central and Western India, Spring 1808. He looked for the signature. A. Napier, Colonel Aide de Camp to His Excellency the Governor General. Who? Then Merriweather placed the man. He had met Napier at one of Barlow's receptions, a small ginger haired man with the face of a fox and eyes that roved constantly, scanning his surroundings with an intensity that was disquieting. Napier had been a leftover from the Wellesley regime. A man of such accomplishments and understanding of the tangled native political situation as to make him valuable enough to survive three changes of administration. He turned back to read the text. Jasvant Raul Holkar of Rajputana remains the single most influential prince among the Maharata Confederation since the Treaty of 1805. The policy of concession and forbearance conceived by Lord Cornwallis and continued by Barlow has influenced Holkar to keep the Marathas in check, and he has become a valuable ally of the company. Pierre Perron and Louis Bourquin have left his service, but a cadre of near a score of French officers continue to train Maratha troops, including strong elements of Pindarian Patan mercenaries who bear no loyalty to him. His lieutenants, Chitu, Wasil Mohammed and Karim Khan, lead forays into neighbouring states for massacre and plunder, but they do not molest the company's interests. The ports in the Gulf of Cambay give easy access to Rajputana from the Arabian Sea. The Nawab of Surat continues to be the firm ally of the company but our forces in the other ports of the Gulf are greatly diminished since Wellesley's departure. Merriweather paused to consider the baffling information contained in the simple didactic sentences. 
He had no real understanding of the matters the staff officer discussed. The company's military operations in the interior of India were so varied and complex, so many strange names of persons and places to remember, the bewildering unstable alliances that made a native prince an ally today and a blood enemy tomorrow, that he had never concerned himself with keeping abreast of such affairs far from the sea. Arthur Wellesley had made his reputation as a soldier in the brilliant succession of campaigns against these princely states under the patronage of his brother Richard, and had brought the company to the threshold of empire. He wondered briefly how Bonaparte might be faring with his Spanish adventure, and whether there was yet a possibility of an attack on India from a quarter other than through Persia. He turned his attention back to the monograph. Since Holkar poisoned his brother Kashi Rao and his nephew Kande Rao in 1806, there was no dissident element at his court until his former concubine Tulsi Bai and his illegitimate son by her, Malha Rao, returned from exile last summer. Holkar welcomed his son, now eighteen, since his legitimate son is simple, but not Tulsi and she returned to Surat where she solicited the support of the Nawab in a venture to overthrow Holkar and place her son on the throne. Gad thought Merriweather, this was blood and thunder intrigue fit for a penny dreadful presented as sober fact by a responsible senior officer. He read on, Madame Bai is reputed to be the product of a liaison between a Maratha woman of noble birth and a French officer, and she has strong allegiances to France. After her exile from Rajputana, she was the mistress of General Lamont, commandant of the garrison on Mauritius until his recall to France in 1806. She is a woman not only of beauty but of iron resolution, who is determined to put her son on the throne of Rajputana. Last year, Holkar sent his son Malharao on the pilgrimage to Mecca. Tulsi Bai joined him at Surat, and they will return in the convoy departing Jeddah in June. A bit of light began to glimmer as Merriweather read on. Our man in Port Louis reports that three frigates of thirty-six guns have been fitted out, together with four transports capable of carrying two battalions of French regulars for departure in May. Their initial destination is reputed to be the Gulf of Aden. The company must take the most stringent measures to prevent Tulsi Bai and Malha Rao from making contact with this force. Merriweather laughed bitterly as he tossed the sheet on his desk. The response of the superintendent of the marine to the most stringent measures was to dispatch a 36-gun frigate and two 14-gun sloops to oppose a force of nearly twice their firepower. But he could now comprehend the concern of the Governor-General. Holkar was a villain, but for the time he was the company's villain, and it had no desire that he be supplanted by a puppet controlled by a half-French adventurous. And Pitt had no charts of the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden in its allowance but it might be possible to borrow some from the Royal Navy. Merriweather picked up the next dispatch and slit the oilskin wrapper. It was a counterpart of orders to Lieutenant Joseph Whaley. When a relief as First Lieutenant in HCS Pitt is in all respects qualified, and when directed by its commanding officer, you will proceed to HCS Vigilant and assume command of that vessel. It was a mixed blessing. Whaley would no longer be his hair shirt in pit, but he would be in command of one of the ships of his squadron. He wondered for a moment whether the man had adjusted his philosophy of the enforcement of discipline. True, there had been far fewer cases brought to the mast, and no use of the cat since the abortive mutiny. Or had he merely conformed for the time to Merriweather's methods? He hoped it was the former. He must be able to rely upon Vigilant in the coming operation. He sent Sang to find Whaley. Congratulations, Captain, he greeted the officer, extending his hand. He saw the china-blue eyes light up as he handed him the order. 
then the face falls slightly as he read it. Well, I'm pleased enough, Captain, though I had hoped for the substantive rank, not just a courtesy title. I'm sure it will come soon enough with this command in your record, said Merriweather, despising himself for his casuistry. And your first duty will be to sail in company with Pitt and Comet to the Red Sea. I understand that Corcoran in Vigilant is going back to England for three years' leave. When may I be detached? Evidently Whaley had no more desire to remain in Pitt than Merriweather had for him to stay. As of now, said Merriweather, dipping his quill in the inkwell. Larkin was my first lieutenant for more than a year in Rapid, and is in all respects qualified for the post. But for the Torado worms, the American would be commanding his own vessel by now. Bad luck. Very good, sir. I'll get my kit together and be ready in an hour to read myself in. Merriweather turned his attention to the remaining dispatches. All routine, except some enterprising clerk of Bombay Castle, had sent three charts of the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. Merriweather had the gig called away, donned full dress and sword, and departed orders in hand to wait on Commodore Dunbar. He was back on board within the hour, just in time to offer Whaley the dignity of being transported to his new command in the gig. He shook the man's hand at the gangway as the watch rendered the honours to which his new status entitled him. Corcoran and Vigilant were well regarded in the Marine, and he hoped again that Whaley had moderated his opinions enough so that he would not turn her into a hell ship. Larkin knocked and came in, and Merriweather welcomed him warmly. Thank you, Captain. It has been a bit of a strain when you've been a first yourself to have to conform to some of Whaley's pet notions. But I never let myself have a crossword with him. And now, since we'll be short on officers, I consider Hamlin entirely qualified to stand a top watch underway. I shall undertake Midshipman Marlowe's further education in seamanship as junior in my watch, if this is acceptable with you. Entirely. Now we have orders to the Red Sea and Jeddah, and I want you to acquaint yourself with our mission. He handed over the order and situation estimate to Larkin and sat back to think of Caroline a moment while he read them. Corcoran had been commissioned in the Marine only four months earlier than Merriweather, and he wondered if this coming September he would actually request the leave and expend the vast sums necessary to transport himself, Caroline, and their child halfway around the world to England, for the three years that was his due. Oh, well, he would make the decision when the time came. He might be dead before this month was out if he encountered those French frigates. Larkin looked up. I haven't the foggiest notion of who these people are or where, but I gather we stop off this woman and her son from meeting with the frogs or be damned. Exactly. Now pass the word to make all preparations for getting underway and signal Comet and Vigilant, Captains, come on board. With the prevailing wind steady out of the southwest at this season, the squadron had to make a long reach south by east, almost to the equator, once it had cleared Cape Ras el Had and the Gulf of Oman, there to go about and set a course close hold for Cape Guadafui, the eastern tip of Africa. It was a pleasant voyage, the weather fine, only an occasional rain squall to mar the days and cooled the decks with fresh water. They passed huge rays basking on the surface that disappeared with a report like a cannon shot when disturbed. Shells of flying fish burst from the water to skim the wave tops ahead and beside the ship, iridescent bodies glittering in the sunlight only to plunge again into the sea. An occasional straggler misjudged his landing and came to rest flapping on deck, there instantly to become the prey of one or another of the ship's cats. Merriweather stood at the break of the poop in the shade cast by the spanker to watch the sport. 
Apparently every cat on board had come on deck from their usual haunts in the storerooms and holds in anticipation of a tasty morsel. Another fish skimmed over the bulwarks and skittered across the deck. There was a concerted rush for the prey, but one huge tom brusquely shouldered the others aside to seize the fish in its jaws, then crouched back and tail up, one clawed forepaw cocked, hissing around his prize, daring the others to dispute his title. Merriweather laughed at the little drama. The big cat was almost red in colour, arrogant and truculent in bearing and insatiably ravenous. Some months ago he had come out of the hold to adopt Sang, and soon made his quarters in the pantry, though he often could be found lounging on the transom in the cabin or even lapping up the dregs of tea from a cup forgotten on the desk. From his size, bearing and colour of hair, the resemblance was unmistakable and Merriweather to Sang's eye-rolling dismay at being reminded of his old master had christened him Abercrombie, after the red-bearded pirate he had fought to the death two years before. The cat treated him as an absolute equal occupant of the cabin, courteous but aloof and dignified, never deigning to rub against his ankles to wheedle a morsel, while Sang, as custodian of the keys to the pantry and victual locker, commanded his daily homage. Merriweather had never owned a pet of any kind. Cats had been forbidden at Bellflower House, and dogs kept only at the country seat of Sir Geoffrey Meigs during his childhood. He had rather enjoyed the association with the doughty, self-sufficient tomcat these past months. While he remained on deck, he kept an unobtrusive eye on Midshipman Hamlin, now standing a top watch underway in regular rotation. The young officer had stationed himself on the weather side just abaft the helm, where he had an unobstructed view forward. The boatswain's mate, a messenger of the watch, crouched a few feet forward with the relief quartermaster. There came the suggestion of a tremor in the main topsail, and Hamlin issued a quick command. The boatswain's mate loped forward, calling the watch to man the braces, and in a trice the sail was perfectly trimmed. Merriweather decided that Larkin had been entirely correct in his appraisal. This officer would do. He must remember to recommend him for the examination for second lieutenant at Bombay Castle next September. He looked out to see Comet on the starboard beam two cables length distant, then to port where Vigilant was equally on station, and went down to the cubby where Dobbs was plotting the morning star sights. Almost there, Captain. If my computations are correct, we should make landfall on Guadafui by tomorrow morning. Good. Merriweather examined the chart again. He had never actually entered the Red Sea, though he had been to the port of Aden a time or so in his younger days in the marine. Navigation in the narrow waters could be hazardous. The port of Jeddah in particular lay behind three parallel reefs, with only a narrow channel for entry. He hoped a pilot would be available to con the ship in with local knowledge. But he felt no need to worry yet. Even with Cape Guadafui in sight, the port would still be a good thousand miles away. Morale in Pitt appeared to be high. The back-breaking labours at Russell Kaimar had been taken in stride, and if there were still dissident hands in the ships, they concealed well their discontent. The frigate had been in commission near three years now, but never had been in action other than the few broadsides it had taken to overcome the fortress, with only a single salvo in return. It would be quite different to lie muzzle to muzzle with another ship of equal force. Shot crashing through the planking in showers of splinters, dead and wounded men underfoot and still have the will to serve the guns and work the ship. He saw as doctors Mefford and Buttram emerge from the companion. Good morning, Captain, said Mefford. We still have a dozen cases of dysentery some of the hands brought back from Rassel Kaimar. But this fresh air has done wonders. 
and we are marking them to return to light duty this morning. Very good, Doctor. Merriweather considered his own physical condition. The lassitude he had experienced during the winter and early spring had vanished since the departure from Russell Kaimar, and he had regained the weight lost on the Persian road last autumn. No nightmares came to haunt him. He felt entirely fit once more. He wondered if his escape from the domination of the tripartite command of the combined operation or the fresh sea air had wrought his cure. In any event, it was good to be his own master again, though under the most imperative of orders. He was ready to go below when Larkin came up. By the by, Captain, young Marlowe has been after me to establish a drill he calls Form Lion's Mouth. I never heard of the thing, but he says all of the smaller marine ships practice it. Merriweather searched his memory. He had served briefly as a boatswain's mate in a ten-gun snow years ago, and recollection slowly came to him. I think I know what it is, but it has been a long time since I've seen it done. As I recall, small vessels in danger of being overwhelmed by boarding had parties stationed fore or aft with a boat gun, four or six pounder loaded with loose musket balls. If the enemy got a foothold on deck, they fired the gun into them, then made a concerted charge with cutlasses on the survivors. None of the larger sloops or frigates use it any more, to my knowledge, and I had almost forgotten the manoeuvre. Of course, he came out of a bomb catch, where it must still be in fashion. Merriweather saw that the midshipman was bright and eager, evidently anxious to make an impression. It was unlikely that such a drill ever would be required in a frigate of Pitt's force. But it could do little harm to practice the thing. All right, I have no objection. Let him use the seamen afterguard and quarter-deck gunners for his party. No marines. They already have definite duties assigned in case of boardings. Larkin went forward, and Merriweather gave the matter no more thought until a morning or so later he saw a perspiring party of seamen dragging the little boat gun to the break of the poop, where priming powder flashed in the vent, and then charging down among the startled hands in the waist with bloodthirsty shouts brandishing cutlasses. Oh, Mr. Marlowe! The midshipman came over, his face shining with sweaty enthusiasm. Your drill was quite realistic. Tell me, have you ever seen it used in earnest? No, sir, but the captain of Vesuvius said he had back in 1805 against the Joasmes in the Gulf. If Pitt reached such dire straits, there would be little enough hope anyway, Merriweather decided. But he would not discourage the lad. Very good. Carry on. He went below to bring his journal up to date, thinking again of Caroline and their putative child. Pitt, Comet, and Vigilant lay at anchor at cable's length off Customs Island in the harbour of Jeddah, close to the four ten-gun snows that flew the burgee of the Commodore at Surat under the colours of the Bombay Marine. They had been the escort for the score of ships at anchor off the quay across the harbour which had brought upward of three thousand pilgrims to this port serving the holy city of Mecca. They made a motley fleet, ranging from a towering spick-and-span Indiaman to shabby country barks with patched sails. The visit to Mecca was easily the most important event in the lives of these devout Muslims, an end to justify a lifetime of scrimping and sacrifice to accumulate the substantial passage money exacted. The gig took Merriweather through the anchorage to a landing on the quay, passing close aboard the vessels, seeing the idling hands, mostly Laskers, lounging about the decks, awaiting the return of their passengers. He stepped ashore and looked about to get his bearings. The senior officer of the escort force had made his official call on Merriweather late yesterday afternoon almost as soon as the pilot had left Pitt. Lieutenant McCracken was a plump, jovial man a few years his elder, with an easy flow of gossip and small talk. 
He had put the officer at ease with a glass of Scotch whisky at his elbow to encourage the stream of information. No, Captain, there's little enough of trade here for the company. Mostly hide, skins, and tallow. But the people are too poor to buy many of our wares. We do have an agent ashore, an Anglo-Indian named Fitzgerald. His father was an Irish writer for the company, made his pile in private trade in gems, then legitimized the boy to take him back to England to be educated. He had influence enough to get him an appointment at Calcutta, but, of course, the English community would not accept a half-caste there. And he took this post where it didn't matter. McCracken laughed and sipped the whiskey appreciatively. It was McClellan's favourite brand. Merriweather was entirely familiar with the rigid colour line drawn in India. It was impossible for an Anglo-Indian to cross it. But this man had fared better than most half-castes, who were accounted Indians out here, in that he had been acknowledged and given an education. McCracken continued, He's married to a good woman has a child or so, and lives quite comfortably over in the town. Now Merriweather recognised the place some two hundred yards inland from the quay, a substantial white stone house of two storeys, surrounded by a whitewashed wall of sun-dried brick. The company's gridiron flag flew from a staff above the door, and there was a heavy door with a small barred grill set in the wall. He rang the bell that hung beside it, and an Arab boy responded. Mr. Fitzgerald, please. I am Captain Merriweather of the Bombay Marine. Fitzgerald proved to be a tall man with ruddy, regular features, fair hair, and side whiskers, possibly thirty years of age, who would have passed without remark on any street in London. The Irish blood had overwhelmed the Indian in him, and no trace of his maternal ancestry was apparent. Ah! Yes, Captain, he said in measured tones. I had word that the convoy escort would be reinforced. Bombay must have got the wind up. We had a report of a French privateer cruising off Socotra a month or so ago. Fitzgerald put him at ease in a comfortable chair. There were elaborate draperies on the walls, a punker swaying overhead and thick Persian rugs on the tiled floor. McCracken had been correct. The man indeed lived well. Yes, Mr. Fitzgerald, and is there any other intelligence I should have before departure? It was on the tip of Merriweather's tongue to amplify the question by volunteering the Governor-General's true concern in the premises. The man appeared safe enough, but some innate caution stopped him. No, I believe not. The last of the pilgrims are expected to return momentarily from Mecca. Of course, there usually are some festivals and entertainments before they embark. We have several Indians of high rank and their retainers who chartered the Indian man, Countess of Surrey, and the local nobility has plans to honour them. Merriweather wondered if young Malharao and his mother Tulsi Bai might be among the guests, then decided it made no difference. He had already written off the courtesy call. The man obviously had no information of value, and he intended to depart after only the politest of intervals. He heard a feminine voice behind him and saw Fitzgerald look past him. I'm sorry we intruded, Harry. I did not realise you had a visitor. Fitzgerald stood up, and Merriweather followed suit, turning towards the door. Two women in European dress were standing one behind the other in the entrance. One was a conventional housewifely type, round face, fair hair, moderately obese, thirtyish, entirely unremarkable in appearance. The second, a bit taller and older, was beautiful, a face moulded in classic plains, white skin with an undertone of ivory tint, Large sparkling brown eyes, dark hair parted in the centre and drawn to a knot at the back of her head. Merriweather saw her appraising gaze, bold, wise and penetrating, scan him from foot to head before a polite smile appeared. 
He had an uneasy sensation that he had somehow seen that face before. Not at all, my dear. Come in, said Fitzgerald easily. May I present Captain Percival Merriweather of the Honourable Company's Marine, my wife Claudia, and my sister Madame Bai. Enchanted, ladies, he managed. And now I am in the way. Not at all, Captain, said Mrs. Fitzgerald cheerfully. It is time for our elevenses, and I do so hope you will join us. Merriweather's first impulse had been to cut and run, as soon as courtesy permitted. But he decided that while it might serve no useful purpose, it could do little harm either to stay. We only see the same tired old faces here from one month to the next among the marine officers in the escort force, and they never seem to have any news, continued Mrs. Fitzgerald, showing animation in her round face. Perhaps you can describe the fashions in Bombay or Calcutta to Tulsi and me. Well, said Merriweather, yet a bit wary of encountering face to face the woman who was the subject of Colonel Napier's monograph. I have no conflicting duties, and am delighted to accept your kind invitation. He realized that Madame Bai had said nothing beyond the polite murmur acknowledging the introduction. She spoke now in a strong contralto. I too am weary of your officers who can converse only of their little world, as sure at to Jeddah and back, with never a word of what is taking place elsewhere. She moved gracefully to take the chair he offered, and Merriweather resumed his seat. I've enjoyed my visit with Harry, my half-brother. Actually, we had different fathers. I had not seen him since he was ten and took the opportunity to visit while my son made his pilgrimage. She made a sort of moo. But I am hungry for news of India. The Overland Mail brings us the London papers, but little from eastward. The words were commonplace enough, but he thought he detected the restless spirit behind the beautiful face. My news will be stale enough, he told her. I am more than three months out of Bombay. And I am dull, broke in Mrs. Fitzgerald over her shoulder. She was superintending two Arab girls at the sideboard. Fashion is my passion, and I pay little attention to political military affairs. But it is hard on Tulsi to have her find her news in the digest of dispatches to the India or Foreign Offices printed in a London paper. Halfway around the world, then almost as far back again. Two children, a girl about six and a boy, possibly four, had come in to stand unobtrusively on either side of their mother, faces raised expectantly below the sideboard. Ah, there, chaps, said Fitzgerald, holding out his arms. A kiss first. The children ran to him and he bust each in turn. Emily and young Harry, he told Merriweather proudly. Say good morning to the captain. The children responded gracefully and then went back to their mother to keep an anxious eye on the preparations in progress. Merriweather wondered if he might be the centre of such a familial scene in the not too distant future. The homely little by play had diverted his attention from Madame Bai. He now looked back to discover her studying him intently. In repose, her face assumed an expression of calculation, eyes now hooded and speculative, quite at variance with the mood it had expressed a moment ago. Her face altered at his glance, smiling again, as the maids began to serve the refreshments. He wondered again at the familiarity of the face. He was certain he had never encountered the woman before, and decided that she must resemble some portrait he had seen. The Elevenses proved to be a delicious repast. Tasty kickshaws, relishes, tidbits of choice fish, fowl and beast, even a plate of crumpets with the tea. It certainly would serve as his noon meal, Merriweather decided, regretfully declining a second serving. The conversation had dealt mostly with the children during the interval, but, surfeited, they now took their leave for siesta. 
as she turned away from the farewell, Madame Bai spoke again with an expression of ingenuous curiosity. The name, Merriweather, somehow strikes a chord of skimmed through the obstetrical details to come to the last year to Bombay. But I seem to associate it with Persia. I am just returned from the south coast of the Gulf and have several times visited the Empire in years past, he said a little brusquely. Not recently. She continued to look at him with a slight smile of speculation. And how does Lord Minto fare? I departed India when Wellesley was still called the new Governor-General. There have been Cornwallis and Barlow too since then. Why, very well, he replied. Of course, I only met Minto the one time some months ago. Will he renew Wellesley's policy of conquest and tribute? Or continue conciliation with the princely states as Cornwallis and Barlow have done? Merriweather was flustered at the question. It revealed a profounder knowledge of high political considerations than he would normally expect of a woman. He tried to remember some of the glib dinner-table assertions Percy had made to Macrae and him last summer during the voyaging comet to Bushir. I think Lord Minto is compelled to follow the policies fixed by the India Board. A glimmer of recollection came. The company may very well have almost run its course out here as the governing power of a subcontinent. Government is taking a much stronger part in its affairs. The India Board has strengthened its hand as witness Minto's appointment in preference to Barlow. He was president of the board, you know. He paused, seeing her rapt expression, and realized that he was telling her what she wanted to hear, not that it mattered. He hurried on, parroting Percy's exposition. And there is no logical reason why a nation of more than a hundred million persons should be governed by a private company. The company has managed to survive these two hundred years mainly by playing one native ruler off against another, keeping India fragmented and employing mercenaries and bribes to hold its pet princes in place. He did not quote her Percy's further quip. Why, if all the people of India could agree to piss at one time, they would sluice our few thousand British residents right into the sea, but rather concluded, carried to its logical conclusion, this policy might well at some point substitute a British emperor for the company's governmental functions and leave the princely states to rule their own internal affairs. He saw again that he had said the words Madame Bai wanted to hear, and suddenly knew why she appeared familiar to him. She wore the face of the deadly spider in his nightmare of last December. There were hoofbeats outside, the peal of the bell at the gate and Merriweather welcomed the interruption. Malha Rao was a slender, languid youth, resembling his mother but several shades darker, witness of his double dose of Indian blood. His eyes were insolent, likewise his mouth. His mother embraced and kissed him at the gate, while his retinue sat their horses outside. He entered to remain only briefly, saluting his Uncle Harry with a casual wave of the hand, impatient to be away again. Fitzgerald made the introduction. Merriweather prepared to take his leave. I hope to have the pleasure of foregathering with you again during one of the fine days at sea, madam, Merriweather told Tulsi, hoping that no such opportunity would present itself. Recognizing her from his dream, he fancied that he could see the cruel, scheming nature of the woman that lay behind the classic beauty of her face. He knew that he was being melodramatic. Still, Colonel Napier's estimate credited her with iron resolution and the determination to put her son on the throne of Rajputana to the extent that his squadron had been dispatched to this port in anticipation of her attempt to rendezvous with a French force strong enough to accomplish her purpose. He hurried his departure, anxious to escape this pleasant room. Pull for the India man, he told the coxswain of his gig. 
Captain Cosby of the Countess of Surrey was a bald, fat man with the belly and jowls that went with twenty years of rich provender and little need to exercise. He sat ready for his siesta, barefoot, shirt open to his navel, under a vent in the great cabin where a wind sail diverted the desultory noontime breeze into a pleasant draught. His manner was courteous but condescending, as befitted a master in the company's maritime service who took precedence over a captain in its naval service. No, Merriweather, your Bombay buccaneers have not seemed fit to confide their secrets in me. I have no estimate of the situation beyond the report of a French privateer cruising north of Socotra. I would prefer to sail without the convoy, make the return trip in half the time these lard tubs will take, and then half again as much on the charter. Cosby paused to mop his bald head with a sodden linen handkerchief. He looked shrewdly at Merriweather. Even so, it will be the most profitable haul I ever made. Some up-country potentate. Does whole car ring a bell? Paid the first price I asked in gold, sent his son and about forty of his dog robbers, even a cabin full of birds for his pleasure over there. The whole sum is net, too. I would have had to lie at Surat and Bombay four months waiting for cargo anyway, and these sons of the prophet provide their own victuals as well. I just met the young man ashore and his mother. Cosby looked up with interest. Good. We shall be able to get out of this hole before too long, though I'm told the local sheikh plans an entertainment for the fella. He shook his head. I can't imagine a party without spirits. And how did Madame Bai impress you? Merriweather inquired idly. To his surprise, the man coloured, looked uncomfortable, and then stammered a bit in his reply. Why, a most attractive and intelligent woman. A pity she's of mixed blood. Crosby then tossed out in an elaborately off-handed manner a question that brought Merriweather up short. And how much would make it worth your while to allow Countess to proceed independently? What in hell? Was it nothing more than the bit of hanky-panky he had suspected at Crosby's reaction to his idle question of a moment ago? Or had Madame Bai seduced the captain into doing her bidding, even though it might constitute treason? He managed to reply in what he hoped was a negligent tone to match the captain's inquiry. I am afraid it would be quite impossible. My orders are most explicit. I am required to take the convoy intact to Surat. Well, said Cosby, never hurts to ask. And I'd be willing to divide some of the extra profit. Merriweather went back to Pitt, found all well, and prepared to take his siesta himself on the cot under the new vent cut in the overhead in the crowded sleeping cabin for the wind sail. The man's reaction puzzled him. Captains of India men were often enough reputed to have taken advantage of women travelling with them, though the offence was punishable by instant dismissal. But from his brief encounter with Tulsi Bai, Merriweather was certain that no man could take advantage of her without her willing it. Rather, he began to suspect that Madame Bai had taken advantage of a fat middle-aged master to bend him to her will. It was a vexing thought. He would make certain that the Countess of Surrey was in company when the convoy departed. Merriweather slept until the first dog watch was called away. It was an orderly sortie, the marine cruisers going out first to take stations in accordance with Merriweather's orders. Attack was unlikely from northeast around to northwest with the prevailing wind out of the southwest. He formed the convoy up in two columns, one of the regular escort vessels leading each, then stationed Comet with her superior weatherly qualities on the port flank to counter any attack from that unlikely quarter. 
Vigilant guarded the starboard flank, and he took position in pit on the starboard quarter, dead to windward. From this vantage point he could interpose the frigate against an attack on any part of the convoy from downwind, or run down on an interloper approaching to leeward. The other two small escorts were stationed astern of each column. Merriweather congratulated himself on the smartness with which the convoy had formed up with a minimum of signals required. He had held his briefing of the escort commanders and the merchant shipmasters yesterday afternoon in pit, passing out counterparts of his diagram of the formation, issuing instructions, and then answering their questions as to the intervals between ships and the shielded lights to be displayed astern during the hours of darkness. Only one thing had disturbed him. And Captain, said McCracken, just as the meeting was about to conclude, remind these officers that once we pass through the strait, Bub El Man Deb, they call it, we lay our course for Cape Guadafui so as to pass south of Socotra. This was news to Merriweather. By what authority? he demanded. It took the convoy away from the direct route to Surat. Why, it was in the revised convoy instructions we received a week or so from the Commodore at Surat. I thought you had been furnished a copy. No, Merriweather said sharply. Do you know the purpose of prolonging the voyage? I can only presume it's because of the French privateer cruising north of Socotra. He made a pass at the convoy coming out but sheared off when he sighted the India man. Must have mistook her for a seventy-four. The instruction obviously had been written before Bombay Castle had acted to reinforce the escort at the direction of the Governor-General, and there certainly was no need to avoid a single privateer with the forces now under his command. But Meriwether doubted his authority to countermand the order. If he did and some casualty befell the convoy, he would be in peril under his own do-or-be-damned orders. It really did not make that much difference, and he reluctantly acquiesced in the order as the briefing adjourned. In the endless inventory of naval duties, escort of a merchant convoy was easily the dullest and most frustrating. Its speed was dictated by the sailing qualities of the slowest ship. There were interminable delays when cordage parted, spars sprung, seams opened, rotten canvas blew away, or even a halt for the brief service before a shrouded corpse slid into the water. For no accountable reason, vessels sheared out of line or fouled one another, or a stern guide light failed when there was a collision in the darkness. The regular escort commanders were old hands at this sort of thing and dealt with each impossible casualty with speed and decision. After an anxious first day, in which imperative signals were too blocked in pit most of the time, Merriweather washed his hands of the matter and left McCracken and his captains to deal with the internal discipline in their own fashion. The convoy crawled sluggishly down the latitudes from 21 degrees north to 13, finally to emerge from the Red Sea into the Gulf of Aden. Merriweather took his departure from a bearing on the reddish volcanic peak that rose above Rassian on the African shore, and two blocked his flag hoist to signal the course change to due east. He had felt no particular apprehension during the voyage through the narrow waters of the Red Sea. There were no reports of the enemy passing Bab el Mandeb, only ten miles wide and literally translated as the Gate of Tears. But in the widening approaches to the Arabian Sea he established extra lookouts at the masthead and spent the night watches mostly in his canvas chair at the weather rail of the quarterdeck. It was a suffocating day. The calm had descended before daybreak, and by noon the ships were as motionless as though painted on a sea of glass. There were many boats in the water passing between ships on social missions, and Merriweather was not surprised when Hamlin sent the messenger below with the private dispatch from Countess of Surrey. Request your presence for dinner. Bye. 
Merriweather regretted his passing remark that day ashore in Jeddah now that it had been acted upon. Still, there was no reason to be rude. No enemy could approach the convoy in this situation, and Dobbs predicted the calm might well endure until nightfall. He scribbled his acceptance and told the messenger to call away the gig. Countess of Surrey piped the side for him navy fashion, and Cosby, dressed formally now, shook his hand at the gangway. Welcome aboard, Captain. Delighted you could come. My fifth mate fancies himself somewhat of a diviner, and prophecies this calm will last the night. Merriweather was escorted aft, passing pens of sheep, two bullocks, and hen coops in the waist. Cosby must have replenished his live provisions at Jeddah, he thought, with a twinge of envy. Madame Bai was holding court in the great cabin with the first through sixth mates, the purser and two relief mates dancing attendance on her. There was a sideboard bearing a selection of wines and spirits and another groaning under its burden of rich provender. The woman disengaged herself from her circle of admirers and came to greet him with a dazzling smile. Ah, Captain, how delightful that you were able to come. Captain Cosby tells me that we may remain become for another day. Now, may I present these officers to you? She did so in order of rank, Merriweather bobbing at each introduction, wondering what it would be like to have eight watchstanders in pit. And now, will you refresh yourself? Here are spirits, wines. Merriweather poured a glass of gin, cut a lemon into quarters, and joined the group. He nodded in passing to Malha Rao, lounging by himself in a corner, a glass of wine in hand, reminded momentarily of that other charming, ruthless would-be Muslim emperor, Tipu Sultan, who was no teetotaler either. It proved to be a pleasant interval of small talk, gossip, and speculation. Merriweather found that he had later news of Bombay than the India man's officers, and was happy to impart it. Madame Bai had seated herself in an easy chair, pillow under her feet, joining easily in the chit-chat, and he forgot for the time the revulsion he had felt for her that day in Jeddah. She possessed a keen intellect and remarkable directness of expression. He found himself coming to admire the manner in which she managed to keep all the officers, Cosby included, engaged, and saw that they all were her devoted servants. After another glass of gin, he allowed Captain Cosby to persuade him to take a plate loaded with roast beef, thin slices of chicken, and savouries. He declined the leg of lamb because he fancied the fleece would stick in his teeth as though it were mutton. It was a silly prejudice that he held against the sheep family, but he could not help it. The food was delicious, the first fresh meat he had eaten since Bombay. The servant filled his glass with another gin, more than he really desired, but he found a chair near Madame Bai and Cosby, giving first attention to the food, but following the conversation. "'May I have your plate replenished?' inquired the captain solicitously. "'No, thank you,' Berryweather replied. He was sure the dinner in gin would make him drowsy, and he hoped to call by comet on his way back to the ship if the calm held. He glanced out of the port to assure himself that no breeze yet stirred. Cosby cleared his throat and looked at him speculatively. Captain, might I see you a moment in private? He indicated his sleeping cabin with an inclination of the head. What now? Another proposition. Merriweather could not refuse to talk to the man in his own ship, he decided as he rose and followed Cosby. Madame Bai appeared hardly to notice their withdrawal, as the door was closed and a chair indicated. Now, Merriweather, I spoke to you once before when the matter meant more to me than the extra profit I might make by a faster passage, and I think I made you a very fair offer then. You declined, and I can't blame you if your orders so dictate but I have passengers who claim the most 
pressing of business at Surat. He paused and indicated the main cabin with his head. And as a matter of fact, they have offered to make it worth my while to conclude a faster passage than the convoy will. Merriweather wondered if there would be an offer to divide the bonus. A thousand pounds, five hundred for each of us. The captain smiled winningly at him. Just like finding the money. A ship straggles off in the night. Happens all the time in the best regulated of convoys. This was a bold enough proposition. The man had disclosed his principle and made a specific offer. Merriweather wondered what additional rewards in kind the captain might be enjoying from Madame Bai, and decided to be obtuse. Captain, I do not see how we can speed up this convoy. Oh, I agree. No way to do that. Countess will just sheer off after dark. But what of the frog privateer? I carry thirty-six guns, as you do, sir. But less than a hundred hands to serve eighteen pounders and also work the ship while I have four hundred and carry thirty-twos. Hell, Merriweather, I'm under no orders to stay with the convoy. Cosby's face had turned mottled red. But I have precedence of a captain in the marine as well. Quite so, Captain. But I am under the most explicit orders to take this convoy intact to Surat. No affair of mine. I think it is. They are the Governor-General's own orders. Now look here, Merriweather. I can just sail away and you couldn't stop me. I think I should be compelled to, Merriweather replied, striving for a light tone of reason. The matter is moot for the nonce in any case with this calm. Cosby subsided, then spoke again with restraint. How about the whole thousand? I do not follow you, said Merriweather. Well, said Cosby, rising, let me discuss the matter with my principals. I shall be back in a moment. Actually, it was nearer ten before the door opened again. Now, Captain, you'll not obstruct me, will you? The contralto voice was a tone above its normal timbre. Madame Bai still wore her dazzling smile, but her eyes had darkened, and the set of her jaw was firm. My son and I have the most urgent affairs in Surat. My orders, madame, are by direction of the Governor-General. I have no discretion. The convoy must stay together. If it's money, it is not. The smile vanished for a moment. Tiny crow's feet about her eyes and lips were visible in the harsh afternoon light. Then it reappeared in the guise of a calculated expression of sensual enticement. And the woman spoke in an almost diffident tone as she moved forward. Or better yet, a reward in kind in addition to the money. She was pressing her body against his in the most explicit manner. A hand slipped over his shoulder to the back of his head as her lips touched his. Merriweather responded in surprise, the fiery embrace and kiss arousing him in spite of his resolution. Her lips released his, and she tilted her head back to look directly up into his eyes. Now, latch the door. He wavered then regained his self-control and stepped back just as the door burst open. Merriweather half expected the woman to rend her clothing and cry rape. Cosby's expression was one of simple anger, but his face faded to disappointment as he saw Merriweather standing aloof from Madame Bai. She only looked at him a moment longer, then gathered her dignity about her, turned and hurried out as the master stepped aside to let her pass. And have you reached a decision, Captain? he asked lamely. I see no reason to change the one already made for us. Countess of Surrey continues in company with the convoy. As the gig pulled away from the India man, there was a bare hint of air stirring, not enough to ripple the water yet but clouds were building in the southwest, promising a breeze before nightfall.
Merriweather decided to take the time to visit Comet and alert McCrae to the possibility that Countess might make an attempt to escape. The small Scots officer met him at the gangway. An unexpected pleasure, Captain? A pleasure, certainly, but line of duty also. McCrae led him below where he refused more refreshment and came quickly to the point. Explaining the situation and the efforts already made to obtain permission to sail singly, but omitting any mention of the bonus offered by Madame Bai. So you see the temper of the people. Stay close, but use no unnecessary force. After all, Cosby outranks us in the company. I'll not let him escape, Captain. It had been a curious interlude, Merriweather reflected, as they rowed back through the idle ships now lying as askew as jack straws in the calm. Other boats were moving between ships, and Merriweather made a mental note to signal the convoy to hoist them in, anticipating the coming breeze. The stroke oar had piped up with an interminable rollicking ballad that detailed the salacious adventures of a young man from Bath on his way to see the Queen with the other hands joining in a roaring chorus after each quatrain. The ditty attracted the grinning attention of the hands in each ship they passed. The monotonous repetition was euphoric, and he relaxed to turn the situation over in his mind, staring blindly ahead. The opening gambit at Jeddah had been forthright enough. A simple inquiry as to Merriweather's price for permitting Countess of Surrey to proceed independently. There were many legitimate reasons for this request. The India man could make twice the speed of the convoy. Lacking the intelligent summary from Calcutta and the explicit orders, Merriweather would have granted the request as routine without thought of any reward. The second approach by Cosby had been much more urgent. Specific sums mentioned, with the hint that more might be forthcoming. Then anger and a bit of bluster, and the withdrawal to consult with his principal. At this point, Madame Bai had decided to intervene herself. Either she or Cosby must have considered him incredibly naive, a man to yield instantly to physical temptation, or perhaps the woman fancied her charms to be irresistible. On the second thought, he decided that the manoeuvre was the stratagem alone of Madame Bai. It was unlikely that the captain could have conceived a variation of the ancient badger game, wherein the pimp surprised his whore in flagrante delicto with a man who could not afford a scandal. His reaction on entering the cabin had been more plausibly that of a man motivated by simple jealousy that Tulsi might invite another to share her favours. He reached a conclusion. The pair had exposed their hands, and he intended to keep a tight leash on Countess lest she slid away into the night. He felt the coxswain's movement beside him as he held up four fingers and answered the hail, Pit. The breeze freshened after dark, and there was a night-long melee as the escort strove to sort the scattered convoy into some sort of order. If the India man intended to make a run for it, now was the time. Merriweather hoped that Macrae's psychic powers were functioning as well as they had last year in the Bay of Bengal, when he predicted the movement of the French privateers. At dawn, Merriweather's heart leaped into his mouth as he swept the horizon to find Countess of Surrey missing. He was comforted only slightly to see that Comet also was gone. The convoy was still scattered over miles of sea, but with daylight, the escort snows were snapping at the heels of the stragglers, signals flying, with an occasional gunshot to underscore their orders. And by noon, the convoy had converged again into a reasonably compact formation. By Dobbs's calculations, they should raise Cape Guadafui tomorrow and take departure for their eastward course south of Socotra, there to bear up east-northeast across the Arabian Sea for Surat. Just afternoon, they sighted Countess lying hove to, comet to leeward of her. 
Merriweather breathed a sigh of relief as the pair joined the formation. But within the hour, the wind had failed again. Merriweather was staring out the stern lights in the day cabin, fidgeting from one foot to the other in irritation at the delay, as Pitt lay almost motionless in the calm, when the messenger knocked and entered. Sir, there's a lady on deck to see you. Hell, fire and damnation! Had Tulsi come to beard him again in his own ship? I'll come. Madame Bai was standing in aloof dignity near the gangway, Dobbs hovering nearby. Technically, the ship was still underway, but he had left his station on the quarterdeck evidently to oversee the rigging of the landing stage and ladder over the side, to accommodate the gig from Countess. It now lay, too, some fifty yards off the starboard beam, its crew tricked out in crimson jumpers, white trousers and hats. Good afternoon, madame, he greeted her formally. May I see you privately a moment, captain? The boat has strict orders to return within an hour. Certainly, this way. He led her aft and seated her in the cabin, leaving the door open then took his place formally behind the desk. She kept her head averted, appearing to stare at her clasped hands, shoulders shaking, finally to look up, eyes brimming with tears. Gad, the woman was a consummate actress. Captain, I have come to offer my abject apologies for my inexcusable conduct of yesterday and that of Captain Cosby last night in attempting to proceed to our destination independently. Her eyes filled again, and Merriweather was instantly more uncomfortable. He'd hoped the incident would expire without further remark, let alone tears. Why, he began uncertainly, and she raised her face to look directly at him to speak in a faltering voice. May I... Have a cup of tea, please. I feel quite faint. Possibly the social amenities incident to the formal service would calm the woman, Merriweather thought, and rang the pantry bell. Sang poured the cups with his practised grace, looking a bit disapproving at finding his captain tete-a-tete -tete with a woman in the cabin at sea, then withdrew. Madame Bai balanced the saucer against the faint movement of the ship, then took a cautious sip of the hot brew. Her tears had dried, and her eyes sparkled. Oh, Captain, I should have asked your servant, but would you be kind enough to see if my boat is still waiting? Captain Cosby was most explicit. Merriweather was sure it was. It had not been a quarter of an hour since she came on board, but he was glad to humour her, to escape a moment from her overpowering presence. He stepped out on deck to see for himself. The gig was, as he knew it would be, still lying off in the motionless sea, its brightly clad crew a sprawl on the thwarts. He took an additional moment to comment on the weather and the possibility of a breeze later in the afternoon with Dobbs and Larkin, and made his way leisurely below again. All is well, he reported as he took his seat and stirred a spoonful of sugar into the cup. The woman now wore almost an expression of expectancy, evidently recovered from her faintness of a few moments ago. Good, began Madame Bai, then shrieked and sprang to her feet, the cup and saucer shattering on the deck in a splatter of amber fluid. What now? Another badger game in his own ship? She had retreated to a corner of the cabin, hands covering her eyes, shaking uncontrollably. The thing did not make sense, but now she was pointing towards the pantry door. Get it away! Oh, God, get it out! Merriweather whirled to see Abercrombie, tail erect, frozen in astonishment, standing in the doorway to the pantry. The cat was the only living thing visible in the cabin and he looked back at Madame Bai for some explanation of her remarkable conduct. The cat! Take him away! He makes me ill! Understanding came to Merriweather as he moved to shoo the tom back into the pantry and close the door. 
this woman must be one of those persons who cannot abide cats and become physically ill in their presence. He had heard of the phenomenon, but never before witnessed its effect, and the very real reaction of Madame Bai was startling. I must leave at once. Even out of sight I feel his presence. The woman was in real distress, face pale, brow wet, still shaking. Merriweather was glad enough to see her go, and escorted Madame Bai to the gangway to signal in the gig. Delighted to have seen you again, he told her, bowing formally. It was difficult to rationalize the antipathy he felt for the woman in spite of her beauty. She appeared still to be distraught as she was handed over the side, and only murmured indistinctly in response. It had been a puzzling and unpleasant visit, Meriwether decided, as he made his leisurely way aft. He was certain that she had intended more than a mere apology, but the entrance of the cat had apparently driven all thought of anything else out of her mind. He must inquire of Buttram as to the validity of the phobia the woman suffered, but it had appeared real enough, and there was no other explanation for her reaction. He swept the horizon with his eye at the companion, seeing clouds building up in the southwest with the promise of a breeze, and entered the day cabin to see Abercrombie crouched on his desk, lapping at the cup of tea, stone cold by now. The open pantry serving window showed his means of entry. As Meriwether came in, the cat looked up at him, then froze, jaws opening wide, lips drawn back in a snarl. The body arched, appeared to fold in upon itself, and the animal fell off the desk heavily on its back. A half-dozen violent convulsions accompanied by a high keening sound followed, and the contorted body lay still, jaws still locked in a macabre grin. Sang! The little Hindu came out of the pantry to stop, eyes wide at the sight of the cat. Ask Dr. Buttram to come at once. The doctor, accompanied by Dr. Mefford, was in the cabin within the minute. He was on my desk, drinking cold tea from my cup, then fell off and was dead in a moment. What do you make of it, gentlemen? Both medical men knelt to examine the furry corpse. Mefford rose and dusted his knees. He died quickly, but not easily. He was drinking your tea? inquired Buttram in a tone of disbelief. Oh, yes. Quite often he lapped the dregs, but this is the first time I remember that he had a full cup available. Buttram bent over and sniffed the cup. Cold tea is all I can smell, he reported. However, I do not propose to sample it in view of the cat's fate. He looked in the sugar bowl, then picked up the cup, placed the saucer over it, and continued, I am willing to wager my medical degree that it contains an extract of the seeds of Strychnos nox vomica, and that the sugar does as well. I will consult my pharmacopoeia and see if I can make a definite identification. He and Mefford departed with the cup of cold tea and sugar bowl. Merriweather rang the bell. I think you had better remove the late Abercrombie, he told Sang. Poor fellow. I think he met the fate that was intended for me. Eyes wide, Sang picked up the cat and withdrew. Buttram was back within the hour, a vial containing a spoonful of white crystals in hand. This is what I managed to extract from the cup of tea alone, Captain, he said holding it up to see. It is strychnine, derived from the seeds of the fruit of Strychnos nux vomica, a tree native to India. It has been employed for centuries as a favourite tool of the poisoner, and as little as two grains weight may be fatal within minutes. There was enough in your tea to kill a dozen men, but it also serves as a valuable medical drug when administered in minute doses. He paused and looked quizzically at Merriweather. Now I know about the lady's visit to the ship, but not why. 
and her murderous motive escapes me. Merriweather looked at the doctor, his face no longer so fresh and young as it had been two years ago. The fair complexion had coarsened, sun lines formed crow's feet about his eyes, and his middle had thickened. He knew that Butram was considering submitting his resignation as surgeon in the Marine by the end of the year to return to England with his young wife and daughter. And for a moment, he envied him his independence of a lifetime career in the company's navy. Still, the doctor was very nearly his closest friend, outranked only by McClellan. He decided he could certainly use a second opinion, and detailed his orders, the situation estimate, the original tentative overtures made at Jeddah, the propositions made to him yesterday, explicit as to money and sexual favours, the attempt of the Countess of Surrey to escape last night, and finally, the curious call of an hour ago ostensibly to offer an apology. I can only conclude, in light of your identification of the poison, Doctor, that a brazen attempt has been made to assassinate me, in the expectation that discipline and the escort force would suffer. It is fortunate that the woman has this curious fear of cats. I suspect that Madame Bai and her son have a rendezvous with the French squadron and military forces from Mauritius, and intend to overthrow Holkar with their aid to place Malhar on the throne. Bartram had followed the account with rapt attention, and now sat back, one forefinger laid alongside his nose, thumb under his chin, scrutinizing Meriwether as though he were his patient seeking a diagnosis of a baffling malady. I agree with your analysis, Captain, said Buttram judiciously, dropping his hand and leaning forward. She must be entirely desperate at this point to conclude the rendezvous, having failed in friendly persuasion, bribery, seduction, simple escape, and now murder. He paused a moment, staring past Merriweather's head through the stern lights at the motionless sea. I would give serious consideration to the obvious measure. Put a party of marines aboard the Indiaman. The thought had occurred to Merriweather, but it would be a grievous affront to a captain, certainly with powerful friends in the courts of proprietors and directors in London, and he had reluctantly discarded the remedy. No, Merriweather said finally. I believe we must hold a short leash on Countess and Madame, but nothing so drastic as putting a prize crew in a company maritime service vessel. Buttram soon departed, and Merriweather went on deck to survey the second afternoon of glassy calm. He was turning to go below when he saw Sang approach the stern, carrying a pitifully small packet held in both hands. He paused, head bowed, holding his arms straight out, then slowly lowered them until the bundle fell into the sea. Sang remained bowed for a long moment, then straightened and marched below. Abercrombie had been given his last rites as ship's cat in accordance with naval tradition. Dawn brought a repetition of the previous day's confusion. The wind for several hours the night before had blown erratically, fair for some ships in the convoy even as it left others becalmed. Countess of Surrey was on station, Comet hovering to leeward, Macrae evidently taking no chances after the abortive escape attempt two nights ago. Merriweather signalled a reduction in speed while the escort vessels chivied the stragglers over miles of sea into a reasonable formation. At this rate, the convoy would be a long time yet taking departure on Cape Guadalfui, if the pattern of afternoon calms persisted. To his relief, the wind held, light but steady, and a little after dawn the next day they sighted the precipitous grey mass of the Cape on the starboard bow. An hour later, Dobbs recommended that the convoy change course to east by north, so as to pass just south of the island of Abd al-Khuri and north of the islets called the Brothers, 
thence to take a new departure from the eastern tip of Socotra. So signal the convoy, Mr. Dobbs. Once clear of these hazards, it was a clear run across the Arabian Sea to the Gulf of Cambay and Surat, with the likelihood of favourable winds at this season. Merriweather felt a sense of relief to regain the relatively open sea again, after the narrow confines of the Red Sea, and enter the Gulf of Aden. A little afternoon, Merriweather was relaxing with his chair set under the vent for the windsail, enjoying the steady flow of air, when he heard the main top hail the deck. Deck there! Sail ho! Where away? responded Larkin. Near two points on the starboard bow. Well, on that bearing, it might very well be the westernmost islet of the brothers rather than a ship, Merriweather thought relaxing again. Two minutes later, the messenger knocked and entered. Sir, Mr. Larkin reports two sail, frigates by the cut of them bearing two points on the starboard bow. There's sails, not islands. Sir, Mr. Larkin took the glass to the cross trees before he sent me below. I'll come. Larkin had excellent eyesight. Merriweather did not doubt his identification, since the upper works of the newer French frigates were distinctive in design. Made cert myself from the cross trees, Larkin told him on deck. Very well. Signal the convoy. Enemy in sight, bearing east by south. Can you estimate their course? About north northwest on the port tack. Dobbs says they should intercept the convoy about fifty miles ahead if we maintain course and speed. The island of Abd al Khuri was a dark smudge on the northern horizon. There was no longer any necessity for the convoy to maintain a course so as to pass south of Socotra in view of the appearance of the French squadron. We'll make it a stern chase then to upset their calculations. Signal, change course to northeast. Flags blossomed on the signal halyards, and Marlow, acting as signal officer, waited impatiently, sweeping the convoy with his glass for the response of each vessel to the signal. Finally, all ships had the flag hoist too blocked to indicate understood. Merriweather nodded to Marlow to execute the hoist. With the threat of an enemy just over the horizon, the convoy began to close up as masters of country ships cracked on canvas and squared away before the wind. It was only a few minutes after the change of course became effective that the lookout reported the French ships had also altered course, and that he could now see a third ship. There was little doubt now of their intentions, and Merriweather found himself examining the hands on deck with an eye of anxious appraisal wondering how they might react in the heat of battle, if they had finally melded into a cohesive crew of old hands and new. Time alone would prove the fact, and he called a council of war of all officers and warrant officers immediately in the day cabin. Gentlemen, he began feeling almost as self-conscious as he had a year and a half ago when he addressed the officers of his squadron in the Bay of Bengal, but thankful that he had no wolf present to dispute him. In view of the intelligence provided us from Calcutta, and its apparent corroboration by certain recent events, I think it's certain that a French squadron is in pursuit of the convoy. I am also of the opinion that its principal objective is the India man, Countess of Surrey, although it likely would not pass up other prizes of value. As most of you know, we are under the most explicit orders to bring the convoy safely to Surat. I think it therefore prudent to clear for action, and lay out firefighting equipment now, though there is no need yet to send the hands to quarters or put out the galley fires and smoking lamp. Any questions? Yes, sir, spoke up Hamlin. Of what force are these frigates? Thirty-six, as I am told, if these are the same ships. Good. It should be an interesting action. The fires of youth, thought Merriweather indulgently. Bear in mind we are not here to seek the bubble reputation in the cannon's mouth, Merriweather told him lightly, proud of his literary paraphrase. The meeting adjourned, 
and the hands soon began to knock down partitions and remove encumbrances from the gun decks, sort out buckets of sand and water, lay canvas hose to the pumps and rig boarding nets of hammocks. Spirits appeared high, he was encouraged to note, and Larkin reported Pitt cleared for action in a good six minutes less time than the previous drill. Half an hour later the main top reported that the frigates had altered course to the west. They had just sighted the brothers, Merriweather decided, and must give them a wide berth, putting them farther behind the convoy. The longer he could spin out the chase, the better chance he had to escape. Last year, a lightly escorted convoy in the Bay of Bengal had played the game of blind man's buff and artful dodger with a pair of French privateers in the Bay of Bengal for five days, to come up fortuitously with two of Pellew's frigates, which promptly made prizes of the hounds. He had no hope of such good fortune, but a gale, a change of course in the night, or some casualty to the pursuers might achieve the same result. By dusk, the frigates were still only three specks to the naked eye on the southern horizon. The alteration of course had conformed to the best sailing qualities of the ships in the convoy and reduced the rate of gain, proving once more the old adage that a stern chase is a long chase. Before nightfall, Merriweather signalled the convoy to darken ships. It was worth the risk if they could slip away into the night. He toyed a moment with the idea of ordering a change of course at an arbitrary time, then decided it was too dangerous an evolution with the probability of collision and stragglers. Play the string out as long as possible, leave something to chance, and let the frogs commit themselves. He dined lightly in the cabin, then settled himself for the night in his chair rigged on the weather side of the quarter-deck. The stars glittered bright in the night sky. Moonrise would come close to three bells in the first watch, and in spite of the anxieties of the moment, he fell into a reverie. By now his child must be more than two months old. 